Death in the Garden Written by Isabella Bassett Narrated by Sandra Churchill Chapter One <gasps> Oh no! gasped Uncle Albert and cut into my thoughts. I had been watching the boat, which was to take us to an island in the middle of the lake, progress towards us, oscillating up and down with nauseating regularity as it bumped across the innumerable small waves, thanks to a stiff morning breeze, dancing on the surface of the water, and thinking of how I was going to keep this morning's train breakfast down as it churned in my stomach. What is it? I asked the aged relation, pushing thoughts of runny eggs aside. I wanted to add, now, but fought the urge. Since alighting at the tiny train station and making our way to the adjacent pier, Uncle Albert's valet, Wilford, had already had to return to the Pullman twice to scour the train, first for my uncle's misplaced tasseled slippers, and then for his favourite lapel pin. It was beyond me how my uncle could mislay so many items on a simple overnight journey from the south of France to Italy. For a man who spent most of his time in a smoking jacket and a fez, reading some entomology book or other, my uncle had an inexhaustible amount of items he could lose track of. His collar bar, tie clip and pocket watch were to be forwarded from the Hotel Paradis in Nice, from which we had recently departed, to the Villa Veronese on Lake Garda, which was our present destination. No, nothing, my uncle said in the voice of an abashed schoolboy, threw a furtive look around, and lowered his eyes to examine the toes of his shoes. Finding them in order, he went to join the other lords, huddled from the breeze behind a wall of trunks and luggage, no doubt to compare what items they had succeeded in leaving behind on the Pullman. The lords, including my uncle, were members of the Royal Society for Natural History Appreciation and were currently waiting to make the crossing to Villa Veronese with us. I chuckled at my uncle's subdued demeanour. Although completely batty in most respects, Uncle Albert was acutely aware of the servant problem since the end of the war, and attempted not to jeopardise his valet's happiness with more than the strictly necessary amount of silly requests. Said valet was presently fighting a losing battle on the boat dock, with an exorbitant amount of instruments and gadgets pertaining to my uncle's membership in the Royal Society and various current hobbies. Fishing rods, folding chairs, butterfly nets binoculars with and without stands, and a retractable telescope that kept popping open, its case having been mislaid on a particularly dark night somewhere between England and southern France. This natural history paraphernalia was further supplemented by what amounted to a small library of alphabetical volumes on birds, plants, fungi and whatnots, and at the moment the collection was also augmented by a stuffed creature, known affectionately, by the members of the Royal Society at least, as the Golden Platypus, which my uncle had the honour of keeping for a year, having won the right to do so above all of his fellow society members recently. I shook my head in disbelief. Surrounded by travel trunks, boxes, and other members of the society, plus their private secretaries and valets, all of which required passage to the island, the least my uncle could do was to keep track of his pince-nez or cigarette case or cufflinks or whatever item he had just realised he had mislaid. In addition to our little party, there appeared to be several other people waiting for boats at the dock. I wondered if they were making their way across to some of the pretty villas and hotels on the other side of the lake. A lively young woman sat next to a handsome vicar, who seemed to be straining to reciprocate his companion's enthusiasm for being here. At first I took them for a brother and sister, so similar were their well-proportioned features and the luster of their curls. But something in their intimacy suggested that they were a husband and wife, as did their wedding bands. 
Near them, an older woman, bedecked with furs and jewels, who had just arrived, was now sprawled next to her companion, a conservatively dressed gentleman, her dark eyes playing across all those around her while she cooled herself with a Japanese fan. Though only April, the strong rays of the clear morning sun prickled the skin and promised a hot day ahead. The lords of the society, looking stuffy in their three-piece morning suits, chirped happily away among themselves. I glanced in the direction of James, Lord Pakenham's personal secretary. He was deep in conversation with Lord Mantlebury's secretary, Alistair. Although I was my uncle's secretary, the other lord's secretaries had made little attempt to include me in their clique. What hurt them most was that although James had been my brother's best friend, they had been at university together and had then fought in the Great War together, he seemed to go out of his way to avoid me most of the time. Perhaps I brought back memories of my brother's death. A gust of chilly air passed through me. Although the morning was bright and birds were singing, and Italian fishermen were exchanging news about fish, or was it Mussolini? In loud tones, I sensed an undercurrent of tension. It was as though covert glances were exchanged and avoided in equal measure among the people waiting at the docks. Or perhaps it was simply my dark thoughts playing tricks on me. I was still not entirely sure that I had made the right decision in becoming my uncle's secretary. I had fled London to avoid a matrimonial union with a bore. And although it had been diverting to play secretary to my uncle on the French Riviera, the only reason I had followed him here, to Italy, was to avoid another bore who had been making his way to the Riviera as I left. Perhaps I could give in and take my mother's advice. Could I accept such a life, married to a weak husband I molded and commanded, the way my mother did my father? I shook my head to dislodge these depressing thoughts. We were on the shores of Lake Garda, after all, a picturesque area in the north of Italy, just south of the Alps, near Verona. It had been a favorite vacation place of royalty and aristocracy in the 19th century, and despite the destruction of the Great War and the obvious destitution of the local population at present, the blue water sparkled, and the coast was still dotted with opulent Belle Epoque villas and grand hotels. I listened in on the conversations around me. The runabout boat skipping, ominously it seemed to me, atop the lake waters in our direction, which the lords deduced would be taking us to Villa Veronese, caused excitement in more than one quarter. Nothing united men across the class divide like the sight of a fast vehicle. Lords, valets, and Italian street vendors gathered around to gawk as the fast-moving boat approached the dock. Neither caste nor language presented a barrier to appraising the boat's merits. The boat's varnished mahogany body and modern hull shape, which allowed it to aquaplane and skim across the water's surface at top speed, and the powerful outboard motor were discussed at great length, as was the extraordinary expense of bringing the boat over from America, where it was built by John L. Hacker. But excitement was to be short-lived. Just moments before the boat made contact with the dock, the woman with the furs careened out of her position on the bench and made for the boat, as though in an attempt to get to it first. Made in proportions it would have aroused a bout of artistic longing in Rubens, there simply wasn't enough room for both her and the travel trunks that lined the edge of the dock. As she swirled her great brocade mantle, she swept the topmost wooden crate, and it tumbled off the stack of travel trunks. Just before falling into the water, the crate made contact with the edge of the dock, split open, and spilled its contents into the lake. The golden platypus! My uncle cried, and leapt to the edge of the dock himself. I thought he would jump right after it. For a few moments we all stood there, at the edge of the dock, 
watching helplessly as the crate cover floated merrily away, bobbing on the water's surface, and the golden platypus gurgled and began sinking through the murky water towards the muddy bottom. I threw James a furtive look, but he just smiled and shook his head at me. I could also see my uncle's valet tallying up the benefits of his job, considering whether to jump in, when a great splash saved him from having to make a career-altering decision. To the great delight of some, namely my uncle and his valet, and to the great distress of others, namely the pretty young woman, the vicar had jumped in the lake after the sinking platypus. Chapter 2 The black cassock floated on the top of the surface of the water, marking the spot where the vicar had descended. Something had caught my attention just moments before, but the priest jumping in the lake drove the thought clear out of my head. Children gathered and screamed with joy at the exhibition. Women crossed themselves. Men shouted directions down from the edge of the retaining stone wall that lined the shore. Viewed from a distance, Lake Garda gave the impression of being pristine and virginal, its chaste waters fed by crystal-clear rivers that got their start among the snow-capped peaks of the Alps to the north. In truth, and on closer inspection, the water that lapped against the stone walls of the shore bore the unmistakable signs of having been corrupted by human contact. In addition to dead leaves and a selection of the daily newspapers, there floated, among the froth caused by a mysterious substance, rusting cans and broken wine bottles. But perhaps more distressing than what was visible to the eye was that which was only evident to the nose. Sullage. I shuddered at the vicar's bravery. A few moments later, the vicar's face emerged from the water, as though having endured some form of baptism, holding the stuffed platypus triumphantly in his right hand. Great cheers met his success. My uncle grabbed the stuffed animal once the vicar swam to the dock and embraced it in a protective grip. But even my uncle's radiated love for it could not assuage the creature's newfound hideousness. The other lords of the society cast reproachful looks at my uncle. Don't worry, uncle, I said. You can take comfort in the knowledge that the creature suffered irreparable damage while under your watch. Your name will now be forever linked to the golden platypus in the society's law. My uncle saw the sense in that and embraced the platypus even tighter, which drew some water out of the bottom of it. The hapless creature had heroically survived an attack by Lord Featherly's spirited Airedale terrier, Bunny, which left it with some bald spots, and a skirmish with Lord Mantlebury's squeamish maid, Gladys, which had left it singed by fire. It had now survived a drowning. By the expression on Uncle Albert's face, he couldn't be happier with the honour. We boarded the waiting boat, much to the disappointment of the local inhabitants, who sent us off with cheers and claps. But as the valet stayed behind to load the mountain of luggage and equipment in a less impressive vessel, perhaps there was some entertainment still to be had by the locals. Looking around the boat, I concluded that except for my uncle, who now wore a beatific countenance, the rest seemed to be one big, unhappy party. The vicar, sitting across from us, mirrored the dripping wet creature in my uncle's lap. Uncle Albert tried to catch the vicar's eye and chat him up with an effusion of thanks, but judging by the stare the vicar had affixed on the platypus, so far he had been unsuccessful. The revelation that such a creature resided among our possessions must have been a shock to the other new members of our company as well, because a lady with the furs and her companion also appeared transfixed by it. I suppose that to those unfamiliar with its pedigree or its significance to the members of the Royal Society, 
The animal was only the object of repulsive fascination and unrestrained stares of horror. The golden platypus, however, was one of the earliest specimens that made its way from the Antipodes to Europe. It was named golden due to the hue of its fur, which had turned yellow thanks to a preservation technique mishap during the 18th century. To the members of the Royal Society for Natural History Appreciation, it was a coveted annual prize. And looking at the animal now, I regretted that I had helped my uncle win it in the south of France. While everyone else was fascinated by the stuffed platypus, I had to admit that the priest had caught my attention. The vicar's wife huffed at intervals and threw the animal withering looks. She was trying to coax her husband's locks into a more presentable semblance. I studied the couple for a moment. Both young and beautiful, they would no doubt have produced children worthy of a prize in the Better Baby contests popular across America. He was so unlike any vicar I had known. The vicar of our parish, Reverend Bamford, was a pale, sickly fellow with greasy hair and an unhealthy complexion, although rumour had had it that he'd been a strapping young chap around the time of my mother's wedding, with cherub-like golden curls, much like the vicar's sitting across from me, I would imagine. I guess allowances should be made for Reverend Bamford, seeing that he was under the constant inspection of my mother, Lady Beasley. Although American and a Unitarian, my mother didn't let such trifles as differences of doctrine stand in the way of running the vicar's life. She told him what sermons to preach, what flowers to display, and what housekeeper to employ. At least the good vicar could take solace in the knowledge that his lot was shared by other men of office in a twenty-mile radius of Buckhill Place, our ancestral seat. My father, the doctor, the family solicitor and the local Bobby could all attest to my mother's powers of close supervision. My only other point of reference for how a pastor should look was Reverend Mildmay. He'd been the vicar at Borton under Bleen, the hamlet which played the unwilling host of the Borton Montrosy School for Girls, where I had gone to school. Reverend Mildmay, assigned with the unenviable task of caring for the spiritual lives of the school's pupils, was both short in stature and short on patience. He enjoyed engaging in fiery sermons, which were never as perfervid in their description of the torments of hell as when following a visit from my mother to the school. The vicar sitting across from me was quite different, perhaps because he hadn't had the benefit of caring for my mother's soul. His hair, prior to jumping in the lake, had glistened with a healthy luster in the mid-morning light. His skin had been kissed lovingly by the sun at some recent point to give him a golden tan, made so fashionable by Mademoiselle Coco just a couple of years back. He had straight, wide shoulders on which the wet cassock now hung very becomingly. But this vicar's greatest distinction was perhaps his wife, her bouncy ringlets displayed the same healthful shine as the vicar's hair, which made one suspect that they were sharing the same hair tonic. Her hair, although not golden, was enlivened by golden strands, as though highlighted by having spent time in the sun. I vaguely wondered if the vicar and his wife were also travelling from the French Riviera. Wearing a fashionable two-piece sailing suit, reminiscent of something one would find in Paris. She was petite, but well-formed, with a heart-shaped face and a plump mouth that appeared always ready to smile and show off a row of elegantly arranged teeth. Except now. She wasn't smiling now. I cast a glance at James and quickly regretted it. James caught my eyes, though having expected me to look his way, and winked at me. He wore a jovial smile and had probably found the entire episode most diverting. Mortification overtook my rising nausea, somewhat to my relief. I knew I was being irrational and that none of this was my uncle's fault, 
but I felt like Uncle Albert had ended up being the butt of the joke. And by family association, so had I. I instantly resolved to ignore James for the rest of the boat trip, and probably a bit longer. His handsomeness in the bright sun, with the wind sweeping through his hair, just made me dislike him more at the moment. While our relations had improved slightly toward the end of our stay in the French Riviera, his behavior towards me on the train from Nice, namely, refusing my invitation for a drink on the pretext of having to work late with Lord Pakenham, was evidence that he still had not forgiven me for usurping his position as my Uncle Albert's secretary. Who needed the attention of the fourth son of the Earl of Haswell anyway? In an attempt to quiet the swirling depths of my stomach, I turned my attention to the glorious palazzos lining the lake shores. Grand villas and hotels dotted the shore, and so did some strange structures, which looked like the pillars of long-abandoned villas. I reminded myself to remember to ask Lady Lamberton about them. Skipping brazenly across the water, our boat carried us ever closer to the island, visible in the middle of the lake. One of the most enchanting features of the island was a gleaming white villa, set against a canvas of ancient cypress trees, rising up from among the lush gardens, like Venus out of her shell. The boat slowed down as it neared the island, and as people began shifting in their seats, as though preparing to disembark, I looked around and realized, with a mild surprise, that all the passengers on the boat, the vicar, his wife, the woman with furs, and the serious man, were also going to Villa Veronese. Chapter 3 The boat skidded to a stop by a short dock, next to what appeared to be something of an oddity. It reminded me of a folly in the form of a medieval castle drum tower, with thick stone walls and a round shape. I wondered if it had ever served in the defense of the island, or if it was indeed a folly. Two people, whom I recognized as Lord and Lady Lamberton, they had visited my parents at Buckhill Place on a few occasions, bustled down from the terrace of the house to the dock to meet us, they were quite the peculiar pair. Lord Lamberton was just slightly shorter than his wife, but it was enough to make him appear as though he were always in her shadow. It didn't help matters that Lady Lamberton usually dressed in flamboyant ways to accentuate her artistic personality. Or so she said, whenever my mother needled her choice of attire. Currently, Lady Lamberton appeared to be channeling a bohemian look and wore an innumerable number of shawls, bangles, beads and such. Tied across her forehead and over her salt and pepper curly hair was a long scarf, the tassels of which kept getting tangled in the golden buttons of Lord Lamberton's jacket. Lord Lamberton's outfit, though equally theatrical, was much more traditional— it clearly signalled that he was an English lord in Italy who owned a fast boat. He was decked out in a wide-striped boating blazer and a straw boating hat. The entire ensemble was finished off with a flourish of a red bow tie. He looked as though he had never left the Cambridge rowing team of 1883. As the hosts levelled with the boat, the guests began disembarking. My uncle required some assistance, as he was still cradling the wet animal tenderly in his arms. Lord Lamberton spread out his arms in a welcoming gesture. What ho! What ho! He chirped cheerfully, and his eyes capered merrily over his guests. His face was kind, and as he smiled, the lines around his eyes attested that he was a jovial man, with an easy-going attitude— like the rest of the members of the Royal Society, I remember him being more concerned with insects than with the trials of life. I hope you enjoyed your ride in my beauty, he said in an expectant voice, as though looking for a compliment. No one cares about your boat, Harold, 
his wife rebuked him, her voice betraying exasperation. But Lord Lamberton appeared not to hear his wife, as he had just noticed the dripping vicar. Ho ho! I can see that the trip has been an eventful one after all. I can't wait to hear all about it. He then spied my uncle. Oh, the golden platypus has returned to its rightful place. He made for my uncle, who hugged the animal closer to his chest, though slightly worse for wear, Lord Lamberton said, having just noticed the state of the platypus, and cast my uncle a critical look. Follow me, everyone. Let's have some drinks. No one wants your drinks, Harold. Let the poor people get ashore before offering drinks. Lady Lamberton edged out her husband and took over the welcoming. Now, let's see. You all know each other, I think? She said, looking around flustered, counting people with an outstretched hand, bangles dangling and beads glistening in the sun. What? I thought. What did she mean? Who knew whom? I looked around, confused. There were plenty of people here who were new to me. Oh, how silly of me, of course. L let me see. Lady Carolyn, my dear, she exclaimed when she reached me. You look positively green. I smiled at her observation, a bit embarrassed that she had made it in such a loud voice. I do fine in rowboats, I said when I'm rowing, or sailboats when I'm sailing, but the roll and pitch of these new speedboats, combined with their propensity to skip across the crests of waves, I'm glad to be on solid ground, though still a bit muddled. I feel much the same way, my dear. We are not built for such crass forms of entertainment. She cast an accusatory look in her husband's direction. Now, where was I? she said, and looked about her, and spotting the vicar, led me to him. Allow me to introduce Reverend Horatio Quinton, and his young bride, or so I presume? Oh, how tanned you are, my dears! Positive savages! But I suppose that is the de rigueur nowadays. Soon everyone will be off to Africa for a tan. Ah, oh, and Diva Grigorescu! She guided me by the elbow in the direction of the lady with the furs, and exchanged kisses on the cheeks with her, in the continental fashion. So glad you made it, she said, sounding a bit insincere. Lady Carolyn, have you met the famous soprano? No? Well, let me see. She twirled around. Where is Hans? Ah, there you are. She saw him behind some of the lords. Always so inconspicuous, bless you. Lady Carolyn, she said and twirled again to find me in the crowd that was now shuffling around the dock. This is Herr Hunkler, an art dealer. We manoeuvred awkwardly around the narrow dock, shaking hands and exchanging platitudes. As Lady Lamberton pirouetted here and there to greet her guests, spare bits of fabric flew all around. I was afraid that someone would step on one of her skirt layers or trailing shawls. Between her and the soprano, who at this moment was whirling her own long coat, someone was bound to go the way of the platypus. By this time, the boat with the valets and the luggage had docked, and the dock became even more confused and crowded. Greetings and introductions thus quickly dispensed with, Lady Lamberton skipped around luggage and headed towards the house. Let's have some drinks, she said in a loud voice. Follow me, everyone. She waved her hand in the air, her bangles dangling, to signal for everyone to follow her. She appeared completely unaware that she was echoing her husband's sentiment from earlier. Harold, why don't you offer our guests some drinks? She managed to chastise him as she walked by him. Lord Lamberton appeared not to hear his wife's reproach, and was busy describing all the delights of his boat to the members of the Royal Society. In the entanglement of introductions, I wasn't entirely clear on who knew whom, but as far as I could make it out, James and I were the only new people in this little gathering, 
Even Lord Mantlebury's secretary, Alistair Thompson, appeared to have been on the island before. Such a shame that the rest of the society couldn't make it, Lady Lamberton said, leading the procession towards the house. The Queen of the Night is a beauty this year. I cast a dubious glance in the direction of the opera singer, and then remembered that she was referring to a flower. The flower that the members of the Royal Society had travelled here to see. My uncle had explained that it was a type of cactus that bloomed only once a year, during the night, and wilted by the morning. The Lambertons had seen it as an ideal reason to host a small party at the villa, and greet the opening of the flower with a midnight soiree. I looked around at the guests. We had lost a few members of the society along the way from the French Riviera to Lake Garda. Lord Abington had had to return to London urgently to attend the debut of several nieces at the spring ball, while Lord Featherly made a hasty retreat to Oxfordshire upon hearing that his spirited Airedale terrier Bunny was expecting a litter from a bulldog father, which in itself was a tragedy, but it was additionally compounded by the fact that the bulldog belonged to none other than his neighbour and greatest shooting rival, Lord Yearsley. So it was only Lord Mantlebury, Lord Pakenham and my uncle who made it to the island. The woman with the heavy brocade coat, edged with fur, whom I now knew to be Diva Grigorescu, displayed an obscene amount of jewels. The man next to her, Herr Hunkler, was prim and proper. He wore a well-cut suit, boring shoes, and neat hair. I was surprised that he was an art dealer. He was completely unremarkable, and boring to a degree only the Swiss, and perhaps a few Belgians, could accomplish. The only nod to his professed role of an art dealer was a paisley cravat in the diverting colours of brown, beige, and grey. Surprisingly, Lady Lamberton now hung back and fell in step with me. Now, my dear, she said, as she threaded her arm through mine, I've heard all about your little escapade in London. Your mother has written to me at length. Her words reminded me of Lady Morton who I had just recently escaped, and I recoiled slightly. Lady Morton was forever attempting to pair me up with her Cecil, and I held my breath in dread of who Lady Lamberton had invited to the island in an attempt to find me a husband. I tried to remember if Lady Lamberton had any sons of her own, and if I needed to prepare myself for the onslaught of matrimonial proposals. But as far as I could remember... She had no offspring that she could spring up on me. I wondered if Lady Morton had appealed to her for support on the matter of Cecil. For a moment, I even worried that Cecil might be here, but then remembered that at this time he would be just settling in at the Hotel Paradis in Nice. I think the whole thing is marvellous, she cried in delight, and threw her head back, laughing, and her bangles clinked and jangled as she flailed her hands about. I turned to look at her. Her comment was unexpected. No bows? No references to my inheritance and how I needed a sensible man to take care of it? I absolutely adore young women today, she continued. So free, so self-sufficient. She patted me on the hand and smiled. Only right to make yourself less accessible to men. I made Lord Lamberton chase me all over London and some of the countryside while I was making a painter and a poetess of myself. Right, Harold? She threw a tinkling laugh in his direction. What? He said, caught off guard. Now, my dear, I'm sure the young ones are not interested. Poppycock, she replied. She then turned to me. My niece Flora is visiting. You'll have the most wonderful time together. She's also a career woman. Works in Africa on some sort of expeditions. About your age? Twenty-five? I thought so. She's not here at the moment. Had to go to Milan for something or other. But we'll be back for the party tomorrow. In tribute to you, bright young things, I've organized a little scavenger hunt at tomorrow night's soiree. Oh, I would have made a delicious young thing in my youth, don't you think, darling? She volleyed the question towards her husband. 
What? Yes, of course, my dear, came Lord Lamberton's ready reply. As we made our way up the stairs, towards the house, I noticed the lush gardens and terraces that tumbled towards the lake. I enjoyed gardens and looked forward to exploring them at leisure and having a scavenger hunt in them. Chapter 4 Villa Veronese truly was the most extraordinary place. Just like on the outside, the villa on the inside was an exuberant jewellery box made of intricately carved marble. Staircases, sculptures, balustrades, balconies, statues and vestibules, and vases overflowing with fresh-cut flowers dazzled from every direction. Tall windows overlooking the gardens below and the lake beyond let in clear light and made the villa appear even brighter and larger. As we walked through the entrance hall and up the grand staircase towards our bedrooms, it became evident that the villa was sprawling, grand and over-decorated. Every inch of the ceiling was smothered in frescoes. Every wall was covered in oversized paintings of heroic scenes, or decorated with stucco in the shape of fruits or animals or cherubs. It was a heady mix of baroque and belly pock, and every surface was embellished. The guests split up to look for their bedrooms. As I searched for mine, a hand pulled me into a small vestibule. I was about to cry out, when I saw it was just my uncle. I cocked an eyebrow at him, but he ignored my questioning stare, and instead peeked out from our hiding spot and looked up and down the corridor as though to make sure no one was around. After a maid carrying some gleaming white sheets passed out of view, my uncle whispered, Young Carol, I have a mission for you. While we're on the island, I want you to guard the golden platypus. You have to hide it somewhere in your room. It's not safe with me. He rattled the instructions so quickly, I barely had time to react. What? I exclaimed. Shh, keep your voice down. One can't be sure who is listening. My uncle peeked out to check that the corridor was still deserted. He gave me a sign to keep quiet, as another maid, this one carrying a vase full of the most opulent flowers, passed in the other direction. I'm sure someone will try to pinch it while we are here, he said, turning back to me. This was madness. My uncle had finally lost his mind. What do you mean, that someone is going to try and steal it? I asked, exasperated. Do you mean one of the old boys from the Royal Society? Yes, them. He nodded. And also, perhaps the other guests. He added in all seriousness. Unlikely, I thought, but didn't argue. And where is the animal now? I asked, just noticing the trophy was no longer in his embrace. Had he managed to lose it already? Wilfred has it. He promised to take it down to the kitchens to dry it off. I wondered whether my uncle's valet would be successful in his task. Mrs. Cropley, our cook at Buckhill Place, would never allow such a creature in her domain. But why can't Wilfred keep an eye on it? I protested. Ah, oh, Wilfred is a good man, the most upstanding chap he began, some hesitation audible in his voice. But I would rather not jeopardize his position by asking him to enter such a risky undertaking. Here he paused. I was about to protest again, to point out that all of this made little sense, but my uncle cleared his throat and continued. He may have also mentioned that he would have to resign, if circumstances arose which required him to take care of the trophy. I don't blame him. He nodded knowingly. He doesn't want to be saddled with the responsibility of looking after the platypus. The honor is too great. The task would test the resolve of any man. My hands are tied, you see. He looked up at me with pleading eyes. I thought the whole thing was a joke. But if the expression on his face was anything to go by... 
My uncle truly believed the platypus was in danger of being pinched. Ancestral duty precluded me from refusing this mission. After all, Uncle Albert had not shied away from his duty when my three aunts had dictated to him that I should become his secretary. But I still had a few more questions before consenting to the latest harebrain scheme. But why me? Will not the task test my resolve? Why is a trophy safer with me than with you? With each question, a look of dismay spread further across his face. Why, no one would dare break into a lady's room, Carolyn. My uncle replied with indignation in his voice. The dismay had now reached his eyebrows, and they were riding ever higher on his forehead. He clearly had no idea what people got up to in the middle of the night at country houses. Or did he? I knew very little about how my uncle had spent his youth. He could not be so naive. Could he? If you insist, I acquiesced. But why do you think people are after the platypus in the first place? I wanted to tell him that the creature had no value beyond that which the members of the Royal Society had so erroneously bestowed on it. Oh, they are all scoundrels, he said, his tone now switching from deranged to cunning. Such underhanded things go on at the Society's gatherings as would make your hair stand on end. It has happened several years in a row now. He paused and then laughed to himself, as though remembering a particularly funny incident. Oh, one year, I even had young James, while he was still my secretary, you see, tried to pinch it off Lord Featherly. He chuckled again. But not this year, he said, and his countenance stiffened. No such hijinks on my watch, or rather, yours. He stepped closer to me. But to tell you the truth, I don't trust those guests of Lord Lamberton's, he said in a low voice. What is the old goat playing at inviting them here? I had no idea what he was driving at. Do you know them? I asked, thinking back to what Lady Lamberton had said at the dock, implying that most guests knew each other. Oh, no, no, I, I just meant uh, foreigners and all that he said, colour rising on his cheeks, as though he was flustered. And they are not members of the society, you see. He added, after a moment. He cleared his throat. Now, I'll instruct Wilfred to bring the golden platypus to your room when it's ready. And don't let it out of your sight. With these parting words, my uncle leaped out of the vestibule in search of his rooms. I saw him pass along the corridor three times, back and forth, while I searched for my own accommodations. My room was in keeping with the rest of the house. Belly pock details, frills and inlays. The walls were covered in blue silk embroidered with golden flowers, and gilded furniture echoed the golden details on the walls. A large wardrobe occupied much of one side of the room, matched by a large four-poster bed on the other. But even these garish furnishings could not detract from the serenity of the room. Tall windows lined one wall, and lace curtains flooded softly in the breeze coming in from the lake through the open windows. I listened for a moment at the lapping of the lake water against the shore, and the gentle chirps of birds in the garden. My favourite place in the room, I decided, was a small desk in front of one of the tall windows. It looked like a lovely place to sit and write letters while listening to the birds in the garden. A knock at the door brought my attention back to the room. The platypus, milady. Wilford entered with the animal held at a distance in front of him. Although about my uncle's age, the valet had alert eyes, a straight back, and was always impeccably turned out. In contrast, my uncle was a bit stooped, woolly around the eyes, and his hair was largely unkempt. Where shall I place it? Wilfred looked around the room. 
I wanted to suggest the dustbin, but it would not do to contradict my uncle in front of his staff. I'm not sure, I said, and turned to look at the room as well. There were several small tables scattered around the room, one by the bed, one by a small collection of a sofa and chairs, one on each side of a tall window. But each table was already occupied by its own statuette, or vase, or decoration. My gaze landed on the ornate wardrobe. How about inside the wardrobe? I suggested. I would advise against it, my lady, the valet said, concern clearly discernible in his voice. The creature's unfortunate incident with the lake this morning requires it to remain out in the open, where the air will circulate freely and dry it off. Why can't it stay below stairs? I said, my frustration with the assignment getting the better of me for a moment. The housekeeper, supported in her claim by the cook, has filed a grievance with her ladyship. Apparently, they are familiar with the golden platypus. It has been at the villa before, while it was in the possession of his lordship, Lord Lamberton, a few years ago, before it was whisked away by Lord Abington. And they have expressly asked for the creature not to reside anywhere below stairs on its current visit to the house. So the staff had closed ranks against the platypus. Very well, I said, and sighed. Place it on top of the wardrobe, then. Chapter 5 I had not joined the others for the cold lunch served, as I preferred to take the time to rest from the trip and freshen up. So, as we gathered for drinks before the dinner gong sounded, I was determined to use the opportunity to get to know more about the guests. It hadn't escaped my attention that my uncle had avoided answering the question of whether he was acquainted with the opera singer and the art dealer. Perhaps he even knew the vicar. The Lamberton's choice of guests for the weekend intrigued me. What did an opera singer, an art dealer, a vicar, and some lords all have in common? Were they all really here to see a flower bloom? As my uncle had phrased it, I wondered what the Lambertons were playing at. The situation was made even more curious by the fact that everyone seemed to be avoiding each other as drinks were passed around. Everyone, that is, except Lord Manterbury's secretary, Alistair. He had regrettably discovered, somewhere between the south of France and here, that he was cousins with my friend, Edwina Thompson Brown and used this revelation as an opportunity to strike up a conversation with me. I admit, I had previously expressed a desire to get to know the other secretaries better, and maybe even be included in their clique. But as Alistair Thompson droned on about his tennis game, or was it golf game, I decided some aspirations were better left unfulfilled. I sent glances in James's direction, hoping that he would come talk to me and rescue me from the dull Alistair Thompson. But all I received in return was a dark scowl. So I nodded here and there as my companion spoke, but in reality spent the time examining the other guests. Lord and Lady Lamberton were outdoing each other, talking over one another, trying but failing to get a conversation going among the guests. The lords of the Royal Society, Lord Mantlebury, Lord Pakenham, and my uncle, Lord Tatham, huddled in one corner of the room, discussing some sort of beetle or other. But something about their animated, dare I call it forced, immersion in the topic made me suspect that they were seeking to eschew conversation with the other guests. I wondered why. James lounged in the vicinity of the lords, but didn't seem to be paying attention to their conversation. I turned my attention to the opera singer. She didn't strike me as the sort of woman my uncle would socialize with. Not if my aunts had anything to say about it. 
from Lord Lamberton's monologue, interrupted at regular intervals by amendments from Lady Lamberton, it transpired that Diva Grigorescu was a Romanian soprano who had taken La Scala by storm in the last century, and had spent much of the beginning of this one visiting the opera houses of Chicago, Baltimore, and New York, though her North American engagements had dwindled during the war. Her companion, Hans Hunkler, was an art dealer from Zurich. In keeping with his ordinary personality, besides having brokered a few art sales and purchases for Lord and Lady Lamberton, nothing much was mentioned about him. Lady Lamberton added that Diva Grigorescu was invited as a treat for the guests and would sing for us the following night, prior to our outing to the conservatory to observe the opening of the Queen of the Night. One queen paving the way for another! Lord Lamberton attempted to deliver something between flattery and a joke. No one laughed, and the diva did not seem to appreciate the compliment. At least that answered why the opera singer and the art dealer were here. But I was still not clear on the vicar and his wife. Was the vicar angling for a membership in the society? Passing around a lovely aperitif made from local lemons that tasted like melted sour candy, Lord Lamberton explained that the western shore of Lake Garda was known as the Lemon Riviera, due to a mild microclimate, which allowed lemons to grow this far north. In past centuries, the region even supplied the courts of northern Europe with lemons. He also explained that the white columns I had observed on our ride in were structures for growing lemons left over from the previous centuries. The eastern shore of Lake Garda, which did not get as much sun, was apparently known as the Olive Riviera. I hoped no olive oil cocktails were forthcoming. But despite the lovely cocktails, the mood in the room remained decidedly chilly, and the conversation continued to be one-sided and strained. No one seemed to care about Lord Lamberton's description of the villages around the lake, and even Lady Lamberton's effervescence could not sustain a conversation. The conversation among the lords had inexplicably moved to the topic of how the island had fared during the Great War. I heard my uncle exclaim in surprise a couple of times, and turned to watch him. Yes, this island was requisitioned by the army, Lord Lamberton was saying, being so close to the border with Austria and all. The region just north of us used to be Austrian. People still speak German, although the fascists are trying to beat that out of them, his wife added. There is actually still a heap of ammunition and explosives in the grottos, left over from the Great War, you see, when the island was occupied by the army. So don't wander over to the grottos if you don't want to see your hand blown off, Lady Lamberton said, and then laughed, as though it were a joke. Indifferent to ammunition and explosives, I turned my attention to Mrs. Reverend Horatia Quinton, the vicar's wife. I had observed her earlier to be vivacious, but now she remained silent and sullen. Her mood was matched by her husband's. Although his hair was now washed and once again sparkling under the light of the crystal chandelier, it appeared he regretted jumping into the lake to save the platypus. He avoided eye contact and conversation, especially on the topic of the platypus. Lord Lamberton had explained that the vicar had spent two years on a mission in Africa and had met his wife in Kenya. Perhaps having spent time away from civilization accounted for the vicar's shyness, I decided. The dinner gong sounded. As we prepared to walk into the dining room, I noticed Mrs. Reverend Horatio Quinton's dress. If I was not much mistaken, it was one of the latest models from Madeleine Viennet. The signature bias cut was something I would recognize anywhere. I had been admiring a very similar model at the Designers Avenue Montaigne studio just recently, and as we filed into the dining room, I wondered how a vicar from Africa could afford to buy his wife French couture. Chapter 6 Dinner was a lavish affair, held in an oversized dining room 
that, like the rest of the house, was decorated with frescoes, marble statues, and large paintings in gilded frames. The table was set with flowers and candles, and the requisite crystal glasses and silver place settings. After various antipasti, rice, pasta, and fish dishes, a British-style entree came, much to the visible relief of most of those seated around the table. I had seen my uncle and the other lords pushing the unfamiliar tidbits around their plates and filling up on wine instead. The wine seemed to do what no amount of prompting from the hosts had, and with loosened tongues, the conversation turned to tomorrow's soiree. We'll have a couple more guests tomorrow, Lady Lamberton said, the Italian chap who is responsible for this region, and our niece, Flora. I understand she arrived recently from Africa, I said. That's right. Egypt, to be exact. My sister and her husband were archaeologists there. They passed away, regrettably. She elected to remain in Egypt. She studies things there, like her parents. Although I think she's called something else, Lady Lamberton said uncertainly. An anthropologist, my dear, Lord Lamberton said. She contributes research to the British Museum, he added, addressing me. That's right. Lady Lamberton took over. She sometimes travels deep into Africa to study natives and such. She has turned out a wonderful young lady, Lord Lamberton said. That she has, his wife agreed. I admit, I was worried when I heard she was spending time among the savages. We were quite fortunate that the chaps from the British consulate were able to reach her. I wrote her a letter and didn't expect her to reply any time soon, but fortunately, a friend of hers was going down that way and delivered it to her. How fortunate, the vicar's wife said. Communication on the African continent can be appalling. Yes, of course. You have first-hand experience with that, don't you? Lord Lamberton said and chuckled. He gestured in the direction of the vicar and addressed the table. This strapping young chap here, he is the vicar of our parish in England, don't you know? But suddenly he got a calling to spread the good word among the natives and found a post in Africa. Left a curate in his place at the parish for the past two years. Splendid chap, the curate, but not as enjoyable as our vicar. The ladies of the parish have particularly missed him, eh, vicar? The vicar shifted, as though embarrassed by Lord Lamberton's insensitive comment. Ah, oh, how wonderful, the opera singer said. Her booming voice, which we were hearing for the first time, was something of a surprise to more than one person at the table. So wonderful when one hears the word of God and follows it. There was something in her tone that could have been sarcasm. But I must have imagined it. Yes, he is a wonderful chap, our Reverend Quinton, said Lord Lamberton, beaming in the vicar's direction. And how heroic of him to rescue the golden platypus today. Hear, hear, added some of the lords, and drank to the vicar's and the platypus's health. Capital, capital, Lord Lamberton continued. I knew I had made the right choice for our benefits at our parish when his uncle, Bernard, wrote to me to recommend young Horatio here for the post. He beamed once again in the vicar's direction. In fact, he addressed the vicar. Isn't a cousin of yours employed with Lord Featherly? Yes, your lordship, the vicar said, and shifted in his seat again. Perhaps he was hot and uncomfortable in his garments, as his personal secretary. Yes, your Uncle Bernard is quite good at getting positions for his nephews. He has another one installed in Enough, Harold. Lady Lamberton interrupted her husband. No one wants to hear about offices procured by Bernard Dewhurst for his relations. Tell me, dear. She turned to the vicar's wife. Is it really hot in Africa? The young woman laughed, but not a shy or uncomfortable laugh as one would expect from a vicar's wife when addressed by nobility. At least that had been my experience when my mother addressed the wives of clergy. But one of self-assurance. Oh, it is quite hot. But up in the Wanjoe Valley in Kenya, 
the climate is quite similar to England. We have built a wonderful miniature England, complete with polo and cricket. The mention of the Wanjoy Valley jogged my memory, but for a moment I couldn't remember why I knew the name. Have you never been to Africa yourself? The vicar's wife asked. I thought that perhaps with your sister and her husband in Egypt... Alas, no. Lady Lamberton shook her head. I wanted to go, on a grand safari through the savannah, but Harold isn't much for shooting things. You know, we have a whole trophy room here full of animals that my father and grandfather shot on various hunting trips. Do you know what Harold's contribution to the collection is? A pheasant! She laughed wholeheartedly. Her husband did not like the joke. It's a peacock, dear, he said through gritted teeth. Yes, quite, said Lady Lamberton after she had regained her composure. And he did not even shoot it. The peacock was one of a pair that my father had on the island, and my husband had the male one stuffed after it died of old age. She chuckled to herself for a few moments. And what brings you to the island? The opera singer asked the vicar's wife, changing the subject to the visible relief of Lord Lamberton. My husband wanted to visit... The vicar's wife began. We were on our way to England. The vicar interrupted her with eagerness, showing some interest in the conversation at last. I heard from my cousin, who's employed with Lord Featherly, that the Royal Society was making its way to the island for the Queen of the Night Flower, and it sounded so intriguing. He seemed to relax after this delivery and leaned back in his chair. Oh, yes, quite the vicar's wife said with little conviction. This island is so beautiful, she said, more convincingly. She turned to Lord Lamberton. Has it been in the family long? Actually, he replied, it's been in my wife's family. Thank you, dear. I'm sure I know my family's history better. It's been in my family since the 16th century, she addressed the vicar's wife. It was built by the Medici. Yes, I have Medici blood in me, she announced at the table, as though being related to a family known as Poisoners was a boon. As no one took the bait, she continued, Well, it was a very distant relative through the King of France. She waved off the Medici with her hand and pressed on. But there is some family law she said, lowering her voice, that we are related to the Capuletti. You know, the Verona family on which Shakespeare based his Capulets. She scrutinized the table to see if this utterance would have a greater effect. Oh, how wonderful! The vicar's wife chirped. Lady Lamberton seemed pleased. This island must be full of so much history, I said. Yes, my dear, Lady Lamberton said, but much of it is family law. She waved her hand again, as though it was of little consequence. Speaking of law, there is a rumour that at one time there was a Leonardo hanging in the family chapel on the island. Lord Lamberton ventured into the discussion again. While the conversation thus far had elicited little interest from the guests, the mention of a painting by Leonardo da Vinci seemed to excite all. We turned in unison to listen to Lord Lamberton. What? A Leonardo da Vinci? The Swiss art dealer asked, his professional interest piqued. Like the one in the Louvre Museum? The vicar attempted to clarify. He leaned forward with interest. You mean the Mona Lisa? The vicar's wife added her eyes wide with wonder. Lady Lamberton nodded. Yes, a lost Leonardo da Vinci painting. A Salvador Mundi. Her face was bright and animated. She was clearly enjoying all the attention. Is possible, her husband added, though it's not certain that it was a Leonardo da Vinci. The records are murky. But we've done a bit of research. 
The Medici were great patrons of Leonardo. Of course it was a Leonardo! His wife interrupted him, though now sadly lost. Do you know when it disappeared? The art dealer asked. Oh, it was centuries ago, replied Lady Lamberton. It has not been in the family records for a while. So many things disappear from this island, her husband added. Really? Diva Grigorescu said. What else? Well, during the sacking of Venice by Napoleon, Lord Lamberton said, the French army plundered all the riches of the region, and my wife's family— Ah, I know the period you are speaking of, Lord Pakenham said, finding the topic to his liking. The Doge of Venice, Ludovico Manin, was lucky to get away with his life. His kingdom was ransacked. Venice was plundered, and all was hauled off to France. Though your house seems not much affected by that, said the diva, casting a keen glance around the dining room. Well, funny thing, that. My wife's family, at the time, took care to... Not now, Harold. No one wants to hear about my family, Lady Lamberton said, interrupting her husband. She did not look pleased with the direction the conversation had taken. I say, Lord Mantlebury piped up, as though just catching up with the conversation. You are quite right. Things do tend to disappear on this island. Did you not misplace a most precious chalice at one time? What was it now? Two years ago. Remember, Alistair? He turned to his personal secretary. Alistair Thompson seemed startled to be addressed, and a yes, quite, was all that he could contribute. Lord Pakenham rescued him by adding, Damn strange thing. Remember, Vicar? You were here as well. He turned to the man of cloth. The vicar choked on his wine a bit. Yes, what a shame, he said after clearing his throat. Such a significant loss for the religious community. The Lords Mantlebury and Pakenham seemed to be enjoying reminiscing about this particular incident on the island. Was this one of the society pranks my uncle had referred to, I wondered? Now I remember, Lord Mantlebury continued. Most of the guests had already departed from the island when the chalice disappeared, so it could not have been any of them. The diva here had left for Milan with Herr Hunkler, and we, the members of the society, were just getting ready to leave. That's right, Lord Pakenham added. And you, Harold, were accused of cheating. Lost the golden platypus to Lord Abington that morning, just as he was departing. He laughed at the other's misery. Well, yes, Lord Lamberton cleared his throat. Those accusations were entirely without merit, and you know it. And I would have been able to defend myself had it not been for that damned chalice going missing. Couldn't find it anywhere. And we searched everywhere. And every one, as I remember, added Lord Pakenham, a note of indignity in his voice. No way to treat your guests, old man. Oh, is things disappearing? Lord Lamberton murmured almost to himself. He shook his head and sank into his chair, as though lost in thoughts of the mysteries of the island. No matter, my dear, his wife said to him, kindly. Even if we had found the chalice, you would have given it away to a museum by now. This was not said with kindness. Lady Lamberton turned to the table. A herald blames the fairies that live in the lake, you know she said, with a strange cheerfulness in her voice. Fairies? The vicar's wife asked excitedly, as though this topic was more to her liking. I wasn't sure whether Lady Lamberton had changed the subject to draw attention away from the chalice, but it seemed, judging by the expressions around the table, that quite a few people found the fairies interesting. Yes, they are called Luzuri, little lights. In Italian, Lord Lamberton said. In fact, Flora is here studying them. 
The region is quite rich in tales about them. The Lazuri appear as lights, as small as a firefly or as large as a lamp. They are attracted to water and fires made by humans. Oh, they are mischievous little things, apparently afraid of the cross. The local people believe the Lazuri protected them from wolves. So don't be afraid if you see lights dancing in the night. It will just be the Luzuri. Chapter 7 Conversation at dinner had improved towards the end, and an animated discussion of fairies and folklore had ensued. The liveliness that had started at dinner seemed to continue during the night. I was not a novice at country house parties, so I knew of some of the shenanigans that usually went on after lights out, although I never participated in them. But the foot traffic during the first night at Villa Veronese was more reminiscent of a marching band down the Promenade des Anglais in Nice than a night of escapades at a county house. Doors opened and closed. Doors creaked. Feet tiptoed past my door. Floorboards groaned. I had left the shutters on my windows open. I preferred waking up to daylight than to a servant lurking over me with a teacup in darkness. And with all the noise, I couldn't sleep. I got up to breathe in some of the fresh lake air and look at the peaceful garden, illuminated by the moon. To my surprise, several Uzuri bobbed up and down the garden path and into the little copse beyond. Had the Lamberton's reference to fairies and lights been a coded message for the guests? Were guests partaking in midnight trysts in the garden? I had heard rumors of hedonistic behavior at some country houses, but I couldn't believe such things would happen here. For one thing, the party at the villa was unevenly matched, with old gentlemen prevailing. With me out of the running, there were only three other women in the party. Lady Lamberton, the vicar's wife, and Diva Grigorescu. But surely, Lady Lamberton and Mrs. Horatio Quinton were happily married. Well, perhaps not in Lady Lamberton's case, I conceded. But I now remembered why the Wanjoi Valley in Kenya, where Reverend and Mrs. Horatio Quinton had spent a considerable amount of time, had sounded familiar to me. Even though travel to and from the Wanjoi Valley was difficult, slow, and fraught with setbacks, news from the so-called Happy Valley had traversed the vast distances of the continents with astonishing speed. So even spinsters in the dullest of counties in England would have heard by now of the most extraordinary stories of the goings-on in the valley. But I was sure the vicar and his wife would never engage in such lustful conduct. And what about Diva Grigorescu? Did older gentlemen find her attractive? I had discerned nothing appealing in her demeanor. But, as evidenced by the golden platypus, beauty was in the eye of the beholder. I shuddered at the thought. Curiosity duly piqued by the dancing lights, however, I decided to make my way to the lavatory, to see if I could get a glimpse of who was involved in the moonlit diversions. In return for being allowed to attend Oxford University, I had acquiesced to my mother's insistence that I attend a finishing school in Switzerland. Frau Baumgottnerhoff, the headmistress of the school selected for me, however, had made, unbeknownst to my mother, drastic changes in the establishment syllabus, Foremost on Frau Baumgottenhoff's curriculum was a young lady's ability to be self-sufficient. To that end, she had instilled in her charges the importance of carrying an electric torch at all times. In addition to being able to illuminate one's way in the dark, torches could also be used for signalling. It was the former utility of the instrument, however, that I employed as I left my bedroom. But no sooner had I closed my door that I extinguished the light. I realized that the moonlight spilling from the tall windows of the corridor provided sufficient light to show the way. 
The second reason why I turned off the torch was that I heard the unmistakable hum of human speech in the distance. In the stillness of the night, surrounded by smooth marble walls, the distinctive murmur of a human's voice, though only a whisper, was impossible to conceal. Recently divorced, and having ascertained the usefulness of stealth in resolving domestic complications, another skill that Frau Baumgartenhoff had bestowed on her charges was the ability to move along corridors in silence. Thus, I stepped on feline toes, creeping from shadow to shadow, hiding in the darkness cast by marble statues. Fortunately, Villa Veronese was chock-full of life-sized figures guarding each tall window, and made my way to the source of the murmur. And where are you coming back from? The vicar! I was sure it was him. It couldn't be any other lords. The voice was of a young man. And it was not James. And Alistair Thompson had an annoying nasal voice, which this person did not. Keep your pretty face out of it. I better get my cut this time. It was the opera singer. I was sure of it. Her accent was quite recognizable, even in the dark. Not a midnight tryst for these two, then. Now, keep calm, said the vicar, trying to keep his own voice tranquil, but a trembling note of concern betrayed him. It's here, on the island. I just need a bit of time to get my hands on it. You better, or I will get my hands on you, she hissed at him. We've waited long enough. Was that a threat? And don't think of running to Africa again, she added. The vicar did not reply immediately. My wife will wonder where I am, he finally said, and I heard footsteps moving in my direction. I held my breath as he walked by me. I hoped he couldn't see me in the shadows. I waited for him to enter his room. His door closed. Then a second door closed. The divas, I assumed. Just as I was about to make my way back to my room, I heard a third door close. Had someone else overheard their conversation? And more importantly... Had someone else observed me hiding in the shadows? Chapter 8 After such an exciting night, breakfast the next day was a disappointment. Instead of stimulating conversation, or even oblique references to the goings-on of the previous night, there was the same awkward silence and stilted conversation that had played the drinks and dinner the previous night. Had no one overheard the musical doors? Had no one seen the lights in the gardens? I knew at least three other people were up last night, but the vicar and the diva gave no visible acknowledgement of their meeting and conversation. And who was the third person who had been up during the night? Whose was the third door that had closed? I threw a furtive look around the table, but got no answer. And if there had been any midnight rendezvous of the amorous kind, everyone gathered at the morning table was keeping it to themselves. Lady Lamberton informed me that my uncle was taking breakfast in his room. I wondered if his gout was acting up again. The other lords chatted merrily about tonight's Queen of the Night soiree. Lord Lamberton assured his guests that the blooming of the flower was proceeding to plan, and by all indications, the flower was to open tonight. Diva Grigorescu was to favor us with an aria from some opera or other, just as the flower began to open. How droll. I really wished I was somewhere more exotic with my own set. Even Poppy, a chum I could only tolerate in small doses, would be a nice diversion. I wondered if James would be up for a game of tennis, or even croquet. Why was I even on this island? I asked myself while buttering some toast. Following breakfast, 
I went in search of the reason why I was on this island, namely my aging relation, Uncle Albert. After all, I was in his employ, and secretarial duties were a daily task. If I couldn't be entertained, at least I could be useful. Ah, young Carol, top of the morning to you. My uncle chirped. Have you ever slept better? I smiled amiably. Oh, how ignorant my uncle was of the happenings in the villa. I had never spent a night in a more restless house, not even when spending the week at Cordelia Swanson Brett's house in the Highlands. When her father elected to exercise the hounds in the gallery, instead of exposing them to the elements during an unseasonably cold spell in July. How is your foot? I asked. Never better. Why? He said, cheerfully. Nothing, I said, and shrugged the question off. I wondered why he had not joined the others for breakfast. No post this morning? I asked, glancing at the decidedly bare desk. Alas, no, my uncle said, sighing. Wilfred informs me that the postal service has not improved much since the war. Even though that portly chap with the face of a bulldog... What's his name, Wilfred? Mussolini, my lord, said the valet. Yes, him. Even though he has taken control of all communications in the country, he hasn't made it better. My uncle shook his head as though personally offended by Mussolini's shortcomings. Getting letters to the island has always been difficult, Lord Lamberton tells me. What with the water and all? I think the Lamberton sent a boy to pick up the mail once a day. But I don't anticipate much mail here. No parcels from Switzerland with Muesli or Toblerones for me, then. I was running dangerously low on Toblerones and would have to ration myself until we made it off the island. Looked another way, however, the difficulty with the mail meant that any letters from my mother would not find me with ease. I pondered for a moment about how the telegraph communications functioned on the island, having been assailed by a particularly hefty telegram from my mother and niece, but figured that those would be fraught with even more difficulties. My mood lifted, Perhaps being secluded on an island had its advantages. Anything else I could do? I said, looking around. No, my dear. Just keep an eye on the golden platypus. I trust all is well with my trophy. Truth be told, I had no idea how the platypus on the top of my wardrobe was doing. I had spared it neither thought nor a glance this morning. I preferred to pretend it wasn't there. Good, I said with confidence. It was not likely that anyone was going to take it away, no matter what my uncle imagined. Capital, he said, and clapped. I thus spent a pleasant morning wandering about the gardens. The Italian garden, with its geometric boxwood design, rectangular pools, and a delightful fountain in the middle, gave way to the winding paths and exuberant blooms of the English garden. One of the terraces below the house was devoted to a fragrant citrus tunnel, and I walked underneath the divinely smelling flowers and fruits more than once. I then shared a game of tennis with the vicar's wife, whose name transpired to be Olive. One can tell a lot about a person by their tennis game, and the vicar's wife revealed herself to be determined and self-assured, there was no mistaking the look of ambition in her eyes and in her powerful serve. With her by his side, I was certain the vicar's career would be long and illustrious. The rest of the afternoon, I spent rowing around the perimeter of the island. My time at Oxford University may have prepared me for little else, besides composing diverting family mottos in Latin, but it had given me an excellent rowing stroke. I circled around the island several times. A casual observer would have seen me taking a bit of fresh air, coupled with a partaking in the refined and noble sport of bird-watching. It was an activity of which even my uncle would approve. 
And shouldn't the private secretary to an esteemed member of the Royal Society for the Natural History Appreciation take interest in such things? Every few yards I would rest and take out a pair of binoculars, another indispensable tool in my bag of necessities from Frau Baumgartenhoff, to observe the flora and the fauna of the island more closely. While my interest in the natural history of the island was all well and good, the truth was that I had a more nefarious goal in mind. As Frau Baumgartenhoff had taught her charges, binoculars were an excellent tool for gathering intelligence. In her case, the binoculars had been used to gather details about her husband's assignation with the milkmaid. In my case, I was curious about why the lights from the previous night had been moving in the direction of the grottos. Were they really little fairies? With each pass around the island, I was, in fact, attempting to get a better look at the grottos. From one particular vantage point from the lake, the entrance of the grottos was clearly visible. The artificial caves were much what one would expect of such structures in an Italian garden. The entrance was designed to look like a rocky outcrop, and decorated with imitation shells, gems, a reclining mermaid, water nymphs and sprites, and other such whimsical things. They were a cool escape from the heat, and most Italian villas had them. Some were used to keep wine, others, as in the case of this Villa Veronese, to keep ammunition. At one point, boats began arriving from the shore with provisions for this evening's gathering. Crates of fresh vegetables, fish, meats and champagne were offloaded on the dock, one after the other. I saw Lady Lamberton walking through the gardens and pointing out to a young man which flowers to cut. I assumed these blooms would decorate the villa this evening. I have to admit, however, that my charade netted me very little. I counted a common coot, two great crested grebes, three black-headed gulls with their wings spread out, and the diva waving her arms animatedly at the art dealer in the English garden, probably practicing her aria for tonight. But I learned little about the grottos. The Lambertons had been correct— the grottos were stuffed with crates full of ammunition and war equipment. Barricades encircled the grotto's entrances to hinder and warn away curious onlookers. I rode back to the boathouse, no wiser why the guests of the villa, or fairies for that matter, would be interested in the grottos. As I left the rowboat to be put away, I ran across Lady Lamberton, walking back in from the garden. We stood on the terrace for a moment, observing as more crates of wine and fruit arrived from the mainland. In a rare moment of sincerity, Lady Lamberton sighed and said, I fear this party is a bit of a failure. I searched for a way to cheer her up. I'm sure the scavenger hunt this evening will liven up the party. I hope you're right, my dear, she said and sighed and we entered the villa to freshen up for this evening. Chapter 9 At drinks, before dinner, our company swelled. The expected Italian official, Roberto Mancuso, responsible for something or other important in the running of the local government, which I didn't quite catch, had arrived. Short and broad, he was a typical example of the peasants, judging by the photographs I had seen in newspapers, which Mussolini liked to promote in his government. Folds of skin hung over a high collar tightened uncomfortably around his thick neck. Balding, he wore a thick moustache, cultivated as though to compensate for the lack of hair on top. His small, beady eyes sized up everyone in the room. Another drink? Signor Mancuso? asked Lady Lamberton. Just a small one, he answered, bringing his thick fingers together to indicate how small. A little more, he said, when the butler poured him a drink. Well, Lady Lamberton remarked a while later. She had been standing at the window, 
looking out over the gardens. For the past half hour, the tops of the trees had been swaying with ever greater amplitude. We should head into dinner. Our niece Flora is still not here. I can't think what is keeping her. The weather appears to be turning. I hope she makes it before the lake becomes impassable. She threw another look out the window. And I hope the weather holds for what I have planned after. Signora Lamberton, Signor Mancuso began as we headed into the dining room. Every time I walk into dinner at your palazzo, I think of Sua Eccellenza Benito Mussolini, capo del governo, duce del fascismo e fondatore dell'impero. He placed his hand over his heart and bowed slightly. Who? My uncle asked. I think he is talking about Mussolini, I said, leaning to my aged relation. What? Again? My uncle said, looking around for confirmation that no one else was interested in hearing the Italian speak of Mussolini yet again. Signor Mancuso had been mentioning the Italian ruler with predictable regularity since his arrival at Villa Veronese for drinks. I smiled and shook my head at Uncle Albert to warn him that a discussion on the matter was neither polite nor advisable. And what about this villa makes you think of His Excellency Benito Mussolini, head of government, leader of fascism and founder of the empire? Asked Lady Lamberton, as we sat down at the table, her voice betraying dismay that her villa might give rise to such unsavory thoughts. Your villa reminds me of Villa Torlonia, the residence of His Excellency in Rome. Every time I come to dinner, I imagine I am him, sitting down to dinner in Rome. The Italian allowed himself a moment to envision his ambition and gazed hazily in the distance. I say, isn't that the chap who pays one lira a year to the Torlonia family to live there? Said Lord Mantlebury, looking around the table for corroboration. Tough luck, that! Lord Pakenham joined in. Rotten deal! Lady Lamberton threw withering glances at the lords to warn them off the topic. Yes, the Italian official said, and looked around the great dining hall, as though wondering how he could rent the Lambertons' villa for only one lira. But wouldn't it be quite inconvenient for you? I asked Senior Mancuso. I hear communication from the island is quite unreliable, I added, thinking back to what my uncle had said earlier. Quite right. Lady Lamberton jumped in most enthusiastically, ready to wax poetic on the villas and the island's shortcomings. The telephone line is forever down. What if His Excellency phones from Rome and the call is unable to make its way through to the island? What would you do then, Signor Mancuso? A man's voice boomed behind us. Before turning to look, I saw a wave of panic cross the Italian's face. It was clear that he had not considered this eventuality. I followed everyone's lead and turned to look at the source of the voice. Count Contarini! Lady Lamberton exclaimed and rose out of her seat. Welcome! I'm glad you could make it. Standing in the doorway was a tall man in his late twenties. His dark, wavy hair was swept fashionably back, and he wore a well-cut dinner suit. His chiseled face, healthy complexion, and strong shoulders suggested he was an active, outdoorsy man. And his easy smile and witty comment about Mussolini just now showed him to be an affable chap. I liked him. Lady Lamberton bustled around. I got the impression that she liked Count Contarini as well. Forgive my lateness, the Count said, bowing slightly. No matter, I'm glad you were able to make it, Lady Lamberton said, pointing him to his place at the table. Flora's not back yet. Did you have any trouble crossing the lake? She asked, a note of concern discernible in her voice. No, the lake is still passable. But if Laurie is to make it this evening, she should hurry, the Count replied, 
and took his seat. Everyone, I'd like to introduce Count Contarini, Lady Lamberton said. He rose slightly at the introduction and bowed his head. He is a neighbor of ours. He heard we were having a little party and asked to join us. He owns an island just down the lake from us, and he is also well known for producing the fastest boats in Italy. She smiled at him with fondness. Judging by the look on Lord Lamberton's face, he was not happy with the developments. But I could not determine whether he disliked the Count as a whole, or just his fast Italian boats. Platitudes were exchanged, and dinner continued. What do you think is keeping your niece? I asked Lady Lamberton. I had been looking forward to meeting her, and from Lady Lamberton's exchange with the Count, it sounded as though she might not arrive this evening. I'm not quite sure. Oh, but she's a capable girl. She'll take a room in the village with one of the women if the lake gets too choppy. It happens sometimes. It's the winds, you know, Lord Lamberton said. What is? Lord Mantlebury said. The reason Flora hasn't returned, Lord Lamberton answered. Oh, Lord Mantlebury said, and returned to his pasta. Who's Flora? my uncle asked, leaning over to me. Her ladyship's niece, I murmured back. My uncle could name twenty-six varieties of ladybirds present on the British Isles, but he had a hard time remembering people's names. The winds on the lake are very temperamental, the Count said. They change quickly, since the lake is so narrow and long. One minute, the lake is smooth. The next minute, it's choppy and unpassable. They have different names, these winds, you see. Lady Lamberton said. She turned to the Italian official. Do you know them, Signor Mancuso? He looked up from his food. Irritation passed across his face like a dark cloud, as though unhappy that his hostess had interrupted his meal. No, I'm Sicilian, he said, and puffed out his chest. Appointed here by Benito Mussolini. He tapped his chest a few times with his finger to underline that he was indeed speaking about himself. The gesture left a greasy spot on his dicky. He didn't notice. Yes, indeed, Lady Lamberton answered. How could I forget? She said under her breath. There is the Pele from the north, began Lord Lamberton, which starts in the night and blows through the morning. Then the aura comes blowing from the south, and dies down at sunset. It took me a moment to realize that he was speaking about the names of the winds. By the look on the faces of the other guests, it was clear that they also had trouble following him. But it's the wind inversions you have to worry about, he continued. The locals understand the winds well, and the people at the port won't let you take your boat across if they notice a change. The winds bring fog as well. No one wants to hear about your winds, Harold. Lady Lamberton cut across him. I hope it won't affect our evening, I said, guessing at the source of Lady Lamberton's frustration. With little to do all day, I had been looking forward to this evening's entertainment and the promised scavenger hunt. I would be just as disappointed as her ladyship if the scavenger hunt was called off. Not at all, not at all, said Lady Lamberton, with a slightly forced joviality. I'm sure Diva Grigorescu will still be more than happy to entertain us after dinner. The opera singer inclined her head in agreement and mock modesty. In consideration of this evening's performance, it looked as though she had decorated herself with every jewel she owned. Displayed on her bosom was a sizable sapphire pendant surrounded by diamonds as big as pearls. And if the wind dies down, Lady Lamberton continued, bringing my attention back to the topic at hand, we should have no trouble with a scavenger hunt. It should keep us occupied until midnight, 
and then we will all meet in the conservatory for the opening of the flower. She turned to her husband. How was that coming along, Harold? She gazed at him expectantly, as though he had control over when a flower would bloom. What? Oh, fine, dear. Just fine. You young ones? Lady Lamberton looked towards me and the other secretaries. Could also play some music in the drawing room. We have the most splendid gramophone in there. And I've stocked up on the latest recordings. Jazz out of America. Foxtrot and what not. She waved her hand, letting us fill in the rest of the records. I thought the word she was looking for was Charleston, but did not correct her. Foxtrot had not been popular since the war. Oh, rather! Alistair piped up. I love Foxtrot! I threw a sly look in James's direction, hoping that he would join us for a bit of jazz. But he didn't reciprocate. I then turned my gaze to the Count. He might be up for a bit of dancing. And if the look that the opera singer was throwing the Count was anything to go by, she would be joining us as well. The vicar's wife appeared excited and had been following the conversation with interest, but the vicar, who had been silent throughout the dinner, did not show any interest in the evening's activities. In fact, if I hadn't overheard him arguing with the opera singer, I would have wondered what he was doing here at all. But he was clearly seeking something of value at the villa. He just didn't look happy about it. As the dessert was passed around, a delicious pudding with lashes of cream and berries, a chair scraped against the floor. If you'll excuse me, Lady Lamberton, I need to retire to my room. It was the Swiss chap. It was the first time I had heard him speak that evening. I had quite forgotten he was there. He looked positively green around the gills, and I wondered if it was something he ate. But then again, all of us ate the same thing. Perhaps the dessert did not agree with him. Having tried some Swiss dessert during my time at Frau Baumgartnerhoff's establishment, I could attest that they could do with more dollops of cream and fresh fruit on them. Are you ill? Lady Lamberton asked the obvious. It's nothing, just a bit of a stomach ache. It will pass, he said, and obviously fought to control a spasm that almost made him double over. Jenkins! Lady Lamberton motioned to the butler. Take Herr Hunkler to his room, and make sure Cook sends him something to ease his indigestion. Thank you for a lovely evening, the Swiss said, his voice strained and husky as the butler led him away. I turned to look at the opera singer. As his obvious travel companion, I expected Diva Grigorescu to rush to his aid. She did nothing of the sort. She remained in her seat and followed Herr Hunkler's progress across the room with what looked like suspicion. She then turned her gaze back to the guests at the table and found the vicar. He returned her questioning look. Glancing furtively from the diva to the vicar, I wondered if they had planned something clandestine for tonight, and if the Swiss chap's departure was part of their plan. Chapter 10 Must be the food, Lord Lamberton said, shaking his head. It takes getting used to. All this pasta and cream and duck and butter. Up here they cook with butter, you know. Down south they cook with the oil pressed from olives. It's not our food, Harold. Lady Lamberton interrupted her husband. Ladies, shall we go through and leave the men to their cigars and drinks? She led the way, and I followed her, along with the rest of the ladies, the diva and the vicar's wife. Lady Lamberton showed us to an elegant room, just off the dining room, with a grand piano. This, then, must be where the diva would entertain us before the scavenger hunt. A woman was sitting with her back to us, toying with the piano's keys. 
She turned around as we entered and started back. Oh, you startled me, she said, and took her hands off the keys, as though she were a child caught touching something verboten. She seemed to regain her composure after a moment and smiled. Her smile was captivating, akin to something one would see in a Hollywood actress. She wore a slim and form-fitting sequined black dress with an open back. Her dark hair was cut in an exquisite line in the most frightfully fashionable bob. Ah, Flora! Lady Lamberton exclaimed, relief evident on her face. You made it back! Yes, just. The crossing was atrocious. Sorry I missed dinner, aunt. She walked up to her aunt and gave her a couple of kisses on the cheeks. Lady Lamberton went further and hugged her niece in a most un-English way, layers of gauze unwrapping her young relation. I'll have Cook make you a plate of something if you'd like, Lady Lamberton offered, and started for the bell. No, it's not necessary. I had something in town, her niece said. In that case, let me introduce you to our guests, Lady Lamberton said. Introductions were made, and we all fell into an easy conversation. The conversation was carried mostly by Flora and the vicar's wife. They reminisced about life on the African continent, although it sounded as though each lived in quite a different part of the continent. From the vicar's wife's description of Kenya, it seemed as though it was a place quite similar to England, while Flora's description of Egypt and the rest of Africa sounded frightfully exotic— Deserts and camels, mighty rivers and waterfalls, natives with spears and painted faces. The men made their way to the music room, and introductions were renewed. Chairs were arranged, and we all sat down to listen to Diva Grigorescu sing, with Lady Lamberton taking a seat to accompany her on the piano. Count Contarini maneuvered his chair in such a way that after everyone was seated, he ended up sitting next to me. I was not displeased. He leaned in and whispered, I must confess, I requested an invitation today from Lady Lamberton, because I saw you rowing on the lake. A girl who could row that well. I just dad to meet you. I was flattered, but I also thought that perhaps he should bear to meet my friend, Persephone Kettering Trapson, or Poppy for short. She was an excellent rower and had a fondness for foreign chaps. Your villa is on a different island, is it not? I said. You surely do not possess binoculars powerful enough to observe this island. He laughed. No, he said. What I possess is a powerful boat. Similar to Lord Lamberton's, but made here on the lake, by Italians. I was out on the lake when I saw you. We shall have a race one day, Lord Lamberton and I, to determine who is faster and more powerful, the American boat or the Italian. I shall take you for a ride in my boat tomorrow? Although he had phrased the statement as a question... I had a hard time believing I was strong enough to resist his charm. Oh, my poor mother. What would she think if I married an Italian count? I probably imagined it, but I could feel James's eyes burning into my back. I would have liked to turn around and check, but did not dare. Perhaps I only wished it was so. Lady Lamberton played a few introductory chords on the piano, and it became immediately apparent that her enthusiasm for the instrument was greater than her ability. But thus sequestered on the island, we were literally her captive audience. At least the diva's singing would surely drown out the grand piano. Perhaps not. As the diva began to sing, her powerful voice shook the room, but the voice cracked, and as hard as the diva tried to hit her high notes, they always seemed to be just out of her reach. Between Lady Lamberton's playing and the diva's singing, 
I had rarely seen anyone less self-aware. Each seemed to be performing the same musical piece, but their notes diverged at the most critical moments. The scraping of chairs against the polished parquet floor let me know I was not the only one hearing the dissonance. It sounded as though people were maneuvering chairs in an attempt to remove themselves from the direct path of the diva's voice. But when I permitted myself a glance at the other guests, I noticed that the lords of the society were staring at the diva as though in awe. I could only conclude that they were hard of hearing. I resigned myself to accepting that this was one of those fiery trials sent to test us that Reverend Mardme had so often referred to during my school days. I had been promised a glamorous party, but all I got was a vicar and his wife, an opera singer past her prime, and a stuffy Swiss art dealer with indigestion. I sulked in my chair and thought of the alternatives. There was the Count. I was certain he could be a fun distraction. But I truly preferred English chaps, built along the lines of James. That thought made me even more miserable. There was always London, I considered, but the spectre of my mother loomed large across the British Isles. One benefit of being stuck on an island in the middle of a lake, with a poor telephone connection and unreliable mail, was that my mother's meddling could be kept at bay. Upon reflection, I decided I preferred to listen to the diva great on. Chapter 11 Oh, that was wonderful! Lady Lamberton said, after a final flourish on the keyboard. So much power! So much feeling! Surely she could not be sincere. The performance was met with enthusiasm from some quarters, namely the Lords, and with tepid reviews from all the others. Now, onward to more delights, Lady Lamberton said, and clapped her hands. In keeping with the artistic tone of the evening, I have devised a little scavenger hunt, built around the poems of my favourite poet, Lord Tennyson. She placed a hand on her bosom. I really hoped Lady Lamberton did not intend to recite Lord Tennyson to us. I may have endured the diva's singing, but I did not think my resolve was strong enough to endure a Lord Tennyson recital. Now, let's divide into pairs, she began. No, Harold, you come with me, she said, and pulled her husband back as he made a dash for their niece. I looked around in the hope that James would wish to be my partner, but at that moment Flora hastened in his direction, and I had to content myself with being paired with the Count. It didn't matter. I remembered that I was supposed to be ignoring James. Plus, it was better to play this game with someone who perhaps knew the island better than the English guests. And at least I wasn't paired with Alistair, who partnered in the end with the diva. Lord Mantlebury hovered in Lord Pakenham's vicinity. The vicar and his wife formed a team, and the Lambertons formed another. It was only at the last moment that I saw my uncle looking around, confused and perhaps a little hurt by being left out. I was about to ask him to join our team when Signor Mancuso sidled up to him and they became a team. The rules of the scavenger hunt were simple. The teams were to pull a piece of paper from a hat, follow its clues, collect an item hidden in the gardens, and then make their way to the conservatory for the midnight soiree to witness the opening of the Queen of the Night. It was all terribly exciting. Lady Lamberton may not be very proficient at the piano, but she knew how to plan a scavenger hunt. I was something of a connoisseur, having participated in many such games in London. I felt in my element, and I was sure we would beat James and Flora. As promised, each of us received a quote from a Lord Tennyson poem. I was read, Four grey walls and four grey towers Overlook a space of flowers. I grabbed a lantern 
This way, Count Contarini, I said, and led the way towards the French doors that opened onto the terrace. I almost grabbed his hand so he would follow me out at a quicker pace. James and his partner had already left. If we are going to be partners in this little game, please call me Giovanni, said the Count, trotting by my side. May I call you Carolyn? Of course, I said. There was no need for formalities with people my age. What a wonderful night for a scavenger hunt, I exclaimed as we stepped into the gardens. Why? Giovanni asked. The wind that had churned the lake earlier and made passage difficult had died down, and a thick fog had descended on the gardens in its wake. The dark shapes of the topiaries in the Italian garden were shrouded in a magical mist. The fog stood still, as though a spider's web caught in the branches of the trees around us. Light from the French doors, now in the distance behind us, and from our lanterns leaked through the darkness and illuminated the milky cover with an eerie glow. Around us, shadows moved through the fog like ghosts. I plunged into the spectral mist. The wings, as Lord Lamberton said, can be unpredictable here, Giovanni said behind me. And sometimes they bring low clouds which cover the islands and the shore in this thick fog that glides around the ground. But the fog tonight appears denser. White wisps slithered along the ground and swirled about our feet as we walked. The Count was right. It felt as though we were walking through clouds. You seem very sure of yourself, Caroline. Have you figured out the clue? Giovanni asked. Do you know where the clue leads us? I think so. I closed my eyes for a moment, trying to picture the perimeter of the island that I had circled that morning. There is a turret, a tower, at the boathouse. I haven't noticed any others. The clue must refer to that tower. But what of a walled garden? Do you know of a walled garden? Giovanni shook his head. Much help he is. Had he not visited the gardens before? Let's go in the direction of the boathouse and then we'll see. It's probably a walled rose garden. I hurried ahead. As we wandered deeper into the gardens, the fog grew thicker. I turned around and realized that I had lost Giovanni. I peered into the darkness. I could not see him. Giovanni? I whispered. No answer. I raised my lantern, but its light would not penetrate through the fog. It only served to illuminate a circle of whiteness, through which it was impossible to see beyond. I lowered the useless light. I am half sick with shadows, I said to myself, and shivered, recalling Lord Tennyson's The Lady of Shalott. I heard footsteps and people moving, rushing through the fog. But all was concealed and seemed to be just beyond what I could see. I wanted to call out for the Count, but feared what would jump out of the shadows. I wondered where the Count had got to, and why he wasn't looking to find me. I heard laughter nearby, and moved in that direction. I wondered if James and Flora were nearby, and what Flora had found so funny. Suddenly, a shadow leaped out of the mist, right ahead of me. I gasped. James! The mist clung to his hair, and his waves had curled at the tips. His damp skin glowed in the lantern's light. We stood in silence for a few moments. Have you misplaced your partner? He asked. I smiled at the way he put it. As you can see. I shrugged. And you, yours? He nodded curtly. I wanted to ask if he had done it on purpose, but I stopped myself. What is your clue? I said, 
moving in closer to read his scrap of paper. I lifted the lantern to get more light. I was aware that our heads were huddled close together, trying to make out the clue by the light of the lamp. If I had a flower for every time I thought of you, I could walk through my garden forever. I read his clue. My breath caught, and I glanced at James, just for a moment. I hoped he hadn't heard me gasp. Uh, have you deciphered the location yet? I asked hastily, to cover my momentary lapse. He shook his head. Shall we search together? I said, and we can look for our partners as well, I added. But in truth, suddenly, I didn't feel like looking for our assigned partners. As we made our way through the dark stillness of the gardens, I began noticing all the fragrances enveloping us. I tried to discern what I was smelling. I caught the heady scent of the lemon and orange trees that formed the citrus tunnel. Then I detected the perfume of those white flowers that release their fragrance at night, attracting moths that I could not name. I think my clue refers to a walled garden, I said, breaking the silence. Near the boathouse, I think. Have you seen such a place? James shook his head. We walked on in silence. I smelled the garden we were searching for before I saw it. The heavy scent of roses permeated the night air. And then the stone wall of the garden emerged out of the darkness on our right. Excitement welled up in me. I began walking faster. I wondered what we would discover at the end of the clue. We followed the outside of the wall until we found an entrance. In here, I said, and led James into the rose garden. I have no idea what we are looking for, though. I ran down the paths, James behind me, among the fragrant rose bushes and trees. In England, it would be too early for roses, but here the warmth and bountiful sunlight had fooled these flowers into blooming. Over there, James said, pointing to something that glinted in the light of his lantern. What is it? I said as I got closer. A wine bucket, I think. He held his lantern over it. As I leaned closer to the silver bucket, I noticed the unmistakable foil wrapped around the bottle's throat. It's champagne! I exclaimed. The bottle was sitting on ice. How wonderfully clever! I bet we get to open it just as a flower opens. I was truly enjoying our little game, especially now that I was chasing the clues with James. Come on, let's find your clue, I said, and grabbed him by the hand. James looked at me as though I were a silly child, but he was smiling. I was certain he was enjoying himself as well. Just a moment, James said and tugged on my hand. He picked up the bucket, still holding my hand, when a shrill scream pierced the night's air. What was that? I said, my heart suddenly hammering in my chest. The scream came again. This way, James said, and began running towards the exit of the walled garden. I followed him. I think it came from this direction, he said pulling me along. He cradled the champagne bucket in one hand and held onto my hand with the other. And don't let go. He squeezed my hand tighter. It won't do to get separated before we know what is happening. Chapter 12 I ran by James's side without saying a word. In the darkness, I could hear the paces of other people concealed by the fog, running on the gravel. Voices spoke out of the shadows, asking each other who screamed and why and where the shout had come from. It seemed as though we all emerged from the fog at the same time and arrived at the conservatory together. The lords of the Royal Society, Lord and Lady Lamberton, Alistair, the Count and Flora. The vicar stood just ahead of us, 
his wife sobbing in his embrace. Oh, what fun! Flora exclaimed. It looks so real. Did you plan this, Aunt Lavinia? She turned to Lady Lamberton. Is this part of the scavenger hunt? Do we get to solve who the killer is? Is it, my darling? Lord Lamberton looked dubiously at his wife. She shook her head. No, she whispered. Her pale face stood out in the darkness, its pallid surface reflecting the light from the torches and lanterns around her. I strained to see over people's shoulders. My view was blocked. I couldn't see what everyone was looking at. Where is Uncle Albert? I asked, looking around. I had just noticed he wasn't among those present. There, said Lady Lamberton, and pointed towards the greenhouse. My heart leaped into my throat. The view was blocked by the vicar and his wife, and some of the lords that had stepped forward. I stepped around them. There, on the ground, was Uncle Albert, kneeling by the body of the diva. She had a knife sticking out of her back. What's worse, Uncle Albert had his hand extended. He was at this very moment holding on to the sapphire of the necklace around the dead woman's neck. What is going on? came the voice of Signor Mancuso out of the darkness. He huffed into the circle of light, cast by our lanterns. He paused to take a breath and take in the scene. My uncle remained kneeling by the body, as though frozen. All eyes were on him, and he was staring back at us in confusion. For a few moments, no one spoke, and no one moved. Guilty or not, I couldn't leave Uncle Albert crouching there, making a spectacle of himself. I leaped in his direction and grabbed my uncle by the elbow. I could hear the Italian official flustering in the background, but before he could say anything, I had my uncle up on his feet. Come on, Uncle Albert, I said, and pulled him away from the body. This is a crime scene, the official spluttered, having found his voice. Don't touch anything. I'm not, I said, a bit defiantly. But your uncle, he protested, pointing to the body and then Uncle Albert. I stood my ground. You can't expect him to stand on his knees until the police come. He's nearly eighty years old. Sixty-nine, uh, my dear. My uncle corrected me gently. Oh, I said. My uncle was not helping his case. Well, should you not make sure the woman is dead and telephone the police? I snapped at the Italian, trying to cover my blunder. James stepped forward to check the diva's pulse. He shook his head. Lady Lamberton led Signor Mancuso back to the house so he could put a call through the police on the mainland. Signor Mancuso left the count in charge as a representative of the Italian state. While we waited for Lady Lamberton and the Italian to come back, we stood in silence and cast accusatory glances at each other. One of us could well be the killer. James took his jacket off to cover the diva. I shuddered, thinking that the weight of the coat would drive the blade of the knife deeper into the body. The woman's extended hand was still visible from under the coat. My gaze travelled to the scene around her. In her fall, the diva must have landed on top of the Queen of the Night, because the plant now lay broken to her left, its creamy white flowers limp and lifeless, struck down before they could fulfil their destiny. Lord Lamberton must have just noticed the flower as well. Oh no, my epiphilum oxypetalum, he said as he leaped to it. He caressed the unopened buds gently. Harold! His wife scolded him from a distance. She was walking back with Signor Mancuso, who also did not look happy. Lord Lamberton jumped back, as though scolded by his wife's voice. 
Signor Lamberton. Signor Mancuso said, you should not be touching the body. He cast a reprimanding look at the Count, as though blaming him for not having taken control of the situation. The Count, who had been staring at the body, apologized sheepishly and looked as if he was coming out of a trance. When would the police be here? Lord Lamberton said. The phone is not working, his wife said. I cannot connect to the police station. How is that possible? said Flora. Well, the key problem is that we subscribe to a different telephone company than the police. Lady Lamberton explained. Signor Mancuso and the Count both nodded and agreed that this was a common problem in Italy. How tiresome, her niece said. Did you try telephoning the local tavern? her husband asked. What an extraordinary question to ask at such a time, I mused. Of course, Harold. Lady Lamberton hissed at him. They use the same telephone company, you see. She turned to the others. We have better luck telephoning them than the police. But there was no connection. Lady Lamberton's statement made me wonder how many other times they'd had to telephone the police, but kept the thought to myself. Perhaps the wind earlier dislodged something, she said, and waved her hand artistically. Or the wire that runs under water, it's corroded. It has happened once or twice before, added her husband. We'll just have to wait for the fog to clear to send a boat to the shore, the Count said. It's impossible to cross the lake in this fog. Even I, who know it so well, would not dare to set out on the water now. How soon do you think that will be? asked Flora. Tomorrow morning, perhaps, and perhaps longer the Count replied. You mean we can't leave? We are to stay here, trapped on the island, with a killer? The vicar's wife asked, and cast a glance in my uncle's direction. I glared back at her. The Count nodded. So what do we do now? Alistair asked. Signor Mancuso, you are a local official. Lady Lamberton said. You should be in charge. By the looks of it, Signor Mancuso enjoyed being an official in title only, and preferred having not to deal with actual problems. He was sweating and fiddled with his tight collar. I'm not a policeman, he began tentatively. Perhaps the Count, whose family has ruled over these lands for generations, would prefer to take charge, he asked, and threw a shy but optimistic smile in the Count's direction. Oh, what would His Excellency Benito Mussolini, head of government, leader of fascism, and founder of the empire think of you now, Signor Mancuso? I thought, but was wise enough not to say it. I'm sure we've read enough mystery books among us. G.K. Chesterton, Arthur Conan Doyle, the woman who was publishing stories about a Belgian fellow. Uh, the name escapes me. To figure this thing out, said Lord Pakenham with confidence. It's always the amateur detective chaps who figure things out in books, anyway. He adjusted his pince-nez in a self-satisfied way. After a moment, he seemed to falter perhaps worried that the responsibility would fall on him. But he quickly recovered. James here has a good head on his shoulders, he added, and pushed James forward, as though offering him up for sacrifice. Well, Alistair is just as capable, Lord Mantlebury bristled, and shoved a reluctant Alistair forward. Actually, if you remember correctly, it was my young Carol who solved the case in Nice. My uncle spoke up, entering the fray. A few people looked at me. I groaned inwardly. Not another contest. Well, yes, 
I'm sure we can figure it out by ourselves. Lady Lamberton took over, at least until the police arrive. What should we do with the body? She cast an expectant look around the group. Should we leave it here? suggested Lord Mantlebury. We can't. What if some wild animals come? said the vicar's wife. On the island? her husband said. Flora chuckled. This is not Africa. Perhaps not, the vicar's wife said in a demure voice. The murder must have shaken her up because she had lost some of the confidence she had displayed during our game of tennis. We could move it to the old Ice house, suggested Lady Lamberton. It's not used any more, but should be cool and out of the way. And we'll lock the greenhouse, added her husband. As servants were called to transport the body to the ice house, Lady Lamberton led the guests back to the house. Chapter 13 We gathered in the smoking room. A fire blazed in the fireplace. A great log crackled as the yellow flames licked its sides. We each held a stiff drink. It would have made a cosy scene, were it not for the dead body now resting in the ice house. The fire was laid to take away the chill of the shock that gripped us, and drinks were passed all around to steady our nerves. Well, where should we begin? The Count asked. Having accepted the offer to take charge, the Count now stood facing us, his imposing frame silhouetted against the fireplace. Signor Mancuso scurried in the Count's vicinity. He had taken on the role of his deputy, but mostly he just huffed and perspired without adding much to the proceedings. We sat in groups, scattered among the deep leather chairs and sofas of the smoking room. I hadn't failed to notice that Flora was sitting next to James. She lounged, her body extended as though to display her dress to its best advantage. Her scarlet lips tugged on her cigarette holder from time to time, then puffed out smoke languidly. I wished I possessed her fortitude. I sat by my uncle's side to show my support. Considering the way people in the room were avoiding him, my poor uncle had already been condemned by most as guilty. Even his chums from the Royal Society made certain to sit far away from him. Regardless of the compromising situation in which we had found him, I believed my uncle to be innocent. I believed he was innocent, not only because he was my relative, but also because he did not know the diva. He had no reason to kill her. Well, we can start with a motive, Flora said, looking around at those gathered in the room. Isn't that what they do in detective novels? Why was the opera singer killed? Terrible singing? Someone muttered. Someone else chuckled. Lady Lamberton cleared her throat disapprovingly. Not now, Harold. Do you think someone came here specifically to kill her? Flora said. Flora raises a good point, James said. Who knew the diva would be here? Well, I'm not sure, said Lady Lamberton. But it was the strangest thing. It was actually she who contacted me. Said she'd heard about the party, and could she and Herr Honkler come? Of course, I had no objections. She had been a guest here before. And of course, she had been a great opera singer. Plus, Herr Honkler is well known to most of us here. Is he? asked James. Yes, my boy. Who hasn't bought art from Herr Honkler, right? Lord Lamberton said and chuckled. The other lords coughed and adjusted their chairs at the same time, but no one admitted to buying art from Herr Honkler. Hearing the diva sing this evening, Lady Lamberton continued, I can't think why she wanted to come. 
she was obviously past her prime. She must have had a reason, said James. Maybe she was genuinely interested in the Queen of the Night, I added. She didn't strike me as a flower lover, ventured Lord Mantlebury. I took a turn in the garden with her earlier today, and she was not at all interested in the primula spectabilis I pointed out to her in the rock garden. It is a unique species, found only on Lake Garda at elevations between 500 and 2,500 meters on limestone rocks. He shook his head in utter disbelief at the opera singer's lack of interest. How you have managed to grow it in the rock garden here, Harold, is beyond me. Such a wonderful surprise. He turned to Lord Lamberton. A chorus of assenting murmurs sprang among the lords of the society, my uncle among them, expressing astonishment at Lord Lamberton's good fortune and making plans to visit the plant at the earliest convenience in the morning. Well, can we get back to the point at hand? The Count tried to rein in the conversation. Which was? Lord Pakenham said. The murder! The vicar's wife cried. Ah, right. Lord Pakenham consented. So... We can establish that the diva was probably not here for the flower, said the Count, and it sounds like offering to sing at the party was just an excuse to come to the island. Then, why was she here? Perhaps she was just accompanying Herr Hunkler, suggested Lady Lamberton. Were they... was she... The Count tried to formulate a question, but his good breeding seemed to prevent him from asking it. Where is Herr Hunkler? he asked in the end, switching topics. He must still be in his room, said Lady Lamberton. Can someone confirm that? Ask a servant to check that he is still there, said the Count. Lady Lamberton summoned the butler who was dispatched to check up on Herr Hunkler. So, if the diva was here, accompanying Herr Hunkler, then why was he here? Was he interested in the flower? The Count posed the question to the room. I'm not sure, began Lady Lamberton. When the diva telephoned me, she asked if Herr Hunkler could come as well. I just assumed that he was her... You know, that they were travelling together. As he is known to most of us here, I didn't consider it an issue. Again, the scraping of chairs and coughs, including my uncle. Plus, Lady Lamberton continued, with several of the members of the society cancelling their trip to the island, I was happy to have them make up the numbers. In what capacity is her uncle known to the guests here? The Count said, picking up on what Lady Lamberton had said. He's an art dealer, from Switzerland, said Lord Lamberton unhelpfully. And presumably some of you have bought paintings from him? The Count pressed on. Non-committal coughs and murmurs. I don't see what Herr Hunkler has to do with this. He was in his room, we presume. Lord Pakenham spoke up. The Count looked at him. We'll see what the butler says once he comes back, he said. My interest in Herr Hunkler was piqued. What were the lords, including my uncle, hiding about him? What type of art was he trading in that made the Lord so clearly uncomfortable to talk about? I was sure the Count had noticed that the Lords had avoided answering his questions about Herr Hunkler, but was too polite to pursue the issue at the moment. Perhaps the art dealer's business had no bearing on this matter. Just then, the butler came back 
and informed Lady Lamberton that Herr Hunkler appeared to be sleeping. Cook had given him a stomach remedy. We will have to wait until tomorrow, then, to ask him if he knows of any motives, said the Count. How am I ever going to tell him that the diva has been murdered? Lady Lamberton said, almost to herself. So what have we established? The Count continued. That we don't have a motive, James said. Quite. And that the opera singer was here, neither for the flower nor to sing, said Flora. Nor to sing well, in any case, she added. What should we do next? asked Lady Lamberton. Establish where everyone was at the time of the murder, I said, and immediately regretted it. I was in the conservatory. My uncle piped up. All eyes in the room turned in his direction, and I could feel heat rising up my cheeks. I didn't dare look up for fear of seeing James's face. I think we've established as much. Flora's clear voice floated out of the silence. Chapter 14 I agree with Lady Carolyn, James said. I think it's a reasonable course of action to establish where everyone was around the time of the murder. I was grateful to James for intervening and gathered the courage to send him a tiny smile. Then... Let's begin with Lady Carolyn's uncle, Lord Tatum, said Flora. He was with the body. Why were you there, Uncle Albert? I asked my uncle gently. I was afraid of what his answer might be, but it had to be asked. I wanted to look around. Scavenger hunts really aren't for me, he said. But weren't you paired up with Signor Mancuso? I said, thinking back to earlier in the evening. Well, yes. Signor Mancuso bristled from behind the Count. I stayed in the house. I do not know what this game is. I only came out when I heard the screaming. He tugged at his collar. I turned to my uncle. Did you see anything or hear anyone while you were in the conservatory? Yes, I heard a crash. I went to check where the noise was and saw the woman, he said. But did you see anyone else? I said. He shook his head. No, I was examining Lord Lamberton's orchids towards the back of the conservatory. Why were you holding the opera singer's necklace then? Flora asked. Were you trying to steal it? Is that why you killed her? What? No, no, I just, I just liked it. I'm interested in jewellery, that's all. My uncle said, flustered. My uncle had never shown an interest in jewellery, but I kept that fact to myself and it didn't occur to you to call for help? James asked, his voice gentle. Why? My uncle looked up at him with clear eyes. She was plainly dead. Nothing I could do about the matter. Shame about the flower, though. A few people murmured in agreement with his last statement. I could well guess who. The more sensible members of the group, however, seemed to be at a loss on how to proceed. James broke the silence. We still need to determine where everyone else was. So far, we've heard that Lord Tatum was in the conservatory and Signor Mancuso was in the house. I was grateful to James that he stated these as facts and did not question the truth of my uncle's statement. I was with Lady Carolyn when we heard the scream, he continued. Mrs. Quinton? James turned to the vicar's wife. You discovered the body? She started, as though surprised by his question. 
Yes, she said. My husband and I made our way to the conservatory after decoding our clue. What was it? The Count asked. I could not understand why that was significant. A basket of canapes behind the fountain. I dropped the basket when I saw the body and screamed. She began sobbing into her husband's sleeve. It's all right, my dear, he said, and patted her hair. No one blames you. It could have happened to anyone under the circumstances. I turned my attention to the vicar. In addition to being better looking than most vicars I had met, he also displayed one other critical difference. He lacked the propensity to moralize. Most vicars, Reverend Mildmaid Chief among them, would have taken the opportunity to harangue us, deriving undue pleasure from enumerating our sins, or, taking a leaf from the hymn book of Reverend Bamford, the parson of our home parish, Reverend Horatio Quintin could have offered us counsel instead, which was probably even worse. But he had done neither of those things. Whatever the vicar's shortcomings, I decided, at least he was not a hypocrite. Which was another important difference between Reverend Quintin and other vicars. Yes, I liked Reverend Quintin. Too bad he was probably a murderer. I hadn't forgotten about his conversation with the diva, you see. But I was also not a fool to bring it up. Always left, the Count said. We were still in the music room, Lord Manterbury said, indicating himself and Lord Pakenham. Lady Lamberton threw them a withering look, as though offended that the lords were not participating in her scavenger hunt. And we were following our clues, she said, pointing to Lord Lamberton. So where does that leave us? said the Count. We all had a partner to vouch for us said the vicar's wife, a bit eager. Well, not the Count and Flora, I thought, but refrained from speaking up. Except you, the vicar's wife turned to Flora. You were on your own. She was looking accusingly at Flora. Her husband pulled her back gently. I was. Flora said defiantly. James disappeared somewhere in the fog. She cast a reproachful look in his direction, and then glanced at me. But that doesn't make me guilty. You and your husband were the first at the scene. After Lord Tartum, of course. You could be covering up for each other. She was glaring at the vicar's wife. Now, now, ladies, no one is accusing anyone said the Count. But someone must be guilty, I thought. The opera singer didn't just stab herself. And what about you, sir? The Count turned to Alistair. I had completely forgotten about Alistair. You were paired with a diva. What happened? How did you get separated? Alistair sat up bolt straight in his seat, well, he said hesitantly, she said she had someone to meet in the conservatory and left me in the fog. He sounded so pathetic. Did you get an impression if she was meeting a man or a woman? James asked. Alistair just shook his head and sank back in his seat and I overheard the opera singer tell someone to meet them in the conservatory. Flora said in her clear voice. She cast a look about the room, as though checking to see if she had shocked anyone with her statement. She drew on her cigarette. Her arms threw her a nervous look. I wondered if anyone else had noticed it. Do you know who she was talking to? The Count asked. No, I only heard the diva tell them to meet her at the conservatory, that they needed to talk. But I didn't hear the other person, 
It could have been a man or a woman. She looked around the room again with a defiant look. That only leaves you, Count. James looked at Count Contarini. I was looking for Lady Carolyn, said the Count. We also got separated in the fog. Then I ran into Miss Flora, after I heard the scream. That's right, said Flora. I ran into Count Contarini while making my way to the conservatory, like everyone else. Several people yawned, as though bored, but it was perhaps tiredness. It's getting late, Lady Lamberton said to the Count and Signor Mancuso. Perhaps we could let our guests go to bed? Um, yes, I see, the Count said, hesitating. I'm not sure what the procedure is in cases like these. Perhaps we could try reaching the police station again. We all sat around quietly, waiting for Lady Lamberton to return from the telephone. Lady Lamberton shook her head as she came back in. Still no connection. Mamma mia! Signor Mancuso threw his hands in the air in exasperation. Count Contarini approached Signor Mancuso, and they had a conversation in rapid Italian. All I gathered from their conversation was Signor Mancuso saying, See, si, a lot. Signor Mancuso and I have discussed the matter, and I feel it is best if we all go to bed, said the Count finally. But what if the killer tries to escape? asked Flora. A crossing will not be possible tonight, I can assure you. Lady Lamberton, perhaps if you would be so kind as to prepare rooms for me and Signor Mancuso? And Lord Lamberton, if you and the servants could take some precaution and secure the boats so that no one can leave the island? I don't feel safe sleeping on this island with a killer at liberty, said the vicar's wife and threw a contemptuous look in the direction of Uncle Albert. The lady doth protest too much, methinks. Was the vicar the killer after all? Was his wife covering up for him? Was she giving him a false alibi? Now, my dear, let's be charitable, the vicar said. I ignored the vicar's wife and took my uncle by the elbow and prepared to leave. Just a moment, signora. Signor Mancuso barred my way as I proceeded towards the door. Your uncle is still our first suspect. I sighed, exasperated. Had he found this moment, so late in the night, to regain his voice of authority? And what do you propose to do? I asked, with unrestrained vexation. Keep him awake all night? He's nearly eight... I mean, nearly seventy. It's not like he could escape during the night. He has no reason to run. He is innocent. I wanted to add, I hope, but kept that to myself. Signor Mancuso, the Count intervened. Lady Carolyn is right. I can guarantee... Like one gentleman to another, that Lord Tatum will not go anywhere during the night. He would be a fool in this weather anyway. And if he does leave, you can arrest me in his place. I gave the Count a dazzling smile. What a chivalrous thing to do. Even though I did not like fast boats, I was willing to alter my position on the matter. On account of the Count. Chapter 15 As we climbed the marble staircase to our rooms, however, I began to wonder why the Count was so quick to insist that my uncle was innocent, and why had he gone so far as to offer himself in my uncle's place. Was the Count hiding something? Did the Count know who the actual killer was? Was Count Contarini the killer? 
and was he planning to escape during the night? After all, among all of us, he was the only one with his own boat. Well, him and Lord Lamberton, but surely his lordship was above suspicion. By his own admission, the Count knew the lake quite well. He might even be able to navigate it in the fog. Plus, we only had his word that the lake was not crossable tonight. I wondered if the Count would still be here in the morning. I walked my uncle to his room. Wilford, it transpired, was well aware of the adventures that had befallen us this evening, as was all the staff, he assured me. As I bade my uncle good night and made for the door, a thought occurred to me. Uncle, why were you touching that woman's jewel? What I wanted to say was, you're not such a fool as to touch a dead body, so what were you playing at? But I didn't. My uncle shook his head like a stubborn child. I noticed he cast a glance in Wilford's direction. I raised an eyebrow at Wilford, and he understood. He suddenly remembered that he needed to go down to the kitchens for my uncle's nightly warm milk, or something of the sort, and promptly left the room. Uncle, I pressed, if we are to clear your name, you have to be honest with me. Oh, young Carol, he said, and dropped onto the sofa as though tired of life. I know you are such a clever girl, but I think I'm in a bit of a pickle. He averted his eyes, and in the process, discovered that the sofa was upholstered in lively brocade, and began picking with his fingernail at the embroidered head of a golden bird. Oh, no. Was my uncle about to confess to murdering the opera singer? I sat down as well. I knew Diva Grigorescu years ago. She was beautiful, a gorgeous diva. I was so smitten with her. The words just poured out of my uncle. Lord Mantlebury was in love with a diva from Paris. Lord Abington professed himself in love with a diva from London. And I found myself in love with Diva Grigorescu. I wondered where this story was going. Wild thoughts crossed my mind. Had he been lovers with Diva Grigorescu? Was there a secret child? Was it one of the young people in the house? Alistair, Flora, the vicar, his wife? Had my uncle been the other person in the corridor last night? Had he overheard the vicar and the diva talking? It was a done thing at the time, you see. What was? I realized I had not been listening to my uncle's story. The jewels. What jewels? The one around her neck. I met him with a blank stare. Young Carol, pay attention, he said. I realized that this was probably the first time I had seen my uncle so lucid. The shock of the murder must have given him a stimulating jolt. This is important, he continued. I was saying, young men in love with prima donnas or actresses would toss jewels at them on stage. What? Just like that? I said, astonished. I wasn't certain what I found more surprising, that they tossed jewels at them, or that they did so without placing the jewel in its proper case first. No, no, the gift was usually hidden inside a bouquet. So you gave her jewels? I asked, although I suspected the answer. I did. Well, just the one. But it was superb. I thought of the sapphire around the diva's neck at dinner, and then I saw in my mind's eye my uncle handling the pendant in the conservatory. Were you trying to get it back this evening? I said, ready to be scandalized. No. He shook his head decisively. And something about the sad look in his eyes made me believe him. I just wanted to see it. It had been such a long time. I had almost forgotten about it. 
He sat silent for a moment. I got a scolding from my father over that one. He finally said, and chuckled, I tossed quite a few of the family jewels at various prima donnas and actresses in my day, <laughs> but that sapphire was the one that got me in trouble. Ah, but what are jewels when you are in love? For a while, he sat with a hazy look in his eyes, as though reliving those sweet moments. I didn't interrupt him. He finally stared. She was like the queen of the night, he said. Epiphelum oxypetalum, to give the flower its proper name. How so? I asked, not seeing the connection. Opera singers, in her day, burst on the scene, young and ravishing, with beautiful voices. They would sing for a few years until their voice was decimated. They had no voice coaches in those days, you see. Like the flower in the greenhouse, blooms for one night and wilts by the morning. Their fame was brief. Suddenly, his outburst on the dock the previous day made sense. He hadn't forgotten something on the train, as I had supposed. You recognized her at the dock, didn't you? I said. You were trying to avoid her. I did, he answered. I don't know why I hid the fact. It was foolish of me. He began picking at a brocade flower on the sofa arm. Does anyone else know about your connection with the diva? I asked, but quickly recalled that some of the other members of the society had also been in love with divas. Blast it! It was generally known, yes. Do you think the other lords will keep your secret? I interrupted him. This was crucial. I didn't think my uncle was guilty of murder, but there was no reason to give the two Italians and the police, who must eventually come, more cause to suspect my uncle. I wondered whether loyalty ran deep among the members of the Royal Society. Perhaps their friendships went back to school days. Perhaps they would not reveal each other's secrets. On the one hand, the lords had ostracized my uncle this evening. But on the other, not one of them had divulged the fact that my uncle had known the diva. Oh, I doubt anyone from the Royal Society would tell the Italian chaps. My uncle said with certainty. I hoped he was right. A thought crossed my mind. Is the flower valuable? Was the diva perhaps trying to steal it? I seem to remember hearing that some orchids were quite valuable. Oh, no, it's not valuable. My uncle chuckled. Then why organize an entire party around it? It blooms rarely, and the bloom wilts by morning. But it's easy to grow. The party was Lady Lamberton's idea. She has these artistic leanings. I think she saw the blooming of the plant as an excuse for a party. It gives the party a nice theme, you see. Do you know if the flower has any meaning? I said. I was still searching for a connection with the flower. Was the fact that the diva was killed in the conservatory significant in some way? Well, funny you should ask, my uncle said. While I was stationed in India... I was told that wishes spoken while the flower was in bloom would be fulfilled, or at least the locals believed it to be so. I shook my head in disappointment. That could not be the reason the diva was killed. Would someone go to such lengths simply to prevent the diva from making a wish? That made little sense. The flower appeared not to be connected to the diva's murder after all. My uncle yawned. It was time for all of us to go to bed. Well, I said and got up. Good night, uncle. Good night, young Carol. I was surprised to see that Wilford was back in the room. I had not noticed his return. As he opened the door, my uncle called after me. By the way, how is a golden platypus? It's fine, uncle. I said, 
a bit exasperated. No one was interested in his platypus, except, perhaps, moths. You know, I don't trust that vicar, my uncle said before I could leave. He stopped me in the corridor earlier, you know, to ask if he could help fix it. Said his cousin was a taxidermist. Uncle Albert tapped the side of his nose and said, But I'm no fool. The golden platypus was quite safe where it was, I told him. I shook my head and laughed as I bid him good night. Chapter 16 As I walked back to my room, I spied Lady Lamberton slipping into someone's room. The wedge of light cast from the room onto the corridor's floor grew narrower as she closed the door. But a golden sliver remained. She had failed to close the door properly behind her. Intrigued, I followed on tiptoes and listened at the door. I normally would not engage in such behavior, but tonight was not a normal night. What were you doing? Letting on that you had overheard the opera singer in the garden? Lady Lamberton whispered. Why? Do you think I shouldn't have? I heard Flora reply, faintly. Oh, Flora, you are so young, my dear. There is a killer in the house. You should not give them a reason to suspect that you know something. Flora was silent for a moment. You are right. I had not thought of that. But I don't really know anything. All I'm saying, my dear, is that you have to be more careful. I'd rather not jeopardize our plan. Not now, when we are so close. I understand, Flora answered. Good night, dear aunt. Good night, Flora. I slipped into the shadows before Lady Lamberton left Flora's room. By the time I got to my room, I was restless. I knew I should be getting ready for bed, but my mind was racing. I wondered whether anyone would be able to sleep tonight. We all knew there was a killer among us on the island. I locked the door. My uncle's mention of the vicar in his interest in the platypus reminded me that I still had not told anyone about overhearing his conversation with the diva. The diva had threatened him. He had something that she wanted. Was that enough of a motive to kill her? I could have said something to the Count and Signor Mancuso about the vicar, but they were not the police. Did they have the authority to arrest him? How would they keep the vicar locked up until the police came? What if the vicar discovered I was the one who provided evidence against him and came after me? No, I was much safer keeping the information about the vicar and the diva to myself. For now. And come to think of it, I didn't trust Count Contarini. Why was the Count really here? Why had he crossed the lake on such a night to be at the party? As flattered as I was by his story that he had come to meet me, I suspected he had a different reason. But what was it? And what about the Italian official, Signor Mancuso? Why had Lady Lamberton invited him? It was plain to see that he was not an agreeable addition to her party. Thinking of Lady Lamberton, I wondered what she was up to with Flora. Had Lady Lamberton killed the diva? Had the diva discovered Lady Lamberton's plan? What was that plan? My thoughts jumped to the telephone. How easy it would be for Lady Lamberton to fake that the telephone line was down. But to what purpose? To keep the police off the island until she had completed her plan with Flora? Was the murder then just an unwelcome complication to their plan? Or part of their plan? I needed to learn more about Lady Lamberton's and Flora's scheme. And I needed to learn more about the vicar and whether he could have killed the opera singer. What I really needed was to talk to someone I trusted. There was Uncle Albert. I trusted him implicitly, 
but he wasn't the most astute conversationalist. And he had the regrettable tendency to let information slip out at the most inopportune moment. No, my uncle was an honest man, but hardly reliable. His valet, Wilford, was a good egg, a solid chap, as good as they came. But he was usually affixed to my uncle's elbow. It would be tricky to consult with him without letting my uncle in on what I knew. As I paced my room, I concluded that there was only one other person I trusted in this villa. Unfortunately, that was James. I had vowed to ignore him. But needs must, and I had no one else to turn to. The snag was, I did not know how to go about speaking to James in private. I could not go to his room. It was not the done thing. And I could not talk to him with everyone else around. Plus, as it had become evident, it was rather easy to be overheard in this villa. I had to find another way to talk to him. Trouble was, I didn't know what that way was. Chapter 17 I slipped out of my room with only a half-formed plan. Getting ready for bed, I had noticed two things. That the fog had lifted, and that once again, unexplained lights were scurrying through the gardens. And this time... I was determined to find out their meaning. I was not fooled into thinking that these were fairy lights. From the comfort of the window in my room, I had discerned two light beams, and their movement through the dark gardens was all too consistent with the rhythm of a human's gait. With a fresh murder in the house, and my uncle as good as accused of it, I planned to follow the lights and see where they led. There were way too many mysterious things happening on the island. I wanted to unmask at least one of them. I suspected the vicar was one half of the torch-carrying party. From the direction in which the lights were moving, I conjectured that he was headed towards the grottoes. With the diva dead, however, I wondered who the other half might be. In addition to the ability of passing soundlessly through corridors of houses, and over traitorous squeaking floorboards, another special skill Frau Baumgartenhoff had imparted to the students of a finishing school was the mastery of moving through the darkness of the night undetected. Scarred as she was by her unhappy marriage, Frau Baumgartenhoff considered a medley of espionage skills, coupled with the ability to move about undetected, essential for girls on the cusp of matrimonial unions. While well, I did not entirely agree with Frau Baumgartenhoff's recipe for a healthy marriage, I could see the benefit of having these skills at one's disposal. Thus, I now stood in the Italian garden, dressed completely in black. I wore black knitted jersey trousers, invented quite recently by a French sports clothing company, and divinely comfortable, and a black turtleneck. I had taken special care to cover my hair with a black knitted cap. I was well aware that if my fair hair was exposed to any stray light, even that of the moon, it would shine brightly in the night, revealing my location needlessly. But the most crucial component of my cat burglar inspired ensemble had to be my shoes. Frau Baumgartnerhoff had managed to track down the store that in 1916 had made a special pair of boxing shoes for the heavyweight boxing champion Jack Dempsey. As a rule, she now ordered a pair of black boxing boots for each of her girls. These custom boots were lightweight, flexible, and had a rubber sole, and they were the main reason I could now slip through the night like a shadow. I moved noiselessly in the direction of the grottoes, and it was not long before I caught up with the two dark shapes moving towards them. As the figures paused at the entrance of the grottoes and set their torches down, thus illuminating the mouth of the cave, I could see their faces clearly. What I saw shocked me. One of the party was Lady Lamberton. Upon reflection... 
I conceded it was to be expected. But the other was not the vicar, as I had supposed. Standing next to her ladyship, right as rain, was Herr Hunkler. I felt almost like I was seeing a ghost. He was supposed to be ill in bed. Questions swirled uncontrollably in my mind. Had Herr Hunkler faked his illness? Had he been out and about during the scavenger hunt? Had he killed the diva? Was Lady Lamberton in on the plot? What was the meaning of all this? I took a deep breath and tried to consider everything calmly. Perhaps Lady Lamberton really did feign the disconnected telephone. She and Herr Hunkler were clearly involved in some secret plant. But what? And how did Flora fit in? Hadn't Lady Lamberton warned her not to expose herself to undue risk because they were so close to accomplishing their plan? But what was that plan? Had the diva been murdered because she had found out about it? Was Lady Lamberton the killer? Oh, but then her warning to Flora made little sense. If Lady Lamberton was the murderer, why would she warn Flora to be careful? Oh, had she been bluffing? I glided closer to the grottos, keeping to the shadows. While my cat burglar costume was flawless, I knew the skin of my face was exposed, so I took special care to keep my face shaded. I felt I was not alone in the garden even before I heard the footsteps. Someone was moving through the bushes on my right. Were they also following Lady Lamberton and Herr Hunkler? Had they seen me? I strained to see who it was, but it was difficult in the near total darkness. Then, a beam of light escaped from the grottos and illuminated the undergrowth near me. Though the flash lasted only a moment, I saw a reflection of a head full of lustrous golden curls. It was the vicar! How clever of him to wear his priest's garb! He had taken care to remove his dog collar. Perhaps he had done such reconnaissance work before. But he had forgotten about his hair. Amateur. I let the vicar advance ahead of me, making certain that he would not notice me. Then I moved into position. This way, I had a clear view not only of the vicar in front of me, but also the entrance of the grottos. Lady Lamberton was pointing to some crates, perhaps warning Herr Hunkler about their contents. But it was what she showed him next that caught my attention. I spied the metal helmet first, and then what looked like armor to cover the body. If I was not mistaken, it was a knight's suit of armor. Herr Hunkler seemed duly impressed and appeared to nod. The pair moved deeper into the cave. As the vicar ahead of me adjusted his position, I used the opportunity to move to the side, planning to advance forward somewhat in order to get a clearer view of what was happening in the grottos. Unexpectedly, and before I could react or let out a scream, an arm grabbed me around the midriff, pinning down my arms in the process, and a hand clamped around my mouth. The aggressor pulled me sharply back, as though to prevent me from kicking at the bushes in front of me and attracting the vicar's attention. My mind whirled. The grip was powerful, and it was impossible for me to extricate myself from it. My assailant pulled me further back, flat against his body, restricting my movement further. We were now in the deep shadow of an ancient tree, but there was no undergrowth for me to kick at to help me make a commotion. How astute! I wondered vaguely if I could bite the hand on my mouth, but the hand was clasped tightly. His hand, for I had no doubt my attacker was a man, was restricting my ability to breathe. I was sure I would pass out soon. Perhaps that was what he wanted. His breath brushed across cheek as he spoke, barely above a whisper. Shh, Carolyn, it's me. It was James. 
Chapter 18 Hundreds of new questions rushed into my mind. What was James doing here? Why was he attacking me? He was supposed to be a good guy. Knowing now that it was him, I started squirming with even more zeal. Why was he keeping me restrained? Caroline, please. He spoke again, pleading. Calm down. I promise to release you if you promise to keep absolutely quiet. Nod if you understand and agree. I thought about it for a few moments. I made up my mind to do as he wanted, but would resort to screaming if I felt in danger at any moment. There were at least three other people in the vicinity that would come to my aid. And at the rate this night was going, there might be a few more lurking in the garden. I nodded. James loosened his grip and used his hands to spin me to face him. We stared at each other. If I didn't know better, I would think that he had also attended Frau Baumgartnerhoff's finishing school. So perfect was his black outfit. But I'd figured out in Nice that in addition to being Lord Pakenham's personal secretary, he was also employed by Lloyd's. It appeared that James helped the insurance chaps in London investigate claim cases occasionally. I wondered for a moment if he was here on their behalf. In the next moment, my treacherous brain, however, pushed that idea away and shouted that I had just been pressed tightly against James's body. But before I could explore that particular thought further, he said, There is a killer about, Carolyn. What are you doing wandering the gardens? It took my brain a moment to assimilate his question. I could ask you the same thing, I whispered back in the end. His quick glance in the direction of the grottoes gave me the answer I needed. So he had followed the lights as well. But why? Suddenly, I remembered that I'd been looking for a way to speak to him in private. This impromptu rendezvous presented the perfect opportunity. I leaned in close to his face and whispered in his ear. I need to talk to you, but not here, somewhere where we will not be overheard. He did not reply, but grabbed my hand and led the way, from shadow to shadow, towards the lake. He stopped in the shadow of a willow tree, its branches kissing the surface of the lake. If we were not sneaking about on a trail of a killer, I would have found it all very romantic. Although the fog had lifted, a strong wind had now replaced it and churned the water of the lake. Waves crashed against the shore. It was the ideal place for a clandestine meeting. There was little possibility for us to be overheard. The sound of the breaking waves would drown out our words. Curiosity was getting the better of me, and I so desperately wanted to ask him what he was doing in the garden. Had he been following me? Or the vicar? Or Lady Lamberton and her companion? But I resisted the urge. I think something strange is taking place on the island, I said. James raised his eyebrows. Yes, there has been a murder. I shook my head. Not just that. And I told him what I had overheard the previous night, the conversation between the vicar and the diva. It sounded as though he owed her money or something else of value. He clearly said that the thing he needed to give her was here, in the villa, or on the island. And she was threatening him. She told him he won't get away from her this time. James was silent. I think he's the killer, I said. It's possible. Was all James said? He fell silent again, as though thinking. He has a better motive than my uncle, I said, and it's the only motive I know of. Although, upon reflection, I had to admit that the behavior of Lady Lamberton and Herr Hunkler was also very suspicious. But Herr Hunkler was the diva's companion. He could not have killed her. Or he could have. But why wait until they got to the island? 
I was about to tell James about overhearing Lady Lamberton's warning to her niece when he spoke. Listen, Carolyn, without the police around to investigate, the island is a dangerous place. There is a killer about. Stop snooping around. You should not be out alone. His words were like a fist punch to my stomach. They had been so unexpected they left me gasping for air. I could feel tears welling up in my eyes. Every time I felt James and I were making a connection, he found a way to unsettle me. I swallowed back my tears and steadied my voice. Then what are you doing out and about? I asked, definitely. I saw you sneak out and was worried about you. I eyed his get-up. He did not dress all in black just to follow me out, and was about to call his bluff when I decided to change tactics. I had never told James that I knew he was employed by Lloyd's on the side. It was time to press him about it. Why are you here, James? I said. You asked to talk to me, he said calmly, but a note of confusion colored his voice. I was sorry that I could not see his face clearly. I don't mean that, I said, mirroring his composure. Why are you here, at the villa? I made my voice sound mysterious, goading him to tell me the truth. I wanted him to tell me he was here to investigate some international fraud scheme, and that he had already solved the case. Because Lord Pakenham is here, and I'm his secretary. He didn't rise to the bait. Is that the only reason? I pressed. What do you mean? He turned sharply to look at me. It's not because there's something strange happening on the island, is it? What are you trying to get at, Carolyn? You mean the murder? I sighed, exasperated. It was clear that he wasn't going to confide in me. Evidently, he did not consider me a close enough friend. I had been ready to tell him all I had heard, and all I had conjectured about the murder, but he insisted on acting obtuse and cryptic. Fine, I decided. I would do the same. I would not apprise him of my theories about suspects and motives. With this firm resolve in place, I turned on the spot and walked in the direction of the villa. I was mindful, though, to keep to the shadows. There was still a killer about. Chapter 19 I went down to breakfast the next morning in low spirits. Although it had been past two o'clock in the morning when I got back to my room the previous night, I had been determined to spend some time going over all that I had learned over the past two days. I was sure the truth about the diva's murder was hidden in there somewhere but I had fallen asleep before I could order the facts in my head, and now I felt restless. There were too many people acting suspiciously, but they could not all be murderers. I looked around the breakfast table. My uncle had elected to breakfast in his room. A wise choice, I decided, since he did not seem to have any friends among the guests any longer. I cast a reproachful look toward Lord Mantlebury and Lord Pakenham. I cast reproachful looks in the direction of their secretaries, Alistair and James, though Alistair's only offence was that he was dull. Lord Lamberton was also already at breakfast. The butler, Jenkins, informed us that Lady Lamberton was taking breakfast in her room. I was surprised to see that Herr Hunkler was at breakfast, I examined his face for any sign of how he had taken the news of the diva's death, because I had no doubt that he already knew about it. I was sure Lady Lamberton had told him about the murder the previous night. In the clear light of day, I wondered how he could have found the strength to go with Lady Lamberton to the grottoes. Unless he was the killer, and felt no remorse about it.
I hope you are feeling better this morning, Lord Mantlebury said, addressing Herr Hunkler. Several people cast sharp looks in the Lord's direction, and he must have realized his blunder, because he followed that by clearing his throat, adding, Yes, quite, and returning to his eggs. Lord Mantlebury's question must have upset the Swiss chap, however, because the next moment he was up abruptly, sporting a similar shade of green to the previous night at dinner. Perhaps the food doesn't agree with him after all, I thought. Herr Hunkler pushed past some latecomers. At least no one had escaped during the night, I was happy to see, as the rest of the guests entered the breakfast room. Is he very upset about the diva? asked the Count as he took his place at the table. Yes, undoubtedly, said Lord Pakenham. I didn't catch what he said on the way out, said Lord Mantlebury. Something about wanting to go to talk to Lady Lamberton, said Lord Pakenham. A plate crashed to the floor. Oh, darling, the vicar's wife exclaimed. Do be careful. Allow me, the butler said, leaping to it. Damn, Flora said under her breath, staring down. Apparently, some of the vicar's eggs had landed on her exquisite cross-strap pumps. Buongiorno, said Signor Mancuso, a little out of breath. I'm glad you are all here. I'm just back from the ice house to check on the diva's body and found that her necklace is gone. Exclamations issued forth from around the room. What? Broken plates and soiled shoes were forgotten. I say, Lord Mantlebury exclaimed, that was a rather expensive-looking what-not, he concluded, pointing to his collar, words failing him. Yes, it was certainly a valuable necklace, added James. Who could have done such a thing? said the vicar's wife. Rather macabre, don't you think? added Flora. I looked at the vicar, wondering if the necklace had been what he had argued about with the diva. Had he stolen it off the diva's corpse? I shuddered. Then my thoughts turned to my uncle. He would be devastated when he learned the necklace had gone missing. I glanced at the lords at the other end of the table. I could not discern any signs of recollection. Perhaps they had not recognized the necklace as having belonged to Uncle Albert after all. Damn funny business, said Lord Lamberton. Always things disappearing. Well, we'll have to investigate, said Count Contarini and rose from his seat. What about the police? asked Flora. Are we still not able to place a call through to them? No, signora, said Signor Mancuso. I already checked the telephone in the library. What about the lake? she said, turning to the Count. Can't a boat get to the shore? The Count walked up to the window overlooking the lake. I would advise against it. The water is still quite choppy. Plus, James spoke up. Who will be sent to fetch help? We are all suspects. No one can leave the island. We all need to remain here until the police are able to come. My chauffeur can go, said Lord Lamberton. He is the chap that drove you on the boat here the other day. I will check later with him if he wants to make the crossing. That would be madness, the Count objected. Greater boats have sunk in this lake. Even if he can make it across, he will have trouble docking the boat. Don't tell me you want to destroy such an expensive boat. The Count said to Lord Lamberton, or have you finally seen reason and are ready to dispose of your American boat and exchange it for an Italian one? He smiled at Lord Lamberton. Discussion of crossing the lake was dropped, and we remained prisoners of the island. 
Count Contarini and Signor Mancuso, by virtue of being Italian and connected through their positions with the state, once again appointed themselves to lead the investigation. After breakfast, I went up to my room to freshen up. Count Contarini and Signor Mancuso, accompanied by the Lamberton's butler, began making rounds of the guest rooms, looking for the necklace. We trickled into the drawing room, and in the end we had all gathered, the Lambertons and their niece, who had changed her egg-soiled shoes, the lords of the Royal Society and their secretaries, and the vicar and his wife. The only persons missing were my uncle, who refused to leave his room, Herr Hunkler, who was once again ill in his room, and the two Italian men conducting the search. Time stretched. I absent-mindedly leafed through a book and checked the carriage clock on the mantelpiece from time to time. Soon it would be time for the lunch gong. I vaguely wondered if the Italian chaps would be able to find the necklace. I glanced at the vicar and his wife. His demeanour had not changed since yesterday. He was still quiet and reserved. I wondered if he was the killer and now the thief. His wife stifled a yawn. My gaze travelled to Lady Lamberton. What had she been doing at the grottoes during the night? What was hidden there? And why had she shown it to Herr Hunkler? I sat up. Of course! Herr Hunkler was an art dealer. There had been a Leonardo da Vinci painting on the island, lost long ago. Had the Lambertons located the lost da Vinci? I looked around the room wildly. Was that the answer? That was the answer, surely. Otherwise, why all the secrecy? Why all the sneaking around during the night? The more I thought about it, the more convinced I became that they had discovered the Salvatore Mundi. But who could I tell? I glanced at James. I would need to find a way to talk to him in private again. Despite being insufferable, he was the only person in the house I could confide in, the only person I trusted implicitly. Several people had noticed my agitation and glanced in my direction. I wondered if anyone could hear my heart pounding in my chest. Lady Lamberton stared at me most curiously. I needed to stop drawing attention to myself. I took a deep breath. But while I was willing myself to regain composure, I cast furtive glances around the room. One of these people was a killer, and I had figured out their motive. All I had to do now was to ascertain who it was. The drawing room door opened abruptly. I jumped, startled. I had been so lost in my thoughts. Count Contarini walked in. I watched him stride in my direction. His walk was a bit stilted. He squared his shoulders. He stopped by my chaise. I glanced at the door. Signor Mancuso was standing just inside it, as though guarding it. I rose out of my seat even before the Count had spoken. I could feel that something had happened to Uncle Albert. Poor fool. What had he done now? Had he gone and gotten himself murdered? I hurried toward the door. Count Contarini appeared by my side. Lady Caroline, he said gently, it's your uncle. We'd like you to come with us. Somewhere in the void behind me, I heard my name spoken. It could have been James, but at this moment, nothing but my uncle mattered. Chapter 20 This way, Lady Caroline, the Count said anxiously. How unbecoming nervousness was on him. I scowled at him. I did not need to be shown the way to my uncle's room. I hastened and overtook him. Behind me, I could hear the twitchy footsteps of the other Italian chap. 
I willed myself not to think about what I would find in my uncle's room, and I dared not ask. At the door, I paused, took a deep breath, and pushed on the handle. There, sitting on the brocade sofa, much like he had been the previous night, sat my uncle. He was picking nervously at an embroidered fruit on the upholstery. Confused feelings welled up in me. I had expected my uncle to be dead, or at least seriously ill. As the happiness that he was neither subsided, it gave way to anger. I turned sharply to the two men behind me. What is the meaning of this? What were these Italians doing, frightening me like this? Carolyn, my uncle said, drawing my attention back to him. Pleading rippled across his hazy eyes. I can explain. If there was any sort of explanation about this, I was not sure I wanted to hear it. I looked from Uncle Albert back to the Italians, and then to Wilford. Was this some ruse to catch the killer? I don't know how it got here, my uncle said. What are you talking about? What got here? I asked, trying to keep the annoyance I felt out of my voice. I'm sorry to have to inform you, said the Count, stepping forward. But we found the diva's necklace among your uncle's things. I could see that having to deliver this news made him uncomfortable. Signor Mancusa was much less subtle in his manner. He stared accusingly at my uncle. I had to sit down. This was not what I had expected to hear. Is that true? I turned to Wilford. It would appear so, milady, the old valet said, but did not elaborate. But this has to be a mistake, I said, looking in turn at each man in the room. Did you take that necklace, uncle? I said, returning my gaze to Uncle Albert. The recollection of our conversation from the previous night came flooding back. What if the old fool had gone to take the necklace back after all? He shook his head. I didn't. Well, there you have it. He didn't, I said, turning to the two Italians. Someone placed it here to incriminate him. I could see the Count faltering. Be that as it may, Lady Caroline, it was discovered in his room. It is very suspicious. He was holding the necklace yesterday, and then the necklace disappeared. And now it is in his room, said Signor Mancuso. But why would he leave it here, even if he stole it? Only a fool would do that, I said. A thought struck me. My uncle was not known for his brightest ideas. What if he really had stashed the stolen necklace here? Suddenly, I felt extremely tired. I leaned back and closed my eyes. And what are you proposing we do? Obviously, I think he's innocent, and you think he's guilty. I opened my eyes again and glared at the Count. It's a matter for the police the Count said. Yes, I understand that. But what do you propose we do until they get here? Men could be so infuriating. Well, perhaps your uncle can remain in his room, the Count said, avoiding my stare. I bit back the retort that my uncle already does that most of the time. It's not like he can run away from the island, I said. In truth, nothing much could be done until the police got here. Whatever these men imagined their powers were, they were not the police. They had no authority to arrest anyone. I smiled at my uncle and patted his hand. 
he smiled back. There was no sense in arguing with the Count. We'll let the police deal with it, I said. I looked at the Count for a moment, observing him impartially. Yesterday, he had been willing to vouch personally for my uncle's innocence. He wasn't so forthcoming today. What had changed overnight? Did he really believe my uncle to be a killer and a thief? Chapter 21 The lunch gong had sounded a while back, but I did not join the others after I left my uncle's room. He had not been able to tell me much beyond the fact that the necklace was discovered in the drawer with his handkerchiefs. By now, the news that my uncle had the necklace had probably spread like wildfire through the house. I could not face the other guests. Instead, I retired to my room. I needed to think things over. I lay on my bed, fatigued. Going to bed late, coupled with waves of emotion I had experienced in the past several minutes, had left me feeling dejected. What did I know with certainty? I knew my uncle was not a killer. I would not put it entirely past him to steal the necklace, but since he said he didn't, I believed him. I wondered whether either Lord Mantlebury or Lord Pakenham would now divulge the necklace's true provenance, thus sealing my uncle's fate even further. What else did I know with certainty? I had overheard the vicar and the diva arguing over something of value. She had threatened the vicar, and now she was dead. Flora had overheard the diva tell someone to meet her at the conservatory. I had overheard Lady Lamberton warning Flora to keep quiet and not to spoil their plans. What were Lady Lamberton's plans? I had seen Lady Lamberton go to the grottoes with Herr Hunkler. What had she shown him? Was it really the lost Leonardo da Vinci painting? He was an art dealer, so that fit. But I had no way of knowing what was hidden in the grottoes unless I found a way to explore them without being observed. What was Herr Hunkler's role in all of this? Had he really been ill at dinner, or was that just a stratagem to provide himself with an alibi, while actually being free to move about and kill the diva? And what about the vicar? What was he looking for on the island? Was it what Lady Lamberton had shown the Swiss art dealer? I was going in circles. Just then, a soft knock at the door drew me out of my thoughts. Enter, I said, and sat up in bed. I hoped it was not another piece of bad news. Wilford entered. I jumped off my bed. What is it, Wilford? Is it Uncle Albert? Pardon the intrusion, milady, he said with deference. I did not want to speak in front of the Italian gentleman, but the necklace that they discovered among your uncle's possessions is a fake. What? The news was quite unexpected. You mean my uncle gave the diva a fake necklace? No, milady. The necklace Lord Tartan presented to the diva Grigorescu all those years ago was the genuine article. What I mean to say is that the necklace retrieved today from your uncle's room was a paste. But how can that be? Do you mean to say that someone stole the real one off the diva and put a fake one among my uncle's things? To what end? To incriminate him? Perhaps, my lady, but I believe that the diva herself had made the paste copy and was wearing it when she was killed. Why? I was getting very confused. As your uncle correctly recounted last night, opera singers and actresses used to receive gifts of jewels from admirers. Perhaps they still do. But in those days, those gifts of jewels were one of the few ways a diva could support herself in her old age. Were they not paid for the singing? 
they were paid, and, in the case of Diva Grigorescu, quite handsomely. But, and forgive me for saying this, but as you are aware, women in a state of marriage have little control over their money, unless stringent clauses are added to the marriage contract prior to the happy union taking place. I nodded. I was well aware of that particular difficulty. It was one of the main reasons I had been avoiding such happy unions. Fortunate as I was to have a large sum settled on my name, I was acutely aware that a husband could do as he pleased with my money. Unless, as Wilford said, a contract was drawn up prior to marriage. Wilford cleared his throat and continued. From what one hears, Diva Grigorescu was unlucky in her selection of a husband, and he spent most of her fortune. She divorced him in time, but all she had left were a few jewels. As your uncle so rightly communicated, the singing days of Divas are short. I believe, and this is simply conjecture on my part, but I believe the Divas sold the jewels to live off the proceeds, once singing engagements became scarcer. I believe, however, that the diva was a proud woman, and perhaps made paste replicas to wear. So that explained the paste necklace. I wonder whether my uncle had noticed. I wondered whether the killer had noticed. But perhaps it did not matter. What mattered to the killer was that he could use the necklace to cast suspicion on my uncle. But despite her failing voice, she was still making regular trips to America, from what I heard, I said, thinking back to what Lord Lamberton had mentioned about the diva's career. Presumably those trips were lucrative enough for her to make the arduous journey. Why would she sell the jewels? I cannot answer that, said the valet. But perhaps, with her voice fading, she was not as well paid as at the height of her career. He had a point. The tastes of the upper class in places like Boston, where my maternal grandparents lived, were quite sophisticated. They would never accept a second-rate performer. I wondered where the diva had performed when she had travelled to America. Perhaps some proletariat dance halls. I shrugged. One more thing, milady. Wilfred interrupted my thoughts. The necklace was not there yesterday evening when I arranged your uncle's handkerchiefs. What are you saying, Wilfred? The necklace must have been placed there during the night. As you know, your uncle takes a sleeping draught. He could not have gone to the ice house during the night to take the necklace. Why did you not speak up earlier? I said, incredulous. This was all we needed to clear my uncle's name. Why was he keeping the information to himself? Forgive me, my lady, he said, but I judged it best not to. I glared at him, waiting for a proper explanation. While he did not falter under my stern gaze, he did elaborate on his act of folly. I was saving the information for the police, my lady he said. I believe that if the killer has placed the necklace in your uncle's room to incriminate him, it is more prudent to let the criminal think that they have succeeded in their little deception. The police would soon set it straight. I did not share Wilfred's confidence in the abilities of the police. My chums and I had outsmarted them in London one too many times while taking part in silly pranks and fun scavenger hunts but I could see the valet's point. My uncle was safe from the killer, while he was the chief suspect. Perhaps we all were. Plus, giving the killer a false sense of superiority might just make them drop their guard and make a mistake. Good plan. Very well, Wilford, I said. Just one more thing. Who would know about my uncle's sleeping draught? Well, my lady, the kitchen staff, for one. 
A scream interrupted Wilford. It had come from the garden. I jumped to the window and saw a maid running through the garden. Even from a distance, I could perceive the horror inscribed on her face. A chill ran through me. I wondered what she had discovered. Chapter 22 We gathered once again in the drawing room. Even Uncle Albert had joined us under my urging. I sat with my uncle at one end of the room, towards the back, not only to avoid unwelcome glares from the rest of the guests, but also to observe them. The body of Herr Hunkler had been discovered in the garden, by the maid. The Count, Signor Mancuso and Lord Lamberton, had gone to inspect the body and move it to the ice house. I was certain that my uncle was not a murderer. With the discovery of this second body, I hoped everyone else would see that as well. I glanced around the room at those gathered. One of these people was the true killer. I shuddered. The vicar's countenance, which the previous night was one of worry, had now turned to horror. He cast wild glances at various people in the room, as though expecting to be attacked at any moment. Was he afraid that he would be next? Had he come here of his own volition, or had he been lured here, like the diva and the art dealer, to be slaughtered? Or was the vicar the killer, and now he felt trapped, unable to escape? But if he was the killer, why kill Herr Hunkler now? Why not wait for the weather to improve, then do away with a Swiss chap and leave the island with no hindrance? Why rush when he knew he could not abscond? Had the vicar rushed because he was worried that Herr Hunkler would give him away? I had no answers. I turned to look at Lady Lamberton. Her handsome face was marred by deep emotion. But it was not fear, as on the vicar's face, but worry. I conceded it could not be easy to be the hostess of a party, where every day one guest gets done away with. Was Lady Lamberton the killer? After all, she had invited the guests. She had control over the telephone. She had spoken to Flora about a plan, and she had been with the now-dead Herr Hunkler in the grottoes last night. I looked at her niece, Flora, sitting next to her. She was a little less self-assured than the previous night. Perhaps we all were. Gone was the femme fatale bearing and the cat-like fluid movements. Without her slinky black dress, crimson-painted lips and long cigarette holder, she looked mousy. Could she be involved in all this? She was involved in her aunt's plan. But was she a killer? For what reason? By all accounts, she had spent most of her life in Africa. Surely she would not have had the opportunity to meet the two victims, let alone form a hatred towards them deep enough to lead to murder. But what about her parents? Had they been involved with the diva and the art dealer somehow? My glance slipped to the vicar's wife. Like Flora, her demeanor had become more subdued. She rarely smiled any more, and her curls were decidedly limp and lifeless. Like Flora again, she had spent her life in Africa. I could not see any reason for her to be the murderer except if she was trying to protect her husband for some reason. A thought struck me. So many of the guests here had come from Africa. Were these murders connected somehow to Africa? Had either the diva or Herr Hunkler been to that continent? I would try to find out. My glance next fell on Alistair. What about Alistair? Could he be a killer? I thought back to the night of the diva's murder. 
Alistair had been her scavenger hunt partner. We only had his word that the diva had left him to meet someone. What if he had gone with her to the conservatory and killed her? No. I shook my head. He's so quiet and timid and boring. And his story was corroborated by Flora. She overheard the diva talking to someone. But had she really overheard the diva? What if what she had heard was the killer imitating the diva's voice? After all, it wasn't difficult to do. The diva had a very strong accent, which made it simple to imitate her. My mind was now chugging along happily. What if Alistair had already killed the diva, and then, noticing Flora wandering around, had imitated the diva's voice to give himself an alibi? That way, everyone would think that the diva had abandoned him and had gone to meet her killer in the conservatory. I liked this theory. But what was Alistair's motive for this duplicity? Just as I remembered that Alistair had been a guest on the island before, the door opened and Lord Lamberton walked in, followed by the two Italians. I say, spoke up Lord Mantlebury, what did you find out? Was he poisoned? Of course he wasn't poisoned, retorted Lady Lamberton angrily. Then, catching herself, added, At least it couldn't be from our food. No, old chap, Lord Lamberton said, glancing at Lord Mantlebury. His face was worn. He looked as though he had aged in the last two days. Perhaps we all did. He was stabbed, Lord Lamberton said, much in the same manner as the diva Grigorescu. Look here, Harold, old boy, said Lord Pakenham. Where are all these knives coming from? The diva was stabbed with a letter knife, said the Count. Lord Lamberton informs me it was taken from the library. Anyone could have taken it. Her uncle appears to have been stabbed with his own knife. Lord Lamberton also informs me that he had seen Herr Hunkler with that knife. It's a lock blade knife, usually given to Swiss officers. What? Those small foldable things that open rations cans? exclaimed Lord Pakenham. One could not have a fly with those. The Count shook his head. No, this one is like a hunting knife. With a strong blade, the knife was well suited for its job. He trailed off. Could it have been an accident? Lady Lamberton asked. I mean, could he have tripped and fallen on his knife or something? No, my dear, said her husband. He was stabbed in the back, quite expertly. The killer knew what they were doing. Knew where to stab, I mean. For a moment, I considered Lord Lamberton as a suspect. Like his wife, he would have had a say in who to invite to the island. And he was quick to supply supernatural explanations for events. Was this just an act? Was he trying to cover something up? And what about the two Italians? Would they have a reason to murder the two victims? But how is it possible that he is dead? said Flora. I saw him at breakfast. Yes, but he left, remember? said Lord Mantlebury. I wanted to add that he hadn't looked well when he left the table. But as I hadn't spoken this whole time, I preferred not to draw attention to myself. I continued to observe. I say, I remember him saying something about going to see you, Lady Lamberton. Lord Pakenham turned to her. Really? He never came to see me, said Lady Lamberton. I saw a few guests scrutinize her for a moment, as though questioning her truthfulness. 
I wonder what made him go out into the garden, said James. Perhaps he was meeting someone there, said Lord Lamberton. The killer, said the vicar's wife, almost in a whisper. Perhaps if we can establish when he was killed, we might get a better idea of who could have killed him, suggested James. A few people shifted nervously in their seats. It was as though most people preferred not to know who the killer was, after all. Perhaps they hoped it was someone from the outside. But that, of course, was impossible. He left breakfast, said Lord Lamberton. Did anyone see him after that? No one had seen him. Can we at least establish what time he was murdered? Can we all account for our time between breakfast and when the body was discovered? Said James. Ah, there. I think I can be of help. Said the Count. I was monitoring the weather this morning to see if it would be possible to cross the lake, and noticed that it drizzled shortly after breakfast. But it stopped raining by the time you were all gathered in this room, when we were searching for the necklace. He threw a furtive glance in my uncle's direction. Yes, so, said Flora. Well, when we saw her uncle's body, his clothes were wet. His body must have been out in the rain. Therefore, he must have been killed some time between breakfast and the time you all gathered in this room. But we were all freshening up in our rooms after breakfast exclaimed Flora. None of us has an alibi. She glanced around the room for corroboration. Well, I know Horatia was with me the whole time, protested the vicar's wife. Silence descended on the room. We were probably each going over the time between breakfast and meeting in this room. Flora was right, I concluded. If all of us were freshening up, None of us had a proper alibi for that time. The killer must have used that to their advantage. And that's why Herr Hunkler had never made it to Lady Lamberton's room. He was never given the chance. So no one saw anyone in the garden at the time? Asked the Count. He was met with silence again. What do we know about Herr Hunkler? Said James at last. I know he was Swiss and an art dealer, but was there something else about him? Something that could have gotten him killed? Something from his past, maybe? I remember someone saying, the Count said, perhaps it was you, Lady Lamberton? The Count glanced in her direction, that most of the people here had purchased art from him. Yes? Lord Lamberton said, sounding a bit reluctant to admit the fact. Some of us did. Well, the Count said, was there something wrong with his art? Did he sell forgeries? My uncle coughed slightly. Well, yes, Lord Lamberton said. I mean, no. Look here. There was nothing wrong with the art he was selling. He wasn't selling forgeries or anything of the kind. It's just that lately he'd been trying to sell us some modern rubbish. Paintings the three-year-old niece of Cook could draw. One simply couldn't tell if one was being swindled any longer. His outburst left him flustered. Oh, Harold, no one wants to hear your opinions about art, interjected Lady Lamberton in vexation. My uncle shifted in discomfort. He seemed to either find the sofa particularly disagreeable, or he was equally unsettled by Lord Lamberton's pronouncements. The Count looked toward where the rest of the members of the Royal Society were seated. Lord Mantlebury, Lord Pakenham, had either of you ever purchased anything from Herr Hunkler? The Lords mumbled non-committally. And you were unhappy with Fair Ungler? 
Had he sold you anything you didn't like? The Count asked. No, of course not. They answered in unison. It wasn't clear which one of the Count's questions they were replying to. But whether the Count meant to press them further on the subject, we didn't get to find out, because at that moment Lady Lamberton exclaimed, Herr Hunkler was a visionary art dealer. His new art was wonderful. He was representing some young artists, so talented. Their art railed at the senseless loss of life with bold colors and strokes. Here she punctuated her words with fists in the air, as though boxing. It's art that conveys a feeling. It's not what the eyes can see, but what the soul can feel. Count Contarini looked away, made uncomfortable by Lady Lamberton's passionate outburst. His deputy, Signor Mancuso, shuffled by his side, equally ill at ease. Yes, well, the Count said. It was clear that the inquiry into the nature of Herr Hunkler's most recent art acquisitions was to be continued at another time. Perhaps now we can have a look at Herr Hunkler's room? Signor Mancuso scurried out behind the Count, followed closely by Lord Lamberton, who was casting nervous glances back at his wife. Chapter 23 The knock at the door was soft and polite, but I jumped out of my chair. I sensed that the knock was a prelude to something sinister. I had been sitting at the pretty desk in my room, by the window, gazing out at the lake, wondering when the weather would allow us to send someone for the police, and trying to organize my thoughts about the murders. Something was very wrong in this villa. Nothing was as it seemed. Enter, I said. It was, once again, Wilford. Pardon the intrusion, milady, he said. The Italian gentlemen have some additional unfortunate news pertaining to the murdered man, and it involves your uncle. I didn't question Wilford, but simply followed him to Uncle Albert's room. To be honest, I'd had an inkling that something was wrong ever since my uncle's twitchy behavior in the drawing room. He was not a fussy man when it came to sofas, so all that shifting around, while the Count had asked questions about Herr Hunkler, had led me to believe that my uncle had not been entirely forthcoming with the truth when it came to the Swiss chap. I did not even endeavor to fathom what my uncle had in store for me now. I preferred to stick to precedent and allow myself to be surprised. Wilford showed me into my uncle's room, and there I found him sitting on the sofa, picking at the tail of an embroidered peacock. He glanced at me, smiled weakly, and returned his attention to the bird. I cast a glance around the room. The Count was standing with his back to the window, his jaw and shoulders squared. Senior Mancuso had attempted a similar stance, hands behind his back but had only managed to push out his paunch. At least he wasn't shuffling nervously any longer. Lord Lamberton was a fresh addition to the delegation this time. He was twisting a gold button on his blazer nervously. Yes? I said, and raised an eyebrow toward the men. The three men who weren't my uncle looked at each other, egging the other to go first, the Count spoke at last. As you know, Lady Caroline, we checked Herr Hunkler's room to see if we could uncover some clues about his murder. He paused and cleared his throat. I wished he'd get to the point. I preferred the truth delivered directly, instead of enduring this drawn-out prelude, and was about to say so when he continued. We found a letter among Herr Hunkler's possessions, and it... Your uncle is clearly the murderer, Signor Mancuso blurted out. 
Apparently, he liked getting straight to the point as well. What? I said. The letter is quite damning, Lady Carolyn. The Count began. I interrupted him. I have been quite patient with your investigation, I said. How dare you accuse the oldest member? My uncle cleared his throat. One of the oldest members of this party, I amended myself. The necklace was clearly planted. I was about to say that it was a paste as well, but a flash of a glance from Wilford stopped me. And now this letter was clearly planted as well. What is this letter? Let me see it. I extended an expectant hand. Count Conferini produced the letter from his pocket and handed it to me. It was in the most extraordinary handwriting. At first, I didn't even recognize it as being written in English. It looked like loops embroidered on paper. But as my eyes adjusted, I began to recognize words. The letter read, Lord Tatum, allow me to take this opportunity to apologize for the misunderstanding that has occurred between us. One should not ignore the hand of fate that has brought us together on this island and has given us the most fortuitous occasion to resolve our differences. I take full responsibility for my actions previously and apologize for going against your wishes and acting without consulting you first. I believe I have wronged you deeply on that account. If you would allow me the opportunity for a private interview, I hope, once I have been able to explain my position, that in due course we can once again renew our working arrangement, to the mutual satisfaction of both, yours, etc., Hans Hunkler. Well, yes, I said, after I'd finished reading. I needed time to think. Apparently, my uncle had a different plan. Oh, Carolyn! He lamented in my direction. My sins have caught up with me. What do you mean? I asked. But having delivered this deadly blow to his case, my uncle would say no more. He just shook his head and kept his eyes glued to the tassels of his slippers. Have you read the letter? I asked him. He nodded. And is it true? Here his head movement was open to interpretation. I switched to examining the Count. Except for Wilford, he seemed the most sane of the bunch. Are you absolutely certain that this was written by Herr Hunkler? I am quite certain. We compared it to other letters he had written. It matches perfectly. What if someone just copied Herr Hunkler's handwriting? I asked, but knew that it was a thin argument. Herr Hunkler's handwriting was quite distinctive. The Count shook his head. I think that would be difficult to do. His handwriting seems to be heavily influenced by the German Corinth Schrift. I've seen a lot of German language correspondence. As you know, the region just north of us was under Austrian control until quite recently. My father had business ties with Austria and Germany. At this, Signor Mancuso bristled and grumbled something under his breath. The Count spared him a brief glance and continued. So, unless someone is a German speaker, used to writing Korinschrift, it would be difficult to imitate Herr Hunkel's handwriting. There are so many peculiar swirls. I had to agree with him, but I could not give up on my uncle just yet. I could see how the necklace could have been planted to incriminate your uncle, Lady Carolyn. The Count continued, but there is no explanation for the letter. It was written by Herr Hunkler. There is no doubt about it. Uncle, I turned to my aged relation. You have to explain what this is all about. There was a note of pleading in my voice, and I didn't like it. But needs must. 
Uncle Albert nodded, but it took him a few moments before he began to speak. The Swiss chap was a scoundrel. He lured me into a scheme. No, oh, he was very good at first, top in the business. He handled the sale of some ghastly low country miniatures left over from my father. Flemish primitives, he called them. Awful things. And purchased some Rococo paintings for me instead. They were wonderful, with pretty shepherdesses and cherubs and fluffy clouds. Such joy to look at. I shuddered at my uncle's artistic tastes, but did not want to interrupt him. But then, he told me he could arrange for the purchase of some art pieces that would be a great investment. Oh, I had been so taken in by his expertise that I did not even question his scheme, but blindly sent him funds for the purchase. My uncle paused to collect himself. He was clearly shaken by what had occurred. What he sent me in return, he said, and looked at me, his eyes full of horror, were a series of paintings by children. He took a deep breath to steady himself. Of course, lawyers were involved, official letters were exchanged, but in the end, the validity of the sale was apparently ironclad. The Swiss are very good at that, you know, and I was stuck with the deplorable things. They hang somewhere in the attic, Wilford tells me. My uncle sighed. I could see that this soliloquy had physically exhausted him, and he leaned back on the sofa. For a moment, I felt defeated. Then a thought occurred to me. I turned to the Count. But how could my uncle have killed Herr Hunkler? My uncle did not even come down to breakfast. He didn't even leave his room this morning. My uncle cleared his throat, and I got a sinking feeling in the pit of my stomach. Actually, Carolyn, he said, his voice feeble, as though he himself realized it was not the most prudent course of action. But, much like tripping at the top of the stairs and falling, once he had started, he found no way of stopping himself. I took a walk after breakfast. I always take a walk after breakfast. I had never heard of said habit. But then again, this was the first time I had seen my uncle's foot gout free. Oh, why could he not be incapacitated by gout? It would have saved us so much trouble. So that was that. The Italian chaps informed me that until the police got here, my uncle would be confined to his room. The evidence against him was too much to ignore. The letter, the necklace, and apparently one of the lords had betrayed my uncle's confidence and divulged my uncle's past relationship with the diva. Judging by the way Lord Lamberton was avoiding my gaze, I could well guess who the traitor was. A footman was positioned outside Uncle Albert's door. Chapter 24 Wilfred entered with a dinner tray. I had refused to join the rest of the party for dinner. After depositing the tray, he hovered in my vicinity nervously. Such conduct was so unlike him. Yes? What is it, Wilfred? I said, pushing the tray away. Food could not assuage my feelings at the moment. I hope you would not be angry with me, milady, but I held back some information about his lordship and his association with Herr Hungler. What? I liked Wilfred, but he had been acting in the most peculiar manner these past few days. Before I go into the particulars, he hedged, I want to make it entirely clear that my actions were guided only by the desire to safeguard your uncle. I only have Lord Tatham's best interest in mind. I believe you do, I said truthfully, but I was curious as to what surprise the old valet was about to spring up on me. Despite what your uncle thinks about it, the art that Herr Hunkler sold him was quite genuine. 
The rift between them was entirely based on a misunderstanding. Lord Tatton believed he was duped by Herr Hunkler. But in fact, Herr Hunkler sold him a collection of promising new artists. Your uncle is now the owner of some of the best examples of surrealism and expressionism in the art world. I believe, and I am supported in this view by the other members of my club in London, that Herr Hunkler assisted your uncle in the purchase of art that will continue to appreciate in value. Hanging in the passageway of the servants' quarters at your uncle's house is not only the blue horses painting by Franz Marc, but also paintings by Max Ernst, Vasily Kandinsky, and Pablo Picasso. I nodded. While I was not an art connoisseur, even I knew that those were desirable artists to have in one's modern art collection. Poor Uncle Albert. How strange the modern world must look to him. Has no one tried to talk some sense into my uncle? To make him see he has not been cheated? A few people tried. His solicitors. Myself. But he refuses to see reason. Wilford shook his head in frustration. As you heard... Your uncle's art tastes run to pretty shepherdesses and fluffy clouds. His tone had softened. He is not interested in the monetary value of art. He wants to own that which makes him happy. Herr Hunkler had failed to take your uncle's tastes into account. Once your uncle received the paintings, and after failing to halt the transaction... He severed communications with the Swiss gentleman. I believe Herr Hunkler realized his mistake and was trying to make amends. Unfortunately, he was not able to deliver his letter to your uncle. I thought back to all the murmuring that had accompanied the discussion of Herr Hunkler's capacity as an art dealer and wondered how many other people in the villa were unhappy, albeit mistakenly with his services. But my mind jumped back to my uncle's predicament. And why did you not decide to share this information with the others? I asked Wilfred pointedly. As I said, my lady, he said without faltering, it was done in Lord Tatum's best interest. How so? Pardon me for saying so, my lady, but I think you would agree that Lord Tatum has a tendency to get himself into trouble. I nodded. So I feel it is in your uncle's best interest that he remains under suspicion and under house arrest. It's the most prudent way to keep him out of harm's way. I nodded. There was a lot of truth in what Wilfred was saying. Plus, Wilfred continued, I believe your uncle quite likes the confinement. It allows him to devote himself to his studies, without having to interrupt his work for social conventions such as changing for dinner. He has also started likening his internment to that of Galileo's own confinement to his home, following his trial by the Roman Catholic Inquisition in 1633. Wilford allowed himself a slight smile. I laughed. That's quite astute of my uncle, equating the Italian chaps with the Roman Catholic Inquisition. I may have assisted in helping your uncle establish that particular connection, Wilfred said demurely. I will come back for the tray, my lady, he said, and started to take his leave. Before you go, Wilfred, I said, I wanted to ask you something else. Yes, my lady. If you don't mind, could you tell me what is being said below stairs about the murders? I would not usually pry into such confidences, but since your employer is at risk of being hanged, I thought you might overlook your customary discretion. I waited with bated breath. Wilfred inclined his head. I'm sorry, my lady, but the servants of this house do not discuss the murders.
I raised an eyebrow in his direction, but did not interrupt him to express my surprise. He continued, The events seem to have greatly unsettled them. They are all deeply religious and superstitious, and talk of the murders is not allowed. I sighed with disappointment. Servants were usually so observant, and I was convinced they were always the first to know when something untoward was happening in a home. But alas, in this case, they would be of no help. They do, however, talk of the grottoes, Wilford continued. I perked up. It seems they have observed strange lights around the grottoes, which they think are fairies. They will go nowhere near the grottoes after dark, so strong is their aversion to the caves. The old valet paused. I could see that he was wrestling with whether to continue. The more sensible servants, he finally said, suggest that Lady Lamberton is using the grottoes for amorous rendezvous with Count Contarini. His boat has been observed on occasion moored near the grottoes. Perhaps he is there to drive away the mischievous fairies, I suggested with a smile. Wilford allowed himself another small smirk. Perhaps, my lady. However, lately, the staff has been even more frightened than ever of approaching the grottoes after dark. Oh? Why is that? They say that a monster has started appearing out of the water at night and using the grottoes as its lair. A monster? I said incredulously. Yes, milady. The kitchen staff is quite convinced of its existence. They have taken the additional precaution of placing a supplementary Madonna statuette near the kitchen door. I see, I said and nodded. So, Herr Hunkler was not the only man Lady Lamberton had taken to the grottoes. What was going on? And what of this newly minted monster? Was it just a way to keep the servants away while Lady Lamberton had moonlit trysts? Or was it something else entirely? Plus, the Count seemed to know more about what was taking place on the island than he was letting on. Wilford had given me a lot to think about. Thank you, Wilford, for everything. My pleasure, my lady, he said. He turned at the door and bowed slightly. As he straightened up, his eyes latched onto something in the distance, and his face grew pale. What is it, Wilford? I said, turning to look in the same direction. He had clearly seen something behind me that had upset him, but I could not see what that was. The golden platypus, milady, he exclaimed. It is gone. Chapter 25 I stood in the shadows cast by the marble statues in the corridor and listened. The villa was asleep. In a distant room, a clock chimed once. It was half past one in the morning. The only other sounds were the groans and creaks as the old palazzo cooled and settled for the night. As I passed doors, I could hear gentle snores. It was a good night for exploration. It seemed like everyone was asleep. I made my way down the stairs to the drawing room and out a window that opened onto the gardens. Trees creaked, and leaves rustled in the strong wind. I hoped the wind would bring about a change in the weather, and the police would finally come to the island to straighten everything out. But for now, I was glad they were not here. I had a theory where the platypus might be, and preferred to go looking for it unobserved. I had opted for not using my torch, and instead moved from shadow to shadow in the garden as the moon sailed in and out from behind clouds. I had implored Wilford not to tell my uncle about the missing platypus, at least not until I could search for it. 
he had agreed that it was the wisest course of action. We explored the possibilities and concluded that the platypus's disappearance was most likely a prank on the part of one of the other members of the society. We both agreed that it was in poor taste, given my uncle's current predicament. Though, I had observed a tendency on the part of the members to take pleasure in others' misery. By the time Wilford departed my room, I had resolved to use all the skills I had learned in Frau Baumgartnerhoff's finishing school to find the platypus. It was the least I could do for my uncle, after everything that had gone wrong for him. What I had not shared with Wilford was a suspicion I had about the platypus. The suspicion had come on so gradually that I could not say when the idea had formed in my mind. I believed that rather than being the victim of a royal society prank, the platypus had gone missing for an entirely more sinister reason. I did not put all the pieces together until the animal was actually taken from my room. But now it all made sense. The vicar jumping in the water after the platypus. The diva threatening the vicar. The chalice going missing from the island two years ago. And the vicar running away to Africa. The chalice must be extremely valuable, I conceded, if two people had already been murdered for it. I had to tread carefully. I slipped through the darkness, stopping every few yards to make certain that I was not followed. The wind in the trees made it difficult to hear any footsteps, but I was confident that tonight I was alone in the garden. I could not even begin to fathom how long the platypus had been missing from my room, but I hoped, for my uncle's sake, that the animal was still in one piece, or at least in a state from which a skillful taxidermist could recover it. The moon emerged from behind a cloud, and its light illuminated the barricades of the grottoes just in front of me. I was here. I took a moment to compose myself. Wild theories of what I would find in the cave swirled in my mind. The lost Leonardo da Vinci? Perhaps. The missing platypus? I hoped so. I wriggled skillfully under a barricade. My plan was to use the moonlight to get as far into the grottoes as I could, and then turn on my torch. I passed crates and boxes, and what I had taken for a suit of armor the other night— but was actually an underwater diving suit. I had failed to see that a hose was connected to the helmet. Walking further into the cave, I switched on my torch. A magical hall carved out of stone greeted me. The theme evident on the outside of the grottoes continued on the inside. It was like entering Poseidon's underwater kingdom. Mermaids swam among stalactites, and fantastical underwater creatures chased each other mischievously. Fish and seashells decorated the vaulted ceiling. The artist had even rendered seaweed billowing in the underwater current out of stone. But apart from the sixteenth-century frivolity, as I swept the gallery with my torch, all I saw were more wooden crates. I tried opening a few and peeking inside them, but they were nailed shut. The markings on the boxes identified them as belonging to the Italian army. There was no indication of a platypus or a chalice, or a painting for that matter. Suddenly, I questioned my decision to come here. What if the Lambertons had been right? What if I was truly surrounded by live ammunition? It was not prudent for me to be here. I retreated quickly to the entrance of the grottoes. I switched off my torch. But it was too late. I knew I had made a mistake the moment I heard a twig snap near the grottoes. Whoever was in the gardens must have seen my light. Fear overtook me. What if the killer had followed me here? With only a moment to think before I was discovered, I made a run for it. I burst out of the entrance at full speed, jumped over the barricade, 
and headed for the house. I used the element of surprise to buy myself time. If I cut across the garden and back to the house before the killer, I could slip into my room before they had caught up with me. My feet were pumping as fast as my heart was beating. I could not stop and check if my pursuer was behind me. But the next moment, I tripped and was on the ground. I tried to get up, but the lace of my boot was caught on a branch that would not let go. I tugged forcefully for what felt like a lifetime, and finally the branch snapped and released my boot. It was only after I started running again that I noticed that the palm of my left hand was stinging. I must have cut it on a rock. I would have a hard time explaining tomorrow how I had hurt myself. If I lived that long. I was finally near the house, but now a new panic overtook me. What if the killer had closed the drawing room window? But as I pushed the window open, and I slipped inside the room and then out into the hallway, a wave of relief spread over my body. I had made it back to the villa safe. I paused to catch my breath in the shadow of a statue. For a moment, I thought I had imagined the whole thing. Perhaps the wind had snapped that twig. Perhaps no one was following me. But the next moment, a dark figure entered silently into the hallway through the front door. They stood in the darkness, as though trying to locate me. Panic gripped me again. My way up the stairs was cut off. Unless my adversary went in a different direction, or down a side corridor, there was no way I could make it back to my room. The figure began moving forward. My brain was screaming at me to move, but my body was paralyzed by indecision. The only way to escape was to slip through the shadows and into the corridor to my left. I had no idea where that corridor led, but at the moment, I had no other choice. I traipsed on silent toes deep into the darkness of the corridor. There were no windows here. Each side was lined with doors. But which one to pick? I heard steps behind me. My pursuer was not trying to hide themselves. I wondered why. For a moment, I thought it was probably James, but I didn't wait to find out. I pushed on a door handle, but the door did not open. Was the door locked? Thoughts flashed through my mind. Did I have time to get to another room? Was there another way to escape? I jostled the door as silently as I could. The door didn't feel locked. It just seemed jammed. I gave it a hard shove, and it finally opened. So much for being stealthy. Chapter 26 I switched on my torch for a moment to get my bearings. I was in the library. I looked towards the windows. Should I run back out into the gardens? Were the gardens a safer place to be than the house? Should I scream and wake up the house? But what if there was a simple explanation? What if I ended up looking like a fool? The library door handle rattled. I switched off my torch. I now realized it had been a bad idea to turn it on at all. The darkness seemed more solid than before. I give a silent thanks to the tricky door, because whoever it was trying to get in was having trouble opening the door as well. As my eyes adjusted to the darkness, I frantically looked around the library for a hiding spot. There wasn't a desk to hide under, only a table, but with no tablecloth over it, it would provide little protection. Bookcases lined the walls. The only place to hide, and it wasn't anything to crow about, was the nook between two bookcases. I sidled into it. With any luck, whoever was following me would not see me in the dark. Tough chance of that happening. 
I took a deep breath and pressed my back against the paneling behind me. And as the door to the library opened, something clicked behind me. I staggered backwards and discovered, to my surprise, that I had opened a hidden door in the paneling. I slipped in and closed the panel swiftly. I prayed that the person pursuing me did not know about this door and had not seen me disappear behind it. I held my breath, pressing my body against the door, and listened. The person entered the room and switched on the light. I could see the sliver of light through the crack of the panel. I heard them moving around the room. They must have walked up to the window and wondered if I had escaped that way, because I heard them open, then close one of the windows. They spent a few more moments in the library, but as they found nothing and no one, they left. I stood in the darkness and strained to hear any other noises in the silence. Satisfied that I was alone, I turned my attention to the recess I found myself in. I could feel the cold, rough stone of the walls beneath my hands. The alcove was narrow, only as wide as my elbows would go. I was tempted to switch on my torch, but decided against it. Perhaps the person who had followed me here had only pretended to leave, and was actually still in the library, waiting to pounce on me after I left my hiding spot. I listened for any movement in the library for what felt like hours, but was probably only a few minutes. Nothing stirred. It was clear to me that whoever had followed me into the library didn't know about this hidden alcove. Deciding that the library was empty, I switched on my torch and was surprised to find that I was not in an alcove, but was actually standing at one end of a narrow stone passageway. I wondered where it led. I swept my torch ahead of me and followed its light. The passage went straight and then turned left. I tried to imagine which way it was heading. Since we were on an island, if it kept going, it would eventually lead me to the lake, I reasoned. It led me to a circular room with rough-hewn stone walls. The tower at the dock! So the tower wasn't simply a folly after all. Its core had been turned into a war room. I swept my torch over the devices in the room. It all looked like army equipment, machines whose function I could not fathom, with a multitude of wires, buttons, and knobs, all painted in a dull green. I moved closer to have a better look, but did not dare touch anything. A thin layer of dust covered every surface. No one had been here in years. The army that had requisitioned the island during the Great War must have left this equipment here, just as they had left the ammunition in the grottoes. Perhaps it was too expensive to haul outdated equipment off the island. I moved further into the room. On a table, hidden behind some large machine, I saw an old radio, what looked like a telegraph, and some old telephones. A telephone! Here was a way to telephone the police! Excited and without thinking, I lifted a receiver. But it was dead. Of course, the army would not use the civilian lines to communicate anyway. As I looked around the room, a thought began to trouble me. Lord and Lady Lamberton must surely know about this room. Why had they not told anyone? Why had they not tried to contact the police through here? I did not have an answer. But at least I was now sure that it had not been one of the Lambertons that had followed me tonight. They would have followed me into this passageway. Or could it be that they did not know about this secret passage? My torchlight fell on a heavy metal door. I tried to open it but it was locked. I listened at the crack. I could hear the waves splashing. I sat down in a chair while I considered what to do next. 
I needed to give whoever had followed me a good while to search for me and go back to their room. Tonight had been a failure. Not only had I not been able to find the platypus, I had exposed myself to the killer. I turned off my light to wait in here until I judged the coast to be clear. I woke up with a start. It took me a moment to get my bearings. I had no idea how long I had slept. What if everyone was already up? How would I get back to my room? I shone the torch at my watch. Four o'clock in the morning. Good. I had time to creep back to my room. Surely by now the killer would have given up. Will the servants be up yet? I sneaked out of the concealed door in the panelling, and I stood frozen for a few moments. Was anyone lying in wait for me? I made my way back to my room in stages, first to the library door, then down the corridor, up the stairs, down the corridor to my room, stopping every so often to check that no one was following me. I slipped inside my room and locked the door with a satisfying click. Chapter 27 After getting back to my room a few hours ago, I had managed to sneak in a few more hours of sleep. As I lay awake in bed now, thinking, I realized that the previous night's activities had left me exhausted. I felt exactly the way I had following the infamous party at Millicent Gilstrap's house in Mayfair, where, in the small hours of the morning, seven Gilstrap debutante cousins, who were due to be launched into society in mere hours, had instead launched themselves, together with the American jazz band and all the musical instruments, into the pool. In short, I'd hardly slept. My head throbbed, and I needed to make sense of what had happened the night before. The door rattled. I hesitated. But it turned out to only be a servant with my morning tea. The warm liquid spread through my tired body like an elixir. I considered the problem of last night's escapades further. As elated as I felt over my discovery of the secret room... Any thoughts about it at the moment would only serve to distract me from my main purpose. I pushed those thoughts aside. My biggest concern this morning was that I had failed to find the platypus. How could I face Uncle Albert? Where could the platypus be? I was certain that it had not left the island because everyone else was still here. Or I hoped they were. I had not been down to breakfast yet. The platypus was not in the grottos, or at least I had not seen it. It was not in the library, and I was fairly certain that it was not below stairs. The pesky thought of who had chased me through the garden reared its ugly head, but I pushed it aside, just like I did thoughts of the secret passageway in the library— I was fairly certain that it had been the killer who had pursued me, and if my deductions were right, that person was the vicar. But I needed to find the platypus before I could prove any of my conjectures. I took another sip of tea, gathered my thoughts, and considered the problem of the platypus further. If I raised the alarm that the trophy was missing, every guest and servant would be on the lookout for it. I was sure the vicar was aware of that. Thus, the vicar would have to hide the animal in a place where it would be inconspicuous. But how does one make such a hideous creature inconspicuous? Would the vicar hide it in his bedroom? I doubted Mrs. Reverend Quinton would stand for that. No, the platypus would have to be in a place the vicar could access with ease but which was not visited on a regular basis. I'd heard of such a place, but I needed Lady Lamberton's assistance. Goodness, Lady Carolyn! 
she exclaimed over the edge of her own teacup. What is the meaning of this? She was still in her nightgown. Lady Lamberton, forgive the intrusion, but I need the way to the trophy room. To Lady Lamberton's credit, she did not ask too many questions. Perhaps, having spent time in the company of my mother, and now my uncle, she had arrived at the conclusion that our family's brand of lunacy responded better to appeasement than confrontation. Whatever the reason, she had acquiesced to my request, and I now burst into the trophy room, with Jenkins lumbering in my wake. The room was quite unlike any other in the villa. The dark wood panelling, heavy curtains, tiger skins, and countless heads of deer, wild boar, and even a bear hanging on the wall, gave the room an oppressive feeling. I shuddered as I walked among the stuffed foxes, rabbits, and a wolf. I saw Lord Lamberton's stuffed peacock. I could understand his reluctance to contribute any specimens to this room. Jenkins must have misconstrued my interest in this room, because he spoke up. Most of the specimens here are from her ladyship's grandfather. His favorite pastime was hunting with various Habsburg members in the Tyrolean mountains. I nodded politely, and then I saw what I was looking for. The platypus stood hidden among some lynxes, its golden color blending with the reddish coats of the wildcats. When I picked up the platypus, Jenkins exclaimed, Now how did that get here? The platypus looked threadbare and mangy. I was glad to see nothing much had changed. I tapped lightly on its body. It was as I had thought. I was surprised I had not noticed the animal's weight, or its rigid body, or its dull metallic ring before. Jenkins gathered the guests in the drawing room, as I had requested. A few grumbled they had not had their breakfast yet, but most sat around, eyeing the platypus that I had placed on a table in the middle of the room with curiosity. James was observing me attentively, but didn't speak. Good heavens! exclaimed Flora when she sat down on the sofa next to James. What is that thing? I left it up to James to explain it to her. My uncle walked in, followed by the Count and Signor Mancuso. Please guard the door. I addressed the two Italians. I had learned quite young that one of the advantages of a hereditary title is that people rarely questioned one's requests. The Count and Signor Mancuso followed suit. I say, what is the meaning of this? One of the lords grumbled in the background. Oh, the golden platypus! My uncle exclaimed in his turn. Why do you have it out, Carolyn? He eyed me with suspicion. I could see that he was trying to comprehend why I had gone against my promise to keep the animal hidden. I'll explain, Uncle. Just have a seat, I said. I took a deep breath. I had never done anything like this before. The closest I had ever come to speaking in front of a crowd was when Miss Skipton, our English mistress, had suffered a nervous breakdown during a recitation by Daphne Holyfield of Samuel Taylor Coleridge's Christabel. Whether it was Daphne's rendition of the poem or something else that drove Miss Skipton to hysteria, never became clear, as Miss Skipton left our school soon after. But the upshot was that I was appointed by our headmistress to read in front of my chums from Milton's Paradise Lost for the duration of term. I wiped my palms discreetly on my dress. The stinging sensation in my left hand reminded me of the cut I had sustained during the night. I hoped there wasn't a bloodstain now on my morning frock. I cleared my throat. Thank you all for gathering, I began. I believe I have discovered the reason behind the murders, 
and the golden platypus holds the answer. Flora snorted out a laugh, but a stern look from Lord Mantlebury put an end to that. I ignored her. At least the lords of the Royal Society were taking me seriously and appeared to be hanging on my every word. Something disappeared from this island two years ago, and it has finally made its way back to the island, I said dramatically, warming up to my role. I was a conjurer about to do a magic trick. No, it can't be. Lord and Lady Lamberton exclaimed in unison. The meaning conveyed by each, however, was quite different. Lady Lamberton's interjection communicated disappointment, while Lord Lamberton's utterance expressed joyful surprise. He now stared at the platypus, mesmerized. I vaguely considered Lady Lamberton's reaction and wondered if I had got the whole thing wrong, but pushed that thought aside. What? What is this? said Lord Mantlebury, twisting around to look at the others. What is she talking about? The vicar shifted uncomfortably and glanced at the door furtively. I knew then I had it figured out correctly. That's right. All of this, these senseless deaths, have been about the golden platypus, I said. A few gasps and some laughs accompanied my statement. I caught my blunder instantly, but it was too late. No, I mean, this was not going the way I had pictured it in my mind. It's about what is hidden inside. The killings have to do with what is hidden inside. I reiterated. I was beginning to suspect that to those gathered, I was starting to sound a lot like my Uncle Albert. A few more shifted uncomfortably. Some coughed. I avoided looking at James. My dramatic revelation was not going to plan. I steeled my back and pressed on. Did none of you think it strange that the vicar jumped in the lake to retrieve the platypus? I said, and looked at the gathered company. No sane man would do that. And you are quite sane, are you not, vicar? I said, glaring at him. So why jump after it? His wife sidled up to him and slipped her hand through his arm protectively. She glared at me. He is the bravest man I know, she said. Be that as it may, I continued, seen in the light of all that occurred subsequently on the island, your husband's behavior is suspicious. I turned again to the vicar. But it wasn't only you jumping in the lake that caught my attention that morning at the dock. Something else bothered me when the platypus fell into the water. It wasn't until later that I remembered what it was. The platypus had started to sink instead of floating. I had expected it to float. After all, it was just a stuffed animal. So why was a platypus so heavy? Wouldn't the stuffing and its wooden base make it float? It dawned on me, regrettably slow, and after two lives were lost that something heavy was hidden inside it, something like a solid golden chalice encrusted with precious stones. The room gasped in unison, except for a few people, like the vicar, and Lord and Lady Lamberton, who had guessed what I was about to reveal. That's right. The person who stole the chalice two years ago is the same person who killed Diva Grieger Rescue and Herr Hunkler. I stared at the vicar in triumph. The vicar's eyes darted back and forth. Perspiration beaded his brow. He jumped out of his seat. I'm not the killer, the vicar exclaimed. You have to believe me, he said, and looked around the room for support. He pulled on his cassock nervously 
as though to underline the point that a man of cloth would do no such thing. No, vicar, I said. I overheard you arguing with Diva Grigorescu on the night of our arrival, the night before she was killed. I stared him down. You owed her money. She threatened you. And that's why you killed her. Chapter 28 Lady Carolyn, how dare you accuse a person of the cloth? Said Lord Pakenham, bristling. I cast him a belligerent look. I had not forgotten his attitude towards me on the Riviera. Oh, that's right! Lord Lamberton exclaimed. He turned to the vicar. You were here, on the island, when the chalice disappeared. Yes, he was here, I said, and he put the chalice inside the platypus. He mentioned to my uncle that he had a cousin who was a taxidermist. He has probably picked up a few tricks from his cousin and knew how to sew it up properly and all that. The vicar approached my uncle with an offer to help prepare the platypus after we arrived on the island. His aim, of course, was to take the chalice, then sew up the animal back together. And no one would be the wiser. But my uncle was suspicious, for his own reasons, and would not hand over the animal. I smiled at Uncle Albert. His reasons might have been balmy, but I was not about to reveal that. But why put the chalice in there in the first place? asked Lord Mantlebury. To hide it. Remember, Lord Lamberton searched everyone who was still at the villa. What happened, vicar? Lord Lamberton looked pleadingly at the vicar. Disappointment was clearly written across his face. The vicar's wife had been giving her husband progressively withering looks, and the vicar began squirming under her fiery gaze. He paled under his tan. The vicar pulled on his dog collar. His voice was shaky. Well, as you say, everyone was going to be searched. I had taken the chalice and needed a place to hide it. You, Lord Lamberton, had just won the Golden Platypus Trophy and were going to bring it home to England. The platypus was about the right size and no one would think to look inside it. It would travel to England among your possessions and then I would find a way to get the chalice out of the platypus once it got to England. He didn't elaborate on how he had been planning to get his hands on the platypus once in England, and no one dared to ask. I took the stuffing out of the platypus and put the chalice inside it instead. As you say, Lady Carolyn, I picked up a few skills from my cousin. Silence had descended over the room. It was Lady Lamberton who broke the silence at last. But why is the chalice still inside the platypus after all this time? The vicar looked as though he had never perspired so much in his life. It was quite unbecoming of someone so handsome. He cast a quick sideways glance at his wife, swallowed uncomfortably, and continued his story. It all went wrong. While I was out taking a stroll through the gardens, the lords had held a meeting and had accused Lord Lamberton of cheating. Yes, well, Lord Lamberton said. A silly misunderstanding. Scoundrel! Utterly abominable behavior! The chorus of lords cried. Continue, vicar, Lady Lamberton urged him. Let's get to the chalice! The vicar swallowed again. So I was completely unaware that the golden platypus had been awarded to Lord Abington instead. He left the island that morning, and it was only later that I realized the platypus had left the island with him. And that's when my trouble started. What are you talking about? Lord Lamberton said. Diva Grigorescu and Herr Hunkler were not happy when they found out. They thought I had double-crossed them. What? 
What is this? Lady Lamberton cried out. What are you on about, man? Her husband joined her. They had left the island long before the chalice was stolen. They were crooks, your lordship, the vicar said, turning to him. I knew it, Uncle Albert added under his breath. I had suspected that the diva was involved in something nefarious, but I was surprised that the mild-mannered Swiss art dealer, who Wilfred had spoken of so highly, was also a crook. I smiled at my uncle. In his own way, he had been right about Herr Hunkler. Diva Grigorescu had become used to a lavish lifestyle, supported by gifts and jewels from various lovers and wealthy fans. But as her voice deteriorated, she needed a different source of income. Salvation came from her friend, Hans Hunkler. He had discovered a lucrative market in America for antiques from Europe. But in order to avoid customs and duty, and to bypass such pesky essentials as documents and provenance records, he needed a way to smuggle the items to America. I reminded myself to tell Wilford that he had been right about the diva in many respects. The genius of the scheme was that Diva Grigorescu always travelled with sets and costumes for the opera productions. These were full of paste jewels and fake objects. It was easy to hide a genuine piece among these props. Selling that chalice in America would have been one of our biggest triumphs. Business had been slow during the war, and crossing the Atlantic had been treacherous, so selling the chalice was essential to boost our takings. The vicar mopped his brow and continued without being prompted. Herr Hunkler was the mastermind. Diva Grigorescu and I only did his bidding. We specialized in religious pieces. I would scout and use my extensive religious history knowledge to find the best objects. Herr Hunkler would use his connections in the art world to find a buyer, and Diva Grigorescu would smuggle the pieces to America. He paused and looked around the room. His demeanor had changed. It was though a wave of relief had washed over him. Now that the truth was out, some of his old confidence and golden glow had returned. He seemed to enjoy shocking his hosts. The more he spoke, the less remorse he showed. Perhaps he was glad it was all out in the open. He could stop pretending to be religious and stop leading a double life. I glanced at his wife. A change had overcome her as well. The initial shock had worn off, and she now looked at the vicar with something akin to the way a missionary eyes a heathen. Her back was straight, her gaze determined. The qualities I had observed during our shared tennis game were coming out. The vicar was in for a reckoning. After realizing what had occurred, I left for England, but I couldn't simply break into Lord Abington's house and get the chalice. I had to come up with a plausible excuse to be there. A plan. My reputation had to remain pristine. In the meantime, however, the other two came after me and were threatening to do unpleasant things to me, so I had to think of a way to evade them. So you wrote to the bishop, telling him you'd had a revelation, and were interested in missionary work somewhere far from England, Lord Lamberton said. Yes, it was the only way I could think of to gain more time, let the affair blow over, and hopefully have my associates cool down a bit, and forget about me. But in the meantime, you married me, said his wife, fire and brimstone burning in her eyes. Yes, my dear, the vicar said. It has been the best decision I have ever made. He looked sincere. I had to give him that. 
she relented a bit. Is that why you wrote to me for an invitation? Lord Lamberton said. His brow creased. But how did you know the platypus would be back on the island? He stared at the vicar incredulously. Well, Lord Featherly's secretary is my cousin, as you know. He had sent me a letter and had mentioned the platypus, thinking it was a good joke. He didn't realize what the creature meant to me. I telegraphed him back to ask where the lords and the platypus were heading next, and as luck would have it, the next destination was here. I couldn't believe my good fortune. I knew I could get an invitation to the island with no difficulty. And my wife had been insisting for a while that we travel to England. I had been resisting it. He glanced at her, and she rewarded him with a murderous look. But he was my chance to set it all straight. I would come to the island, get the platypus, retrieve the chalice, and go back to England. If my two former associates came after me, I could pay them their share of the chalice. An honorable man, my uncle said. I wasn't certain whether he was angling for sarcasm. Probably not. But it all went wrong, I prompted. The vicar nodded. Yes, my luck ran out when I got to the pier. I saw Diva Grieger rescue and Herr Hunkler at once. But I couldn't run. They had already seen me. And what could I tell my wife? Well, they must have learned somehow that you were coming to the island, Lady Lamberton said. They phoned me for an invitation, under the pretext that they wanted to see the Queen of the Night in bloom. Most unfortunate, yes, said the vicar. And even more unfortunate was the diva pushing that crate by accident. She saw me jump in after the platypus. I couldn't let it sink to the bottom. They guessed right away, of course. And so you killed them, I said. That way, your secret would not come out, and you got to keep the chalice. No, most certainly not, the vicar's wife protested. He might be a thief, but he's not a killer. He was with me on both occasions when those poor people were stabbed. Well, that's not much of an alibi, I said. A wife would say that, wouldn't she? But the look on the vicar's wife's face made it clear that at this moment she would be glad for her husband to hang for the murders. She was telling the truth. Plus, I remembered the vicar's face after each murder. He had looked terrified that he would be next. I nodded. In that case, unfortunately, that leaves us again in the dark about who the actual killer is. The gathered guests looked around the room and regarded each other with suspicion. I glanced toward my uncle, and then to the Count. Aside from finding the golden chalice and exposing three people as crooks, I had accomplished little. I had not solved the murders. My uncle was still the chief suspect for the deaths. I sighed. What about this chalice, then? Lord Mantlebury said. Oh, you don't actually mean we need to cut the poor creature open? My uncle piped up. It's dead, Flora said. But this is the golden platypus we are talking about. The first specimen from the 18th century to be preserved and to have survived until the modern day. Lord Lamberton explained. We can't open it. Oh, Harold! Lady Lamberton exclaimed. I'll do it, James said, and jumped up from his seat. He produced a penknife, to my surprise, from his pocket. Be gentle, my uncle whimpered. The lords held their collective breath, and I watched over James's shoulder as he slid the blade of the knife 
through the stitches holding the abdomen of the animal together. As the final stitch came undone, he slipped his hand inside and pulled out the most exquisite golden chalice. The time the chalice had spent inside the platypus, and all the assaults the animal had endured, had done nothing to diminish the cup's beauty. The golden chalice sparkled in the morning sun, streaming in through the tall windows, and as James turned the cup in his hand, the jewels affixed to its surface caught the sun's rays. Rubies, emeralds, sapphires and diamonds glowed bewitchingly, and a kaleidoscope of colours reflected onto the walls of the drawing room. The golden platypus lays a golden egg. How fitting, said my uncle. Chapter 29 while Uncle Albert congratulated me on my success, I felt as though I had achieved very little. As glad as I was that Lord and Lady Lamberton received their precious chalice back, the fact remained that my uncle was still going to hang for the two murders. If the vicar was not the killer, then who was? The problem was that having missed so many lunches and dinners— I had run out of Toblerone bars. I was convinced their blend of chocolate and nougat helped me think. But the additional problem was that I knew so little about the people in the villa. And now that the vicar had confessed to the theft, but not the murders, I was not certain who to trust and who to confide in. The villa, which until recently had felt grandiose and opulent, now felt oppressive. It was a gilded cage. The inability to communicate with the outside world was beginning to weigh on me, and I was sure that it was only a matter of time before the killer made their move on me. Now that I had shown my hand, figuratively and literally, the killer knew I had been out by the grottoes last night and was searching for the truth. How long before the killer came after me? My mind jumped to my chums in London, who had been quite accommodating with information pertaining to a case on the Riviera. If I could only get in touch with them. But with the telephone line still down, putting a call through to London was not in the cards. And sending a letter to London would just not work. I didn't have that much time. I needed to act fast. Oh, if only I could send a telegram. But even that was impossible. We couldn't go to the village to send a message or get a message back. Or could we? I had been so concerned with the platypus and the vicar and the chalice that, for a moment, I had forgotten about the library. If my calculations were correct... I had one advantage over the killer. I had discovered the secret war communications room. But soon my excitement subsided. Even if the apparatus worked, who would know how to send a message? The Count had the bearing of a military man, and Lord Lamberton surely had some experience. But I dismissed both. I could not trust them. I had to find James. He had been in the war. I hoped he could help me. I ran down the corridors and checked all the places he could be. Lady Lamberton was in the drawing room, writing letters. I couldn't imagine why, since no mail could leave the island. Flora was also there, reading a fashion journal. Upon my inquiry about James, both replied they didn't know where he was. Flora raised an immaculate eyebrow and gave me a mischievous smile. Lady Lamberton suggested he might be working with Lord Pakenham. I didn't want to go to Lord Pakenham's room. The man always wore a disapproving expression when looking at me. He still didn't think it right that a woman had been admitted to the Royal Society, even if it was merely in the position of a personal secretary. 
He had said as much when he was leaving the drawing room after I'd failed to unmask the killer. There had to be another way. I hurried to my uncle's room. I needed Wilford's assistance. Wilford was busy organizing a collection of books on butterflies under my uncle's watchful eye. Oh, there you are, young Carol. My uncle chirped when I entered, as though he had not a care in the world. Fine show this morning. I was glad that he seemed oblivious to his predicament. It was only a matter of time before the weather lifted and the police arrived in their boats to arrest him. My stomach roiled at the thought. Thank you, uncle, I said, and put on a brave smile. No reason to display the apprehension I felt. Let the old man live in his dream world. I wondered if the British consulate would intervene on his behalf once he was taken to an Italian prison. I actually wanted a word with Wilford. Yes, milady. Upon hearing his name, the faithful servant abandoned his task with the books and turned his attention to me. How can I be of assistance? I wonder if you could deliver a message from me to Lord Pakenham's personal secretary. To the Honourable James Haswell, milady. My uncle's valet was a stickler for titles. I hadn't heard James being referred to with his courtesy title in a while. Yes, I said. It's a delicate matter, and I need you to be discreet. Wilford sent me a reproachful look, which was meant to convey that I had no reason to doubt his discretion. I smiled and nodded. The matter is this. I need to send a message to London. Indeed, milady? Yes, I have an idea, and I think I can get some information pertaining to the incidents on the island from some chums in London. Yes, milady, but it is my understanding that sending communications from the island is not possible at the moment. Most fortuitously, he said, and trailed off as he cast a swift glance in my uncle's direction who was currently using a magnifying glass to study the markings on a butterfly in a monograph cradled in his lap. That's correct, but I think I've discovered a way to circumvent that. It's a long shot, but it's worth a try. I cast a glance at my uncle in turn. I'd be happy to deliver the message. What is it? How shall I put this? The fact is, upon an excursion through the house last night, I felt uneasy sharing my escapades with Wilford, but the valet did not bat an eyelash. I happened upon a passageway that led to a room that looked like it had been used during the war as a communication center. I could see from the imperceptible augmentation of his eyes that this information interested him. But he only said, Indeed? I nodded. Yes. I assume Lord Lamberton doesn't know about it, or he has his own reasons for not telling the Italian chaps that it exists. But it's there, and the equipment looks as though it was abandoned without being dismantled. Some of it might be in working order. The telephone doesn't work. I checked but perhaps the telegraph is still hooked up to the line on land. I shrugged my shoulders. I only had a rudimentary understanding of how these things worked. Am I safe in assuming that your plan for the Honourable James Haswell is to have him help you transmit a message to London? Wilford asked. That's right. As you know, he was in the war, and I was hoping he might know how to use the apparatus. I understand, lady. However, if you permit me, I may be able to suggest a different course of action. Yes, I said, intrigued to hear what the valet had in mind. I was not in the war myself, a bit too long in the tooth, if you permit me to say. 
But last year, I volunteered to take part in a new scheme established by the Air Raid Precautions Committee. They were seeking civilians to train in civil defense in the event of another war. You see, my aunt was one of the casualties in 1915, when a German zeppelin dropped bombs on Yarmouth. The Air Raid Precautions Committee aims to prepare civilians to spot bombers and communicate with the authorities and civilians. As part of my training, I received instruction in using Morse code and a telegraph. I am confident that if the equipment works, I would be able to send a message to England on your behalf. Wonderful! I exclaimed. However, we must be cautious when approaching the hidden room. With a killer still at large, one should not expose oneself to unnecessary danger. I explained to Wilfred where the room was located, and together we devised a plan. I will go ahead, and you'll follow me to the library in a few minutes. We'll make sure the coast is clear before going through the hidden door. If I may make an additional suggestion, my lady. Of course. Your uncle may be a useful ally to have in the library, in case someone enters the library while we are in the secret passage and room. He can give us a signal if the library is not safe for us to return to. Or he can drive away any persons who want to use the library. Capital idea! My uncle piped up. He had been paying attention to the entire conversation this whole time. Chapter 30 Uncle Albert and I set off for the library. If anyone asked, we were off to do some research on a common brassy ringlet my uncle had spotted in the English garden. No one would suspect us of deceitful activities. Wilford was to follow a few minutes behind, as though delivering a message to my uncle. When we got to the library, it was mercifully deserted. Uncle Albert busied himself with examining the collection while I lounged around, waiting for the valet. With each passing moment, my heart beat faster and my doubts grew stronger. What if this didn't work? What if we couldn't get a message to London? What if my chums in London had nothing to contribute? What information was I even looking for? A knock at the door made me jump out of the leather armchair. But it was only Wilfred. Ready, my lady? I think so. I answered without confidence. In addition to all the doubts I had about the scheme, I also had doubts that my uncle could successfully thwart unwelcome inquiries as to what he was doing in the library. But I told myself that there was nothing suspicious or sinister about Lord Tatham spending time in the library. He was, after all, quite fond of books. I only hoped that others would not feel an impulse for a book while we were in the secret room. Uncle? I turned to him. You remember what we talked about? What is that, my dear? The signals, I said, trying to keep the exasperation out of my voice. Oh, that's right, my dear. I knock twice if there is someone in the room and scratch like a mouse if there is no one. I could feel the blood draining from my face. This was never going to work. No, uncle, you sit here and wait for us, I said, and pointed to an armchair I had dragged close to the secret door. If someone comes into the library, make sure you speak to them in a loud enough voice. When we are ready to come out, we'll scratch gently at the door. If there is someone in the room, do nothing and just speak loudly to them. That way, we'll hear you're not alone and wait. If the coast is clear, knock twice to let us know we can come out. It wasn't the best of plans but it was the simplest one I could come up with. My uncle nodded to confirm that he understood, 
but a slight wooliness about the eyes made me doubt that he was in complete control of the plan. I made my way to the panel on the wall. But standing in front of it, I realized I did not know how to open the secret door. Looking at the panel in the daylight, I could not see that it was any different from all the other paneling in the library. Since I had leaned against it in the dark, I did not know what part of it to press to open it. I ran my hand along the surface and over the molding. I pressed here and there, but it would not budge. This is awkward, I said, and turned to Wilford with a shy smile. I'm not entirely certain how to open the secret door. When I discovered it last night, I just sort of leaned on it, and it opened. Why don't you try it again, my lady? Wilford suggested. Recreate the conditions of the time when you were able to open it, so to speak. I turned around and leaned my back against the panel. Closing my eyes, I tried to reproduce my movements. I tried to remember where my hands had been and what my fingers had touched, but nothing my fingers and hand pressed made the door open. Frustration growing, I leaned my head against the wall, and as my head struck the panel, I heard the latch release, and the wooden panel behind me yielded. By Jove, I think she's got it! My uncle exclaimed. I sent him an appreciative smile. I hoped for his sake that my plan would work. Wilford pushed the door open and showed me in. I chuckled at his manners. He did not abandon his duties, even when a secret door was concerned. Which way, milady? He asked out of deference when we entered the passageway. I chuckled again and switched on my torch. Straight ahead, Wilford. Permit me, lady. He reached for the torch, and having taken a hold of it, proceeded to illuminate the way for me. Every few steps he would warn me about an uneven spot on the ground, or alert me to the roughness of the wall, and advise me not to brush my afternoon frock against it. At last, we arrived in the war room. Wilford swept the torchlight around the room and across the equipment. Oh, there's an overhead light, I said, and switched it on. I had not noticed it the previous night. This was a good start. Perhaps other instruments also worked. Thank you, milady. Having electricity is preferable. It will make our task infinitely easier. He walked around the room, inspecting the instruments and touching the surfaces. Do you recognize these machines? Do you think we will be able to send a message to England? I asked, my voice betraying my worry. He nodded, but did not commit to an answer verbally. Wilford? I began tentatively. A small thought had been worrying me since we set off on our expedition. Yes, milady. How will the message get to England from here? I mean, I am aware that one is capable of sending cables around the world. My mother, it seems, has no difficulty dispensing her counsel and guidance to hapless recipients in the four corners of the globe. But do you think we will have any difficulty reaching our intended party? all the way from this island in the middle of a lake in Italy? We can only try. Lady Lamberton is quite dismissive of the state of communications in Italy. From what I can tell, milady, the apparatus in this room, although a few years old now, was the latest technology at the time of the Great War. We should have little difficulty sending a message out, provided all the connections are still in place but I see no reason why the connections would have been dismantled, since all the instruments are still here. He examined some machines more closely. I see that the telegraph apparatus uses a punch tape, he said appreciatively. I would not even have to use my Morse code skills. If you'd like to take a closer look at this machine, milady, 
he said, pointing to something that looked very much like the typewriter I'd used at the secretarial school in London. It works much like a typewriter, but instead of typing out letters, it punches out holes in a paper strip. He picked up a roll of paper with tiny dots all over it. I recognize that paper, I said excitedly. My grandfather in Boston received stock quotes from New York on such paper. That's correct, milady. This method of communication has been adopted widely by the stock markets across the world. But it's also an excellent method to send a cable. It eliminates errors on part of the sender. You mean there won't be an Italian guy on the mainland, sitting in his tiny office, relaying a message in English with his tiny Morse code tapping thing? The instrument you are referring to, my lady, is a key, he said kindly. No, that technology belongs to the last century. Since the war, the signal relay stations have become increasingly more reliant on machines to transmit the electrical signals. To some extent, we are fortunate to be so close to the border, in an area that was greatly contested during the war. Telegraph communications would have been strengthened and updated with the latest technology. And unlike telephones, different telegraph operators can communicate without an issue. I thought back to what Lady Lamberton had said, and her frustration with not being able to call the police station because they subscribed to a different telephone provider. Perhaps Italians were better off communicating with telegrams. How will we know if our message has made it to England? I asked. Once we receive the reply, he said, and permitted himself a tiny smile at his witticism. But his quip only increased my apprehension. Wilford! I hadn't even considered it until this moment. But how are we going to receive a message back? We can't have one of us guard the apparatus until we receive a message. The valet nodded his understanding. Allow me to put your mind at rest, my lady, he said calmly. The machine will receive the message, even if one is not here to accept it. The message will print out on a punch strip, and we can decode it at our leisure. Thank you, Wilford. I guess it's time to send our message. I am at your service, my lady. Chapter 31 We spent some time discussing to whom to send a cable and what the cable should include. In the end, we decided that the most prudent course was to send a message to each of my friends in high places, as I liked to call them. The reason I found myself the employee of Uncle Albert was because I had taken part in a diverting scavenger hunt through London not long ago. As part of the shenanigans, I did a stint at a typing school in London. Horrified that I was associating with the daughters of shopkeepers, my mother sent me away to assist Uncle Albert until the scandal blew over. But not before she had placed each of the girls from the course in a respectable secretarial position, in an attempt to elevate the profile of the school. Thus, we were now sending telegrams to Jane at the War Office, Eleanor at Lloyd's, Louisa at the Church of England, and Philippa at the Bank of England. To each of them, we transmitted the same message. Two murders at Lady Lamberton's villa, Lake Garda, Diva Grigo Rescue, Opera singer, and Hans Honkler, Swiss art dealer, dead. Need information on Lambertons? Reverend Horatio Quintin and wife Olive, nay, of Kenya. Italians, Count Giovanni Contarini and Roberto Mancuso. And Flora Nesbitt, anthropologist in Africa, British Museum. Lords Mantlebury and Pakenham also here, with secretaries Alistair Thompson and James Haswell. I was confident that one of these venerable British institutions would have some information either on our victims or on our suspects. 
Well, milady, Wilfred said, after he fed the last of the punched strip through the machine, there's nothing more we can do here for now. One of us should come back tomorrow to check for a response. We switched off the overhead lamp and switched on the torch. As we entered the stone passageway to return to the library and left the communications room behind, a melange of feelings coursed through me. I was excited about having been able to send a message, but worried that it would not reach its intended destinations. I also worried about what information the responses would bring. Would they finally throw some light on the evil on the island? Or would my chums be unable to retrieve any information about the victims and suspects? Wilford had reached the secret door ahead of me and switched off the torch as I joined him. He scratched gently at the door. We waited in the darkness, but no sound could be heard from the other side. He scratched again. What shall we do, milady? He's probably dozed off, or maybe he can't hear the signal. But a more sinister thought crossed my mind. What if the murderer had done my uncle in? I pushed that dark thought out of my head. Alive, my uncle was more valuable to the killer than dead. While my uncle was alive, he was the chief suspect, and the killer could go on freely with their scheme. What was their scheme? Were more deaths to come? But to what end? What was the killer's motive? Wilford pressed his head against the door. The library appears silent. I believe it is safe to walk in. I think you are right. We couldn't stay hidden in the passageway forever, waiting for my uncle to wake up. Just as we were about to open the hidden door, a whirring sound travelled down the stone walls of the passageway. The telegraph, my lady. Wilford exclaimed in a whisper. He switched the torch on again, and we rushed back to the communications room. The whirring and punching sound was loud and clear. He shone the torchlight on the telegraph machine, and I saw the narrow strip of paper projecting from the machine, little holes dotting its surface like lace. Wilford stood back until the machine had finished its job, and then leaped to the task of decoding the message. It's from your friend Jane, he said, looking up. She confirms receipt of the message, and will follow up shortly with any relevant information. My heart leaped with joy. At least we knew the apparatus worked. All we could do now was wait. I would have liked to remain in the communication room until information started coming back from London, but knew it was not prudent. Everyone would wonder where we were. We retraced our steps back to the concealed door. Wilford listened at the door and confirmed that the only noise he could hear was my uncle's snoring. He opened the door tentatively, and I entered the library behind him. And sure enough, my uncle was napping on the leather armchair that was supposed to be his watch post. As Wilford latched the secret door, the click of the lock jerked my uncle out of sleep. What? Where? He said, looking around in confusion. A book, which lay open in his lap, slipped to the floor. Oh, hello, Wilford. Young Carol. What are you doing here? We both gave my uncle a bit of time to get his bearings. Oh, right, he finally said, and straightened up in his chair. I picked up his book and placed it on a table. How did it go, uncle? Any problems? No, nothing. Nothing at all. Uh, well, Lady Lamberton now believes me a complete nincompoop. She came in for a book and kept asking me why I was shouting at her. How about your mission? He asked with an eager twinkle in his eyes. 
Anything to report back? I was certain my uncle had quite enjoyed this little adventure, even if he had slept through most of it. Just as I was about to fill in the aging relation on our success, the library door swung open with a plum. There you are, said Lord Lamberton. You better all come. We were able to get through to the police, and they are on their way. Chapter 32 the villa guests gathered on the terrace to observe the progression of the police boat towards the island, between sips of afternoon cocktails. The wind had died down, the water had calmed, and the Lambertons had been able to telephone the tavern in the village. The police boat made its way across the water at a laborious pace. It was evident that the Italian authorities were not in possession of the high-speed motorboats Lord Lamberton and Count Contarini could afford. Nevertheless, the boat advanced toward the island faithfully, and I watched its progress with dread. I knew next to nothing about the Italian police and their methods, but tidbits I had overheard gave me cause to fear the worst. I worried that with so much evidence against my uncle— they would hastily reach the same conclusion as everyone else at the villa, and would accuse him of the murders. My only hope now rested with my chums in London. I hoped an answer would arrive from London that would not only shed new light on the case, but would also help expose the true killer. Thus immersed in my thoughts, I had failed to notice the progression of a second boat towards the island— just as the police boat was about to make contact with the dock, a sleek runabout, not much different from Count Contarini's own, cut off the police boat, splashed the portly policeman at its helm, and came to a stop at the dock before the police boat could get there. The person who exited the runabout first was a complete shock to me. Puppy! I exclaimed, and sprang in her direction. What are you doing here? Surprise mingled with joy inside me. I had never been bosom friends with Persephone Kettering Trapson. Poppy, while we had been at school together. She had been the head girl, and, to be honest, a bit of a bully. She even had an array of embarrassing nicknames she enjoyed pitching at me but her brand of solid Britishness, complemented by a firm body and a no-nonsense attitude towards life, regretfully abandoned in the presence of a tall, dark, and handsome gentleman of the Rudolf Valentino persuasion, had grown on me. And her arrival now, however unexpected, sent a calming wave through my body. "'Oh, hello, beastly!' she exclaimed, using an unwelcome corruption of my family name, Beasley, when she saw me and waved energetically. What ho! She called out cheerfully to the crowd gathered on the terrace. She stepped off the boat, completely unaware that there was an angry Italian policeman right behind her. Nino! The Count exclaimed in his own turn, as a tanned young man in a white shirt with rolled-up sleeves stepped off the boat in Poppy's wake. The signorina insisted I take her, he said, and shrugged. The Count bounded in his direction and began a conversation in rapid Italian, accompanied by exaggerated gesticulations and arm-waving. In a moment, they were joined by the wet, rotund policeman, his girth singled him out as the person in charge among the visibly undernourished dark young men in uniform standing in his vicinity. The pudgy policeman contributed his own hand gestures to the fervent conversation. Poppy paid them no mind and proceeded instead like an icebreaker towards me. Hello, Lord and Lady Lamberton, she said cheerfully. Pardon the unannounced intrusion. I tried telephoning from France, but couldn't get through. And then I got to Lake Garda, and still couldn't get a call through, and was told that a crossing was impossible because of the weather. 
I've been camping out in the tiny village on the shore for the past two days with Nanny. I leaned past Poppy and noticed that her chaperone, dressed as always in somber black, was dozing in the back of the boat, undisturbed by the noise. Finally, the weather lifted, Poppy continued, and I spotted this chap with the only decent boat in the harbor and had him bring me here. He wasn't too keen, but relented in the end. What have I missed? She hooked her arm through mine and pulled me up alongside her. Although I wanted to tell her all our troubles, I first had to clear up a few points. Poppy, what in the world are you doing here? What happened to the villa hunt on the French Riviera? Oh, that, she said, dismissing my question with a wave. Lady Morton Cecil arrived, and as you had made a most fortuitous escape, she began making matrimonial overtures in my direction. I could not have that. As you know, I'm seeking to ameliorate the Kettering Trapson family line through marriage, not to grade it with the Morton family's characteristic beaked nose and a weak chin. Although Poppy herself did not possess the good looks of her namesake, she commanded enough of a fortune to procure an attractive husband. Apparently, she continued, we are quite safe from Lady Morton in Italy. She cannot abide Italian food. Small mercies, I thought, and smiled. Our conversation was interrupted from proceeding further by the Italian policeman, who blasted his way to the front. After hours upon hours of interviews and evidence gathering, the bodies of the diva and the Swiss chap were carried away, and with them, my uncle. The police had reached much the same conclusion as everyone else, that Uncle Albert had the strongest motives to kill them both, and with the necklace and letter as evidence, they considered the case watertight. I watched in horror as the boat containing my uncle pulled away. Not only because Lady Lamberton had expressed doubt about the fairness of the Italian justice system, under the brute Mussolini, or because my dear uncle was destined to spend days in a filthy prison cell before the British consulate in Rome could get to him and secure his release, but also because my only hope of deciphering any messages that might come through from London was also sailing away on that boat. Wilford had categorically refused to abandon my uncle in his hour of need, and insisted on taking up rooms in the village so he could make daily visits to my uncle in prison. I would have done the same, but I felt I would be of greater service to my uncle here on the island. I was sure the killer was still at the villa, and I was determined to find out who that was before they had a chance to leave. Perhaps now that my uncle was arrested, the killer would lower their guard and make a mistake. I walked back to my room in a haze of confusion. What was I supposed to do next? How would I read the telegrams back from London? Perhaps James might be able to read them. Perhaps there was a code book somewhere. While Wilford had been getting ready to depart with my uncle, I had tried to catch his attention several times. But under the watchful eye of the Italian police, the breadth of our communication was limited. I had attempted to breach the subject of telegrams, but Wilford had just shook his head and given me a warning look. I walked into my room and almost screamed. A dark shape was lounging on my bed, and it took me a moment to realize it was Poppy. What ho, she said, sitting up in bed. Terribly sorry about your uncle. Thanks, Poppy. I trudged to the bed and sat sulking beside her. Look here, she said. I'm here now. Let me know how I can help and all that. Thanks, Poppy. But that was as much conversation as I could muster at the moment. 
Listen, Gossie, she said, using my other nickname, a corruption of the word ghastly, derived from my principal moniker, beastly. Tell me all that has happened so far, and all the evidence you have gathered, and perhaps something will jog the old bean. Although I did not feel like talking about any of it, I could see the logic behind Poppy's reasoning and began to go over everything that had happened since we alighted from the train. No! She interjected when I got to the part of the vicar, the golden platypus and the golden chalice that was hidden inside. So what now? She asked when I was finished. Well... The plan was to wait for a reply from London, and see if that brings us any new information. But with Wilford gone, I have little hope of deciphering the messages. It's not like I could walk up to the men in the party and be like, What ho! I discovered a hidden wall communications room. Who here can read punched tape? Now could I? Oh, that reminds me, Poppy said and jumped off the bed as though scalded. Wilfred left a letter for you. I guess he couldn't give it to you directly because of the police chops. She rummaged through the deep pockets of her afternoon frock and brought out a crumpled envelope. I grabbed the letter from her and tore it open, in not a very ladylike manner. What is it? she asked as she leaned over my shoulder to read the letter's contents. It's a cipher, I said, my heart leaping with joy. A key to the punch tape code. Chapter 33 Though receiving the cipher had set my world in motion again, I had suppressed the urge of going down to the hidden room and checking to see if any communication had arrived. I had calculated that such a move would be premature. I had thus spent an uncomfortable dinner, where everyone had attempted to mollify my distress over my uncle's arrest, and had followed this up with a restless night. In an attempt at self-preservation, the cut on my hand was difficult to disguise. Whoever had followed me from the grottoes knew I had been snooping around. I had spent the night on the sofa in Poppy's room. While thoroughly uncomfortable on the abbreviated settee, the night had not been without its rewards. Much like an oyster fashions a pearl out of an irritating grain of sand, the disagreeable sleeping arrangement had helped me crystallize a gem of an idea, and it was my uncle who had planted the grain of this gem. For a moment, my thoughts wandered over to my uncle and his first night in prison, and I ventured to think that he'd been more comfortable. Engaged in the finishing touches of my morning toilette, I went over my plan for the day in my head. If my hunch was right, I would not need to resort to deciphering secret messages from London. I just needed Poppy to pop down to the library and bring back the book my uncle had been reading. I employed this extra layer of subterfuge so as not to inspire suspicion in the killer that I was on to them. Poppy arrived back with the book in due course, and we sat, side by side, glancing through its pages. It was a thick volume, written in a dry enough language to put anyone to sleep. But the information it contained proved that the capers on the island were not simply about a precious chalice. They were about something much more valuable. The book we were examining pertained to the exploits of the French army in the Venetian Republic, a topic that was discussed at dinner once, but the significance of which I had failed to see until now. The chapter which my uncle had been reading, and which I was able to find quickly enough, concerned specifically French barks that had sunk in Lake Garda, laden with the spoils of war. This final piece of information helped me make sense of all I had observed and heard at the villa. The warning to avoid the grottoes and the talk of fairies. The underwater diving suit, 
which I had at first mistaken for a suit of armour. The Lambertons inviting their niece, whose parents had been archaeologists, and who probably knew a thing or two about digging for treasure, to stay with them. And it explained Herr Hunkel's trip to the grottoes with Lady Lamberton. And even though Lady Lamberton had acted surprised, when she'd heard about Herr Hunkel's illicit transactions from the vicar, I wondered if she had known about the art dealer's side business all along. It was a good thing that I was sitting down, because the room began spinning. I had the sinking feeling that the Count and the Italian official were also in on the scheme. That's why everyone was so keen to pin these murders on my uncle. No one was interested in uncovering the truth. They just needed a scapegoat. And poor old Uncle Albert presented the perfect patsy, as my American cousins would say. He was frail and gullible, and did not comprehend enough of the danger he was in to mount any sort of defence. I walked to the window to look at the pretty gardens in an attempt to calm my vexation. But seeing the portly policeman sitting on the terrace with the Count and Signor Mancuso, not investigating, but sipping coffee and chatting the morning away nonchalantly, did nothing to improve my mood. Having thus roused myself sufficiently on my uncle's behalf, I marched up to Jenkins and demanded to see the mistress of the house. He led me to Lord Lamberton's study, where he was presently examining his collection of dead butterflies on pins, and where Lady Lamberton was pontificating about something or other. The scene of domestic bliss riled me even further. Lady Carolyn! Lady Lamberton exclaimed when I was shown in. You do like to make an entrance, just like your mother. What brings you here? The reference to my mother only served to stoke the fire of my anger higher. My cheeks burned with indignation. I resolved to drop all pretense I had been planning to employ. I even failed to stop to consider that I was addressing a murderess. I got straight to the point. My uncle is innocent, and you know it, I said, and I stalked towards Lady Lamberton. This all has to go with what you are keeping in the grottoes, the treasure you discovered. Lord Lamberton dropped his magnifying glass, and it rattled on the glass cover of the butterfly box he was examining. Lady Lamberton swayed for a moment and took a step back, as though frightened. Her face had gone pale. What are you talking about? she said, in an attempt to recover herself. You are just as bad as your uncle. First you accuse the vicar, and now me. Now, now, my dear, her husband said. She did help us find the chalice. He smiled innocently at me. My child, he said, what is this about a treasure? I hesitated. Their act was so convincing. But no, this time it all made sense. All the facts fit together. Granted, I still had no idea why the diva and the art dealer were murdered. But all my other conjectures were correct. I was certain. Undeterred, I pressed on. Warning your guests to stay away from the grottoes, inventing the tales about fairies with lights, those are quite real, my child, Lord Lamberton said. I cast a dubious look in his direction. He was even battier than my uncle if he believed that. That's why Flora's here, to study all these local beliefs. He nodded knowingly. That reminded me of Flora's role in all of this. Inviting your niece to stay with you from Egypt? A niece who just happens to have grown up, alongside her parents, on archaeological digs? The diving suit, now, that was left over by the army. Lord Lamberton spoke again. But the most important clue came from a book my uncle was reading in the library. It was a book 
which among other things, mentions that some French ships, carrying treasure looted from the Venetian Republic, sank in Lake Garda. You, Lord Lamberton, I turned to him, alluded to all the riches that were taken out of this region. I can only imagine the fortune that lines the bottom of this lake. I paused and looked from one to the other. They looked back at me, eyes wide with shock. The only thing I can't understand is why you killed Herr Hunkler. The diva, I imagine she somehow got in your way. She probably threatened to expose your scheme if she didn't get a cut. But why Herr Hunkler? I would think he would be quite useful to you, given the less respectable side of his business. I even saw you with him, going to the grottoes, on the same night the diva was killed, the night he was supposed to be ill and resting in bed. What? Lord Lamberton said. What is this about Hans, Lavinia? His voice contained a genuine note of surprise. For the second time since coming into the study, I faltered. Had I got all of this wrong? Lady Lamberton's shoulders drooped. I knew then I had worn her down. Please, sit, Lady Caroline, she said, and motioned me to a sofa. And another thing, I said, remembering a thought I had had previously. We only have your word that the telephone line was down. I glared at her. I stopped short of telling her I had discovered the secret room. But its existence, and the Lambertons' pretense that it did not exist, and their refusal to use it to summon the police, only added to their guilt. You have deduced a considerable amount of the truth, but are mistaken on several counts. Lady Lamberton motioned me again to the sofa, and I sat down. This room, unlike the rest of the house, was much more homely. Portraits and family photos took up most of the services, which in other rooms were decorated with statuettes, trinkets and gilded things. Allow me to set the facts straight, Lady Lamberton said calmly. What? was all Lord Lamberton could muster. He looked from his wife to me, mouth agape. Chapter 34 I discovered a few pieces, Lady Lamberton said. She had walked to the windows of the study and was gazing out of them in the direction of the grottoes. We'd had pretty heavy rains early in the spring and I suppose they washed some of the soil away. She turned to face me. You were right about a treasure, but it's not from a French ship that had sunk, or at least not what we recovered initially. It was a treasure that my family had buried during Napoleon's conquest of the area. They had taken care to ingratiate themselves with the French in order to retain power, much as the Count's family now ingratiates itself with Mussolini's regime. But they also buried as much gold as they could, I'm not sure how the exact location of the treasure was forgotten by the family. Perhaps Tommaso Albezzo, responsible for the buried treasure, died before being able to reveal his location. But the myth of this treasure travelled down through the generations. She paused and gazed out of the window. I dared not interrupt her. No one goes to the grottoes now. Harold has no interest in the ammunition, and the army chaps that had been stationed here drank all the wine that was stored in the caves. The servants, bless their superstitious souls, avoid the caves. I'm not sure how the room of the fairies and strange light started, but it's just as well. It kept them away from the grottoes while I worked. Is that when you wrote to your niece, when you discovered a few precious pieces? I said. Yes. Lady Lamberton said, nodding. Not knowing where she was, I wrote to the British government chaps in Cairo, at the office of the High Commissioner, and they managed to forward the letter to her. A friend of hers was travelling down that way. 
She waved her hand as though to dismiss the elaborate orchestration necessary to get a letter across Africa. She continued. Flora arrived in due course, and we made a plan to tell people she was working on collecting local folklore. Harold was usually in his greenhouse, pottering about with the plants, so we could do as we pleased. Sometimes we worked at night, and the lights fed into the local legend. Through talking to locals about folk tales and legends, in order to keep up the front of doing anthropological research, she heard about the sunken ships. She began exploring the lake with a diving suit sometimes, though we haven't discovered anything yet. And the sightings of her coming out of the water were responsible for the talk among the servants about a monster living in the grottoes, I suggested. Lady Lamberton shrugged. What were your plans once the treasure was excavated? I asked. That's where Herr Hunkler came in, she said. He is, was, a genuine art dealer, but did not shy away from more delicate jobs, as you've learned. He had connections with collectors in America, who did not question the provenance of pieces for sale. Do you mean you were going to sell them on the black market? I asked. I didn't understand why. But your items are genuine. Why go through the black market? Because we are in Italy, my dear, Lady Lamberton said, and swept her arm around her. Corruption runs deep. Everyone would want to share. She gazed down at where the Italians were seated. Look at them, abusing my hospitality. Plus, establishing the provenance of these pieces would be a nightmare. Have you not got a ledger? I asked incredulously. I knew all the items at Buckhill Place were lovingly itemized in ancient ledgers, housed in the monument room, and checked religiously on an annual basis, to the unending delight of servants all over the house. So many of the records are missing. What with Napoleon sweeping the area, and then the Great War. Plus, I suspect that some of the items buried come from other houses along the lake, or even further afield. In Venice, it was not beneath the family to help themselves to some of the spoils of war, even if it was stealing from their countrymen. Remember, they stayed in power during Napoleon's campaign. Perhaps that's why Tommaso Erbazzo had been so cagey with the location. So it was easier to just dispose of items through Herr Hunkler? I said. That's right. I invited him here to examine our collection so far, and then begin locating buyers in America, said Lady Lamberton. But you said they, the diva and Herr Honkler, requested an invitation. Perception dawned on me. Lady Lamberton nodded. Yes, I thought having the diva sing would be a good facade. No one would suspect the reason Herr Honkler was here, if we were having a party, Harold's blasted flower presented the perfect opportunity. Lord Lamberton, who over the past few minutes had huffed and gurgled with progressive indignation, could not restrain himself any longer. Oh, I knew nothing of this, he spluttered. Oh, Harold, you are impossible, his wife scolded. How could I tell you? You are always trying to give away our things to museums. She threw up her arms to heaven, her bangles providing musical accompaniment to her lamentations to the gods. I'm sick of your misguided attempts to build a legacy for yourself. With my things. You're no Napoleon. She cast a fiery look at her husband. Although you are just as short. She added, in a tone calculated to deliver deliberate pain. So, yes, she turned to me, blind to her husband's state of dejection. I discovered the hidden treasure, but had no intention of telling Harold. I let him think I was having an affair with Count Contarini. It was better than seeing it all get dragged away to a museum bearing my husband's name. What's that about the Count, Lavinia? 
Lord Lamberton looked up sharply. Nothing, dear. Go back to your butterflies, she said to him, and leaning towards me, she added in a lower tone, I don't think he's even noticed. She shook her head in disbelief. But why did you involve the Count? I asked. He has connections going quite high in the government. Various uncles, cousins, and nephews scattered around various posts. Incidentally, that's where the word nepotism derives from, from the Italian word for nephew and grandson, nipote. The Count was to keep Mussolini's thugs off the treasure, even if he had to grease some palms along the way. No sense of hiding the treasure from one fool. She looked accusingly at her husband, to have it end up in the hands of another. She sighed and looked out of the window, down into the garden again. What will happen to the treasure now? I said. I assume the Italian state would take its cut. She shrugged. No matter. Count Contarini was getting a bit greedy. You know, she turned away from the window to face me. I think that was the reason he came to the dinner. He was worried that I would have the visitor smuggle some of the treasure away from the island. She turned to look at the study, its wood panelling adorned with portraits. I wondered vaguely which one was Tommaso Arbezzo. I don't know how we'll keep this place going. Perhaps we'll have to open it to the public, she said with a shudder. I guess Harold will have his dream after all, to have his name attached to a museum. But surely, Signor Mancuso and the police chief don't know about the treasure yet? I said encouragingly. Have they approached you about it? I don't see how it could be avoided, with them milling about all over the island like that. She returned her gaze to the proceedings below. And the Leonardo? I asked hopefully. Perhaps the family had hidden that in the grottos as well. No, my dear, Lady Lamberton said. That's long gone. I thought about what she'd said. If she was telling the truth, she would have had no motive to kill the art dealer. She needed him. And what about the opera singer? Where did she fit in? Lady Lamberton, why do you think Diva Grigorescu and Herr Hunkler were killed? I have no idea, my dear. She turned and looked at her husband, as though examining him. Did she suspect him? I looked at him as well. Having abandoned his butterfly collection... He sat in a deep leather smoking chair, wearing the expression of a petulant child who had not been allowed to ride a pony. It makes no sense, Lady Lamberton said. No one really knew they were coming to the party. So we are no closer to the truth than when we started, I said. We have no idea who the killer might be. I sighed in sad resignation. No idea at all, Lady Lamberton confirmed with a sigh. She gazed out of the window for a few moments. It's all quite strange, and I can't help but wonder, who will be next? Chapter 35 it had not escaped my attention that Lady Lamberton as good as agreed that Uncle Albert was not the murderer. But it was another piece of information I'd procured on the way out of the study that had me excited. I needed Poppy's help again, but I first had to draw her away from the Count, whose handsome company she had discovered. The conversation with Lady Lamberton had jogged my memory to something she had said on the night of our arrival— I was absolutely sure that I had the right idea now. I just needed confirmation from London. There wasn't any time to waste. No, beastly, Poppy said, standing, legs astride in the middle of the library. 
I have the Italian chaps in charge, sequestered with the members of the Royal Society in the drawing room. The lords have been duly instructed that the portly policeman is greatly interested in the more rare specimens growing on the island. He looks the type that is too title stuck to interrupt any of them. And I've asked the Count and Signor Mancuso to help interpret the more tricky bits of the botany during the Lord's lecture. The policeman's underlings are holed up in the kitchen with Cook, who is making them some sort of pasta from Sicily. Turns out all these carabinieri chaps are from Sicily, and they can't resist a bit of heavy peasant food, Cook tells me. So you should have a couple of hours free. How Poppy had convinced Cook to agree to the scheme was beyond me, but it probably had something to do with the fact that Poppy's healthy frame tended to inspire admiration in Cook's. Plus, Poppy said, smacking the flat paddle of a table tennis racket against her palm, if anyone tries to follow you, they will have to pass by me first. I had no idea where she had found it, but the racket made another satisfying thwack against her ample palm. In the hands of anyone else, the lowly bat would not make much of a difference. But I knew that in Poppy's, the paddle could be close to lethal. Thanks, Poppy, I chirped and tiptoed down the secret passage. I brought out Wilford's cipher and placed it to the side. I would not need it for now. Then... I sat at the typewriter thing and began hunting for the letters for my message to London. Although I had enrolled in the typing course and completed a few classes, I had not become proficient at it. I punched out my message on the tape, letter by letter, and small dots began appearing on the paper. I wished there was a faster way. Suddenly, my typing was interrupted by knocking. I looked around, startled. What was going on? Was Poppy not guarding the passage? Then I heard keys jingling. The noise was coming from the direction of the metal door. What was happening? Who was coming in? And why now? I looked around frantically. Should I run back to the library? I had not finished typing out my message let alone sending it. Just then, I noticed that a strip of punch tape dangled from the telegraph machine. I had not seen it when I had first walked in. It was a new message. I ripped the paper strip off the telegraph. Not caring that there was someone at the door, I grabbed Wilford's cipher and began deciphering the cable, my hands shaking. I tried not to think of whether I would have enough time to solve the message and focused on decoding the words. In the background, I could hear that the door was stuck. It had probably not been opened since the war, and the damp air from the lake had rusted the hinges. I forced myself to bring my attention back to the task, comparing letters in Wilford's cipher to patterns of holes. Slowly, the message began to take shape. At that moment, the door gave way, and daylight flooded the tiny room. I blinked in the bright light. All I could see was a portly black silhouette standing in the doorway. So it's you that has been sending messages to England, the Italian said. The incompetent telegraph operators have been letting the messages get through and relaying them. They thought the messages were part of the official investigation. Idioti. But I didn't care that the Italian policeman had discovered me. I had deciphered the message. It transpired that while I was in the secret room, a telephone call had come through the police station on land. They explained that the telegraph operators had noticed messages travelling to and from England, but at first had thought nothing of it. Storming through the villa, the policeman had found Lord and Lady Lamberton, who, duly surprised, had told him that there indeed was a telegraph in the old war room. It appeared that they did not know, or did not want the policeman to know, that there was a secret entrance to the room, so had gone to retrieve the keys. 
So this was how I found myself now handcuffed. And while I was trying to explain to the policeman in charge what I had discovered, he, enraged by what he considered being duped by an Englishwoman, was not paying any attention to me. Listen! I shouted. She will get away! You have to catch her! At that moment, I could hear a motorboat start up in the distance. James! I shouted with all my might. James! After what felt like hours, he appeared in a window. Carolyn! he exclaimed. What is happening? Never mind that. Get the Count! I screamed. He needs to follow her in his fast boat. We mustn't let her get away. To James's credit, if he had had any doubts about my sanity at that moment, he did not reveal them. He disappeared from view. By now, Poppy had also appeared throughout the French doors of the library, and the Lords and Alistair were hanging out at the window of the drawing room. Poppy started in my direction, but I shook my head, letting her know that she could not help. Suddenly, I felt faint. I had exerted so much energy and emotion that I could not find the strength to resist the policemen any longer. I let them lead me away to the dock and their waiting dinghy. All now rested with Count Contarini, and whether his claim that his Italian-designed motorboat was faster than Lord Lamberton's American boat was true. But with the corner of my eye, I noticed it was not Count Contarini who jumped in his boat and turned over the motor. It was James. In a moment of madness, and emboldened by seeing James's unquestioning faith in me, I extricated myself from the momentarily distracted policeman and jumped in the back of the boat that was at that very instant pulling away from the dock. Chapter 36 James was gaining on Lord Lamberton's boat, but it was still too far ahead for me to tell if I decoded the message correctly. I could not make out who was driving the boat. All I could see was that the boat was going at full speed to the north, towards the Alps. Our own boat skipped over the waves, as James was going ever faster in an attempt to catch up to the boat ahead of us. Nausea was overtaking me. With my hands handcuffed behind my back, I could not balance. I sat down. In the distance, behind us, the police boat was pursuing us. If shouts could make a boat go faster, they would have overtaken us by now. But as their boat was not as powerful as the Count's, they were still lagging far behind. I tried not to think how much trouble we were in. For all intents and purposes, I was running away from an arrest, and James was not only assisting me with my escape, but he was doing so in a stolen boat. Do you think we'll catch up with Lord Lamberton's boat? I shouted in James's direction, hoping my voice carried over the roar of the engine and the splashing of the waves. I hope so, he shouted back. The Count appears to be right. His boat is quite powerful. We never got to find out whether the Count's Italian boat was more powerful than Lord Lamberton's American-made one. The boat ahead of us spluttered and came to a halt. At first, I could not understand what had happened. Had the boat run aground? Could that happen in the middle of the lake? Had it hit some rocks? Had the motor broken down? I believe she ran out of gasoline, James exclaimed. He slowed down our boat and drove it towards a fugitive. Behind us, the shouts of the Italian policemen became louder as they got closer. Finally, they caught up with us. They shouted at us to raise our hands. I couldn't make out whether they had guns. I was quite nauseous from the ride. But I got up and turned around to show them my handcuffed hands. As I turned, I saw James holding up his hands in the air. 
and in the boat that had run out of gasoline stood Flora, her hands in the air as well. The villa guests were sitting on the terrace overlooking the placid lake, sipping afternoon cocktails, much as we had done before. But it was the day after the infamous boat race, and so much had changed. I was out of handcuffs for one, but also Uncle Albert was back, and so was Wilford, and the police had finally departed from the island and Signor Mancuso with them. They had also given a ride to Flora Nesbitt, or Rose Stanton, to use her real name, to the police station. My uncle, shaken by his experience, needed a few hours to recuperate, but now was sitting among the rest of the guests, gazing blissfully in my direction. For his benefit, we had decided to recount all that had happened after he had involuntarily left the island. So, tell us again, how did you guess Flora wasn't really Flora? said James. He also beamed in my direction. Lord Pakenham was the only one casting uncharitable glances at me, but I ignored him. Perhaps he was worried that one day James would leave his employ to marry me, but I was getting ahead of myself. It was when I was leaving Lord Lambert in study. I happened to see a family photograph. In it were Lord and Lady Lamberton, two people wearing light-coloured suits and pith helmets, the uniform favoured by British archaeologists in hot climates, and a young girl. The photo appeared to be taken in England, with a Lamberton's country house in the background. I assumed the girl was Flora. I looked around to see if there were more recent photographs of Flora, but there weren't many, and in those few she always wore a pith helmet, which cast a strong shadow on her face. It had actually been something of a joke between Flora and her aunt, Lord Lamberton said. She always sent us photos with her hat on. Rose Stanton no doubt knew that fact, and used it to her advantage. I said. The hazy look that passed over my uncle's eyes told me he had lost the thread of the story. But we'll get to her in a moment. You see, seeing the photos in the study reminded me of something Lady Lamberton had mentioned during our first night here. She and his lordship had never been to Africa. The photos made me wonder when they had last seen Flora in person. It was when Flora had been a little girl and had visited England with her parents. Oh, don't remind me, dear. I feel dreadful not to recognize my own niece. Lady Lamberton buried her face in her hands dramatically. I nodded. I understood how it could have happened, and did not blame the Lambertons for being taken in by Rose Stanton. Between time spent at boarding schools and spending summers at archaeology sites, I continued, Lord and Lady Lamberton did not see their niece in person again. Even the death of Flora's parents, a terrible accident at an archaeology site that killed both of them, did not afford an opportunity for niece and aunt to meet. After a service in Cairo, their bodies were sent to England, but Flora remained in Africa to continue her research. She exchanged regular correspondence with Lady Lamberton, but never sent a photo without a hat, which more often than not concealed her face under a stark shadow. But what I still don't understand, said Lord Lamberton, is how Rose Stanton could imitate our Flora so well. She didn't really have to imitate her, I said. Neither you nor Lady Lamberton had seen Flora as a grown woman. Rose Stanton was being herself. She just had the advantage of having been a close friend of Flora. She knew all about Flora's parents, her family, and her visit to England when she was a girl. Rose could easily reminisce with you about those things. Why did this Rose person come in place of Flora? I don't understand. 
my uncle said. So many floral names, it makes it confusing. As the cable from London attested, the real flora was deep in the African continent, in northern Rhodesia, doing her anthropology research, when Lady Lamberton's letter inviting her to stay at the villa here arrived in Cairo. Rose, who was involved in archaeology, though more for profit than scholarly pursuit, had travel plans toward northern Rhodesia. She offered to take the letter to Flora. But curiosity got the better of her. She read the letter and could not believe her luck. Lady Lamberton was inviting Flora to the villa because she had discovered the lost treasure of the family. Rose formed a plan immediately. She would not deliver the letter, but would travel to Italy instead of Flora and present herself as the Lamberton's niece. Communication between Europe and Africa is so slow that by the time anyone caught on, if they ever did, she would be long gone. She never planned on staying on the island long. Rose just wanted to get her hands on as much as she could carry. Then, one night she would leave the island, make her way over to the Alps and into Austria, under her real name, and disappear. No one would ever know who she really was. They would not be able to catch her. But her plan got derailed, said James with a smirk. It got derailed, I agreed. It's funny how fate plays her hand sometimes. Lady Lamberton invited Herr Hunkler, without telling Flora or Rose, and the diva came with him. It was quite a shock when Rose saw the diva after dinner. Rose, involved as she is in the murky market of Egyptian artifacts, had met the diva and Herr Honkler before. The diva recognized Rose straight away, but kept it to herself. Before exposing her, she wanted to hear Rose's story first, to learn why she was here. The diva probably hoped to get a cut of whatever underhanded thing Rose was involved in. Rose had to think fast before the diva had a chance to reveal her true identity. I paused and thought back to the night I met Rose, and how she had jumped back in surprise, her hands slipping off the piano keys. She had recognized the diva immediately as well. Rose told the diva to meet her in the conservatory so they could talk, and killed her. Unfortunately, Uncle Albert was there as well. But what about Flora overhearing the diva talking to someone in the garden? Alistair asked. Rose made that up to throw us off her scent, I said. Oh, right, Alistair said, and his ears turned bright red. And she didn't meet Herr Hunkler until the next morning, James said. That's right. He had gone to bed the previous night, ill, I said, and threw a glance at Lady Lamberton. It was probably easier to leave the grotto detail out. They didn't see each other until breakfast. He recognized her and left to talk to Lady Lamberton. Rose recognized him as well. She cursed under her breath. I thought it was because the vicar had dropped some egg on her shoes. But now I think it was because she realized there was another person who could reveal her true identity. Rose must have lured him to the garden on some pretext or other and killed him. But why did Rose not recognize his name when it was mentioned the previous night, after the diva was killed? Poppy asked. He must have used an alias to conduct his less savory business, I suggested. Remember, he ran a legitimate business under his real name. And the necklace? Why did she put the necklace in my room? My uncle asked. To incriminate you, I said patiently. She had seen you handle the necklace, and had also seen Wilfred prepare your sleeping draught in the kitchen. It was easy enough for her to slip into your room during the night while you slept. And the letter from Herr Hunkler? 
Uncle Albert asked. That was quite genuine. But it was an unfortunate coincidence, I said. My uncle nodded. But why kill those people? Why not just escape from the island during the night? Asked Poppy. Well, she couldn't. The storm, remember? Said James. Plus, she probably did not want to leave empty-handed. I nodded. So why did she run away in the end? There was no one left here to recognize her. She could simply continue with her deception, said Poppy. It was getting too complicated. The police were here. What if they asked for documents? I suggested. The truth was, I also wondered why Flora, Rose, had run yesterday. I had no answer, but a line from Hamlet floated up in my mind. So full of artless jealousy is guilt. It spills itself in fearing to be spilt. And why did the boat run out of gasoline? said Poppy. I looked at Count Contarini, who was sitting to the side and had remained silent throughout our exchange. For that, we have to thank Count Contarini. He had taken the precaution to siphon the gasoline out of the boat. That way, even if the weather improved, no one could get too far away from the island before the police could arrive. Everyone turned in the Count's direction. He bowed slightly. Except he didn't siphon out his gasoline, Poppy observed. The Count smiled and shrugged. He had turned silent and subdued since his involvement in Lady Lamberton's scheme had come to light. I still liked him, but I had decided not to take a ride in his fast boat again. And what about the telegram from London, Carolyn? Who sent it to you? What did it say? Uncle Albert asked. I was surprised he remembered. But perhaps our little adventure in the library had made an impression on him. I took the strip of paper out of my pocket and held it up. The tiny hole stood out against the light. A chum of mine in London, Philippa. Her uncle is a caretaker at the British Museum. He had happened to see a discarded telegram from Flora Nesbitt recently. Philippa's telegram to me said, F. Nesbitt wired report from northern Rhodesia, studying tribes along the Zambezi River. Of course, I had not learned to read punch tape overnight, but I had memorized the telegram by heart. And that's when I knew Rose was a killer. If Flora was in northern Rhodesia, then who was the woman here? The guests dispersed to change for dinner. Only Lady Lamberton and I remained on the terrace. Below, among the immaculate geometric boxwood beds of the Italian garden, the vicar's wife was chasing him along the straight and narrow paths. He hurried ahead of her, his cassock flapping behind him. They had not joined us for afternoon drinks, but had instead been resolving their marital differences. She says she will not divorce him, said Lady Lamberton, following the vicar's wife's progress along the paths. She insists that it is her job as his wife to lead him down the path of righteousness. She has decided to reform him. She took a languid sip of cocktail. I thought it's only fair to give her that chance and not pursue our case against him. Lady Lamberton gave me a mischievous grin. What about his career as a vicar? I said, returning my attention to the couple in the garden below. Oh, I'm certain it won't suffer much. His wife has already been in contact with the bishop and has made a deal with him to keep her husband on. Under her watchful eye, of course. The Anglican Church has always been known for attacking the eccentric kind. At least he shows a genuine interest in Christian history. She cast a glance at me to confirm that I had understood her reference to the chalice, which is more than can be said for other parish leaders. 
I doubt this was the outcome he envisioned. No. A prison sentence, at the very least, has an end, Lady Lamberton said. My mind jumped to my father's union with my mother, but I nevertheless smiled at her joke. And it was she who had poisoned Herr Hunkler, I said incredulously. I had not fully comprehended what Lady Lamberton had told me earlier. Oh, yes, she confessed to that, but she did not do it to kill him, just cause him some discomfort. Her father had spent some time hunting with the Kukuyu native tribesmen of Kenya. They are famous for hunting with arrows tipped with poison from the poison bush plant. Akokanthara skimperi. You see, some of my husband's obsessions have rubbed off on me. Lady Lamberton turned to me and smiled. The poison is more effective than a bullet, my herald says. Regardless, she had overheard the vicar arguing with Herr Hunkler. He had threatened the vicar, and as she said, no one threatens my husband. You should have seen the vicar's demeanor in that moment, when his wife's true zeal was revealed. His visage was that of a man who had just discovered that he had unwittingly made a bargain with the devil. But how did she administer the poison? I asked, astonished. She put a drop on his soup plate as she passed his seat. She knew he would be sitting on her right. I was thankful that Olive had not tried to poison me, after I had accused her husband so publicly. Why would she even bring such a poison with her? I asked Lady Lamberton. Oh, she said that her father would not allow her to come to Europe without a sufficient supply of it. He had made it quite clear that the animals in Africa are nothing to the villains one would encounter on the continent. I wondered vaguely if the vicar had played tennis with his wife before marrying her. He probably hadn't, I concluded. My eyes wandered in the direction of the grottoes. Burly Italian men had come early in the day to carry off crates with treasure inside. What will happen to the treasure now? I asked Lady Lamberton. If I was being charitable, I would say that the provenance of the pieces would be traced and some would be returned to me or the families they originally belonged to. The rest would end up in museums. That would make Lord Lamberton happy, I said. Only if his name gets attached to the hall. Perhaps it will. Perhaps there will be a small footnote saying the treasure was discovered at Villa Veronese, home of Lord and Lady Lamberton. But I doubt it would ever get to that. What do you mean? I asked, unsure what Lady Lamberton was alluding to. Oh, one of his stories, she said, as she took another languid sip. Most likely, the treasure will end up in the hands of Mussolini and his henchmen. But I am not distressed by it. In the end, fate will probably deposit the treasure back into a lake. Thank you for listening to the audio production of Death in the Garden, written by Isabella Bassett. Copyright 2023 by Isabella Bassett. Production copyright... 2023 by Isabella Bassett.